bird's eye view of Dallas one day after a once in a thousand year flood event, it left drivers stranded and neighborhoods flooded with first responders taking out rafts to rescue residents. Now 23 states are under a disaster declaration. Ginger Z is tracking the storm as it moves east. New details on a report that federal agents retrieved hundreds of classified materials from former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago home. A letter from the National Archives alleges Trump had more than 700 classified pages in total. Terry Moran has the details. Voters cast their ballots during high-stakes elections in New York and Florida to choose the final candidates in races for governor and congressional seats. It's one of the last primary nights as we start to get a full picture of who'll be on the ballots in November. A jury finds two men guilty in a kidnapping plot. Prosecutors say they were part of a group that planned to abduct a sitting governor and even use a bomb to blow up a bridge. The details on the thwarted plot and how the politician targeted is responding. One home that appraised at two different prices and a black couple says it's racially motivated. In a lawsuit, they say when a white colleague showed appraisers their home, the estimated value skyrocketed by nearly $300,000. You know, you, um, yeah, you do everything quote unquote right, um, but you still are, are subject to, you know, structures of racism and discri discriminatory practices. He may be best known for action films like Star Wars, but actor John Boyega is quickly making a name for himself in dramatic roles as well. He talks to us about his latest film, Breaking, and how he portrayed a real-life veteran whose struggles led him to rob a bank. It comes from a natural place of empathy. Like, I, I can't believe that I'm in a role, which I'm grateful for, but I'm in a role that is, is telling this narrative, um, and, and, and that frustration kind of builds naturally. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us on a critical primary night in America with just 11 weeks until the midterms. We have key races in Florida and also here in New York with nationwide implications. We'll be tracking results as the polls close. But we do begin tonight with stunning new details about the extent of classified materials that President Trump took with him when he left office. According to a May letter that has now been made public from the National Archives to a lawyer for the former president, agents recovered more than 100 classified documents totaled more than 700 pages from Mar-a-Lago back in January. That includes documents with the highest level of classification and national security interests, including some labeled special access program. The letter also provides new insight into the back and forth with Trump's team over accessing the materials and shows the Justice Department and National Archives determined there is no basis for him to assert privilege over the records. Of course, earlier this month, FBI officials returned to Mar-a-Lago with a search warrant and removed 11 additional sets of classified records with the warrant revealing an active FBI investigation. ABC senior national correspondent Terry Moran leads us off. Tonight, a newly released letter from the National Archives reveals the scope and the magnitude of the trove of classified material Donald Trump took with him to Mar-a-Lago when he left the White House. Over 100 documents with classification markings comprising more than 700 pages. Some include the highest levels of classification, including Special Access Program's SAP materials. That security designation is reserved for the most sensitive secrets in the government. It restricts access to the smallest number of individuals possible, only those with a need to know. The letter from the archives was released by a representative of Trump himself. This past January, the Trump team handed over 15 boxes of documents to the archives. The New York Times reports they included documents from the CIA, the National Security Agency, and the FBI. According to the paper, Mr. Trump went through the boxes himself before turning them over. But even after that, Trump still had not returned everything sought by the government. Months later in June, more documents were given back. And then, in that search on August 8th, the FBI seized 11 more sets of classified materials. Still allegedly holding on to those classified documents. Terry Moran joins us now from Washington. And Terry, former President Trump is calling for the court to appoint a special master to review the material taken from Mar-a-Lago. Tonight, we're hearing from the judge in that case. It, what is she saying? Lindy, the Trump team has asked for that special master. That's an individual who would be appointed by the court to review the documents seized by the FBI. And the judge in this case came back very quickly with the request for clarification, elaboration on what the Trump team is actually doing here. Uh, it is a pretty stunning order because she said, you have to clarify what law you are asking me to apply here, what precedents there are, why I am the right judge for it, because this is a different judge than the one that handled the search warrant. Uh, and she is essentially saying, go back to the drawing board, 
figure out what you want me to do and what legal justification there is for me to do it, come back and we'll talk. It was a pretty stunning rebuke for a judge appointed by Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Lindsay? All right, Terry Moran, our thanks to you as always. Now to those key primaries in two of the biggest states in the nation. Here in New York, two powerful House Democrats are facing off after their districts were redrawn. And in Florida, Governor Ron DeSantis will soon learn who will face in his re-election race before perhaps making a run at the White House in 2024. Here's ABC's congressional correspondent Rachel Scott reporting tonight from New York City. They are two of the most powerful Democrats in Congress. Jerry Nadler presided over both Trump impeachments as chairman of the judiciary. Carolyn Maloney leads the House Oversight Committee. But now a redrawn New York congressional map has forced these longtime allies to run against each other. And in the 11th hour, the race has gotten ugly. I think that you should uh, read the editorial in the New York Post today. They call him senile. Have you been disappointed by some of the comments? from Congressman Maloney? Yes. I've been very disappointed when she talks about uh, that I'm not really running for the seat or that I'm senile. I mean, it's absurd. I'm surprised at her. Both were elected in 1992. Nadler has emphasized he's the city's only remaining Jewish congressman. Maloney has emphasized her fight for abortion rights. You cannot send a man to do a woman's job. Today I asked Nadler, what happens if his constituents vote him out? And if you lose this race, is this district still in good hands? Uh, it's in good hands, yes. Not as good. In Florida tonight, another hard-fought Democratic primary. Two candidates battling it out to take on Republican Governor Ron DeSantis. In one corner, former Governor Charlie Crist. He was a Republican then. He's a Democrat now. Florida's a beautiful place, and we need to bring her back together. Chris going head-to-head -head with State Agriculture Commissioner Nikki Freed. I have been in the trenches fighting Ron DeSantis for three and a half years. I am ready for this battle. DeSantis himself has his sights set on a possible presidential campaign. We can never, ever surrender to woke ideology. He has spent the past week on tour of the battleground states, campaigning for Republican candidates in New Mexico, Pennsylvania, Arizona, and Ohio. Let's pivot now to New York and get right to Rachel Scott. Uh, Rachel, that New York congressional race is pitting two veteran lawmakers against each other, but now there's a third candidate in that race who says it's time for change. Yeah, 38-year-old Suraj Patel. He used to work for former President Barack Obama. He says it's now time for the Obama generation to take over. But he is up against two Democratic titans with decades of political experience. Just take Congressman Jerry Nadler. He has represented the Upper West Side for 30 years. That makes up a large section of this district, and it typically has a high voter turnout, Lindsay. All right, we'll know in just a bit. Rachel Scott, our thanks to you. For more on tonight's key races, let's bring in ABC News political director, Mr. Rick Klein. Rick, it, let's start in Florida, where the race for governor will be center stage. What's at stake there tonight? Yeah, look, this is really about Ron DeSantis because of his reelection. We know that he doesn't have any Republican opposition, so it's about the general election and it's about squaring up for 2024. This is the map that made Donald Trump the victor in Florida. He got about 51% of the vote. DeSantis did a little bit worse than he did uh, two years earlier. Interestingly, they had almost exactly the same map. Only one little old county here, St. Lucie County, went for Trump and didn't go for DeSantis. Now, DeSantis won a narrow victory last time around. A lot of people think he's in line for potentially a bigger victory this time. He hopes to use that as a springboard for, for 2022, but as you just heard, or 2024, as you just heard, though, Rachel uh, outlined in, in her piece, uh, Democrats have to decide who they want to square up against him. Do you want to bring in a former governor who used to be a Republican, or do you go with the, the, the only Democrat to, to now be in statewide office in Florida in Nikki Freed, also the state agricultural commissioner right now? And in New York, as Rachel discussed, all eyes tonight on that showdown between incumbents here in Manhattan. Just break down how Democrats got into the situation in a word, Lindsay, is a mess. So what happened is the Democrats redrew their congressional districts in a way that they thought would give them a big edge, maybe get a couple extra Democrats elected to Congress, even though they're losing a congressional seat. But a judge threw out that map, forcing a brand new map that is absolutely brutal for Democrats, in part because it puts some Democrats in the same district as each other. That's right here in the 12th district in Manhattan. That's where you have Nadler and Maloney battling it out. Also, in lower Manhattan, down in the 10th congressional district, you have a, 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 a different situation where there is no actual 
incumbent representing that, but another incumbent from another part of the state moved into the district because it was suddenly open. Another candidate there is Dan Goldman, who was part of the, the Trump impeachment as one of the lawyers. And another interesting twist, right up here in the Hudson Valley, you've got a congressional district that's now represented by the head of the Democratic campaign efforts. He's the guy that tries to get Democrats elected nationwide. He has a primary challenger, and his district is going to be targeted by Republicans this fall as well. And the fallout over the Supreme Court's overturning of Roe v. Wade is also in focus in a special election in New York tonight. Explain the dynamics at play there. Right. In addition to what, to, to the, the primaries that we have, we have a special election right here uh, up in the Hudson Valley, the Lower Catskills. This district was vacated by a congressman who became the lieutenant governor uh, of, of New York after the, the resignation of, of uh, Andrew Cuomo as governor. And there, you've got a really interesting dynamic because you've got the Democrat in that race saying explicitly, look, abortion is on the ballot in this race. The Republican, who does not support abortion rights, has said, look, I thought it was settled law, too. It's not going to be a big deal in New York. Democrats hope it will be a big deal. They hope that this sends a message about how they continue to be motivated by the fight over abortion rights in the wake of Roe v. Wade being overturned. All right, Rick Klein will be checking in with you throughout the night. Thanks so much. Thanks, Lindsay. Torrential rains have moved across several states. Much of Dallas is still waterlogged after the most rain in 100 years in just a 24-hour period. Tonight, we're learning about the wife and mother who was on the phone with her husband as floodwaters swept her car away. Ginger Z is tracking the storm, but we start with Trevor Alt in the flood zone. Tonight, those record-breaking storms pushing east, now dumping torrential rain on the deep south. In northeast Louisiana, a tractor trailer exiting Interstate 20, losing control and overturning. This after the Dallas-Fort Worth area received the most rain over a 24-hour period in nearly a century Monday. Hundreds of calls for help, dozens of homes damaged. What people in the Dallas area, as well as this entire region, sustained uh, was an extraordinary challenge. In Mesquite, just east of Dallas, 60-year-old Jolene Jarrell killed after her vehicle was swept away. Friends telling our affiliate WFAA the mother of three was working as an Uber driver and that before she was killed, she was on the phone with her husband telling him it felt like someone was pushing her car. Tragically, searchers in Utah finding the body of Jaytel Agnihotri Monday, missing after flash floods tore through Zion National Park Friday. And in Mississippi tonight, a stalled storm system making for an anxious evening evening ahead. There is good reason for them to be anxious. Trevor Alt joins us now from a very wet Jackson, Mississippi. Trevor, what have conditions been like for people there? Well, Lindsay, as you can see, I mean, we already have some flooding and this is continuing to grow. We're watching this street fill up behind me. This flood watch, though, is going to continue all the way through tomorrow night because as much rain as we've already seen and we've had about a foot, half a foot already so far, we could have another half a foot on the way. Lindsay. All right, Trevor Altar, thanks to you. ABC's chief meteorologist Ginger Z is tracking it all for us. Ginger, where is this headed next? Right, so just to wrap up, because Dallas did get a little bit since I spoke to you last night, they now have had their wettest August on record, coming from that exceptional drought, the highest level of drought. So we'll see in the drought monitor later this week what happens and how much of it absorbed into the soil. But let me take you through the flash flood threat, because there are a lot of folks are getting that heavy rain right now. Uh, Hattiesburg, Meridian, if you're driving I-20. And if you're driving and you get a flash flood warning, you stop. That is the best way to stay alive. You do not drive or not even mess with any of that water. Water because water moves vehicles and water moves people really easily. Uh, that stationary front that has been trapping all the moisture is going to do just that. It's going to barely move the next 36 hours. And that means, Lindsay, that through the Gulf Coast, you know, right from New Orleans over to Mobile, you could end up with two, three inches. They drain really easily. They're not in that severe of a drought. However, when you add six inches to the already six inches, parts of Mississippi will absolutely see some flash flood threat. And that goes into western Alabama as well. Lots of concern in the pink area there. Ginger Z, our thanks to you. An update now on the case of a missing teen two days after a car was pulled from a lake with a body inside of it. An autopsy has now confirmed that body found is 16-year-old Kylie Rodney. Investigators say that she was at a large party near a campground on August 6th when she vanished along with her car. The lake where Rodney's body was found had been searched by sonar and divers, but a volunteer group with high-end equipment located the vehicle on Sunday. Police say this is still an ongoing investigation. Tonight in Atlanta, murder charges have been dropped against two police officers accused of killing Rayshard Brooks. Steve Osinsami now with why the officers have been cleared. It's my police officers in Georgia are celebrating this tonight. It's my conclusion that the use of deadly force was objectively reasonable 
and that they did not act with criminal intent. The special prosecutor has announced that he will clear the two white police officers seen here in an arrest that turned deadly at the parking lot of this Atlanta fast food restaurant in June of 2020. Authorities today shared that the victim, 27-year-old Rayshard Brooks, wasn't just drunk behind the wheel, but was also on cocaine and other drugs. And that officers Garrett Rolfe and Devin Brosnan, who were responding to calls from the restaurant, acted within the law. The police didn't come into this encounter hot. They, there was no uh, hostility. They were businesslike. They were polite. In announcing their decision, authorities replayed videos of the 40-minute encounter, pointing out that not only did Rayshard Brooks grab a police stun gun and run, but that he was pointing the weapon at the officer who shot and killed him. Brosnan and Rolfe committed no crimes. This was the summer of demonstrations over the killings of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery, the Wendy's fast food restaurant where Brooks was killed, burned to the ground. The family of Rayshard Brooks tonight is heartbroken. This family lost a father and they deserve a jury trial. Steve Osinsami joins us tonight from Atlanta. Steve, what happens to the officers now? Do they get their jobs back? Well, one of the officers who lost his job fought it and got his job back already. Both officers are still on the police force tonight. The police association here says that they will now get training. Uh, they're currently on administrative leave. And I should kind of put this in, into some context, Lindsay. You know, this all happened during the summer of street protests after the killings of Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd. And these officers have argued that they were sacrificed by authorities to help calm the streets, which of course didn't work. Lindsay? All right, Steve Osinsami, our thanks to you. A jury has convicted two men of conspiring to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Ike Ajachi describes the plot and how the FBI found out. Tonight, a key victory for the Justice Department in its fight against domestic terrorism. A jury finding two self-styled militiamen guilty of plotting to kidnap and kill Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer in 2020. All of our elected officials, everyone, deserves to be able to live in safety and not in fear. Adam Fox and Barry Croft convicted on all counts, including conspiring to obtain a weapon of mass destruction in the form of a bomb. The verdict coming four months after a different jury deadlocked on the charges against these two men, prompting prosecutors to file a motion to quickly retry the case. In October 2020, the FBI arrested Fox and Croft along with four other men as they allegedly tried to buy explosives with the goal of attacking Whitmer before Election Day. According to authorities, the plot was months in the making, driven in part by the Democratic governor's COVID-19 restrictions. The FBI infiltrating and wiretapping the group after one member turned informant alarmed by the talk of killing police. At both trials, however, the defense arguing this was a case of entrapment and that the defendants were just big talkers. My client is disappointed in the verdict. Um, it's been a good fight. But evidence submitted at trial showed Fox, the group's ringleader, conducting surveillance on Whitmer's vacation home and firing a stun gun. The men allegedly planning to blow up a nearby bridge to slow police response, then take Whitmer to a secret location in Wisconsin for a trial that would end in her execution. Quite an elaborate and brutal plot. Let's get right to Ike Jachi. So Ike, Governor Whitmer reacting to this obviously today. What does she have to say? That's right, Lindsay. Governor Whitmer releasing a statement saying today's verdicts prove that violence and threats have no place in our politics and that those who seek to divide us will be held accountable. Now, both Fox and Croft face life in prison, but their lawyers are considering an appeal. Lindsay? All right. Ike Ajachi for us. Thanks so much. Now to the war in Ukraine and an ominous warning from President Zelensky and the U.S. there about possible Russian strikes. The U.S. State Department is even telling Americans to leave and has declassified intelligence with Ukraine. ABC's chief foreign correspondent Ian Panel is back in Kyiv tonight. Tonight, President Zelensky issuing an ominous new warning to his people, saying Russia may be planning, quote, hideous provocations and brutal strikes as Ukraine prepares to celebrate Independence Day. And tonight, the U.S. again urging Americans to leave Ukraine amid that threat of intensified Russian attacks. State Department sources saying declassified intelligence shared with the Ukrainians shows the Kremlin may be preparing to launch strikes on highly populated areas, 
Ukraine's banning large gatherings during the event. ABC's Britt Klenert asking President Zelensky about the threat. What's your reason for urging people not to gather tomorrow? Is it because Kyiv is under threat? Amid these concerns over what Russia may do next, the United Nations holding an emergency meeting on the volatile situation at Ukraine's Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Ukraine saying Russian strikes damaged infrastructure and transformers, briefly cutting off power at Europe's largest nuclear plant. The Ukrainians also claiming Russians are shelling the plant's nearby ash pits, where nuclear waste is stored, raising clouds of toxic radioactive dust, stoking ongoing fears of a potential nuclear disaster. Lindsay, Independence Day has just begun here and the country is braced, but Zelensky doubling down tonight. He's saying that they won't relent until they retake back parts of the country occupied by Russia, not just in the last six months, but for years, even Crimea. We can forget any peace deal for now. This war looks set to drag on. Lindsay? Unfortunately, it seems to be the case. Ian, thank you. When we come back, a rare and dangerous phenomenon caught on camera, the creation of a fire tornado. Actor John Boyega tells us of how his latest role shines a light on veterans and what it was like working with the late Michael K. Williams. After receiving a home appraisal they felt was too low, a black couple says they had a white colleague show their house and the price tag went up nearly $300,000. We talked to them exclusively about their first reactions and the lawsuit they just filed. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The hottest news in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis, the powerful series, streaming free on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. 
A firefighter catches a terrifying sight on camera, a fire tornado. You can see it here developing at one of the wildfire sites in Portugal. It's a rare phenomenon that comes from a mix of conditions involving heat, wind, and dust. They can dramatically worsen already serious wildfires. A heat wave in Portugal is making it harder for the more than 2,000 firefighters on the ground battling multiple wildfires. Now to our ABC News exclusive, a husband and wife speaking for the first time after surviving a terrifying plane crash. Ariel Reshef has more on their story and how they were found. A Michigan family who survived a fiery plane crash speaking for the first time. The world sort of slowed down there and those moments felt a little bit like an eternity. Ronnie Kumal, the pilot, his wife, Olympian Shireen Jem, their niece, Sienna Kumal, and their dog, Charlie, taking off in the single-engine aircraft from this small Michigan airport last month. Soon after, 17-year-old Sienna felt something was amiss. The plane started shifting a little bit and in like a irregular movement, like just wobbling, and I knew that it wasn't turbulence, it wasn't really weather. Within minutes, the plane took a nosedive. Shirin says there was no time to be scared. I felt like everything just went silent. I heard nothing on the cabin and I just embraced myself. And then um, when the plane, you know, went down, all I remember after that, I remember being thinking to myself, oh my gosh, like when the plane's going to hit, this is how my life's going to end. It was just disbelief that this was actually happening. But there wasn't time to be scared in that moment because the, the moment felt like a dream. The plane plummeting into the trees. This was the aftermath of the harrowing accident. Flattened, twisted wreckage, mangled metal. The six-seater plane decimated. And this heart-pounding 911 call. There's been a plane crash at the airport. The caller, Jared Steffen, a family friend who was at the airport and witnessed the plane go down. His voice trembling on the line, panting as he races to the scene. And over the next few minutes... I didn't hear that. Oh my God, they're screaming. I, I don't know what to do. One of them is out. The first out of the ashes of the aircraft, Sienna. Come here, honey. It's okay. All three people are out. Okay. Yes. We're alive. Finally, all three safe, miraculously emerging without injury. Their beloved dog, Charlie, running off after the crash, but thankfully found 13 hours later. She's definitely experienced more in six months than I think most golden retrievers have at this point. Now, I'm happy that she's just jumping around, barking, you know, and, and, and reinforcing that, you know, there's too much fun to be had in life to try to get bogged down. Ronnie says he has 26 years of flying experience and to this day still can't figure out what went wrong, but the family is counting their blessings. I'm so grateful to uh, get to, you know, wake up every morning next to my wife. I'm so grateful that my niece is resilient. Every day is a gift and life, you know, is beautiful and we're trying to make the best out of it and enjoy every moment of it. Nice to have a happy ending there. Our thanks to Ariel. Still ahead here on Prime, dogs are dying after contracting an illness and officials can't figure out what's causing it. New developments in the death of Brianna Taylor. And on the ballot tonight, primaries, many politicians who deny that former President Trump lost the 2020 election. We take a look at their impact so far by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. 
50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis. The powerful series, streaming free on ABC News Live. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated abcnews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at abcnews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Welcome back, everyone. As they have in other Republican races this season, many election deniers are running in today's Republican primaries in Florida as well as New York, drawing attention to the wider issue of Republican election deniers running in and winning primaries ahead of the midterms. We take a look at election deniers by the numbers. 171, that's the number, according to ABC News' 538 of Republican nominees nationwide who are full-blown election deniers. They're running for U.S. Senate and House seats as well as state races across the country that comes out to a total of 37 percent of all Republican nominees running right now who embrace Trump's lies about the 2020 election. An additional 54 nominees or 12 percent have expressed doubts about the 2020 election despite the evidence that there was no widespread fraud, meaning 49 percent, basically half of all Republican nominees either deny or cast doubt on Joe Biden's election in 2020. Republican nominees for the House of Representatives are the most likely to deny deny the 2020 results. 42% of all Republican House nominees deny the election. That's 145 out of 349 nominees. And while lower in number, election deniers are also running in state races for Secretary of State. In fact, some 22%, more than one-fifth of Republican nominees for those officers, deny President Biden won the election. And many of those are running in swing states where the 2024 election could be decided. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. A warning for thousands of SUV owners, don't put these particular vehicles in your driveway Why some models are being recalled. And the 600-year-old discovery uncovered by a drought. First, we'll look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust, and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. 
It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Former President Donald Trump allegedly had more than 700 pages of classified material at his Mar-a-Lago estate in Florida, according to a letter sent in May from the National Archives to a lawyer representing Trump. That letter, released today by the National Archives after it was first published by a conservative journalist, confirms documents with the highest levels of classification intended to be stored and viewed in only the most secure settings were found at Trump's Florida home, which doubles as a club for paying members. One congressional Democrat expressing concern on MSNBC. 300 pages, you know, just, uh, you know, a basement uh, stairway away uh, in an open, you know, beach house is not where you would want that information. The first batch of classified documents were handed over to the National Archives in January. Trump has called the search unwarranted and is now asking another federal judge to stop the DOJ from reviewing the materials secured during the raid and to appoint an independent special master who can determine determine if Trump was entitled to possess any of the documents. The letter from the National Archives also shows the former president's legal team tried to claim the first set of classified documents returned in January were covered under executive privilege. That argument was ultimately rejected by the DOJ because only a sitting president can invoke executive privilege and Trump was no longer in office. A guilty plea today from the husband of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. In court, Paul Pelosi's attorney entered a plea on his behalf of guilty to driving under the influence causing injury in Napa County on May 28th. He was driving a Porsche in Napa when he crossed a road in front of a Jeep causing what the California Highway Patrol called major damage. As a part of his plea deal, the 82-year-old Pelosi will serve three years probation. The deal includes five days of jail, but he'll get credit for four days, two of which he actually served, and the remaining day will be served on a court work program. He also has to go through a drunk driving program and pay restitution, among other parts of his sentence. A guilty plea in the shooting death of Breonna Taylor. Former Louisville Metro PD Detective Kelly Goodlett pleaded guilty to helping falsify an affidavit for the search of Taylor's apartment. Admitting to falsely claiming a postal inspector verified Taylor was receiving packages for her ex-boyfriend, a convicted drug dealer. A no-knock warrant ended in Taylor's death in March of 2020. Taylor's mother was present as Goodlett pleaded guilty to misleading a judge about the warrant. She faces up to five years in prison. Officials in Michigan are investigating a parvo-like illness that has killed more than a dozen dogs in one county. Now, the illness mimics symptoms of the known dog illness called parvovirus, or parvo. Symptoms include lethargy, vomiting, and bloody diarrhea. The lab work is underway to determine whether the virus is a new strain or if it is parvo. Health officials say this is a good reminder to make sure that your dog is up to date with vaccinations. Hyundai and Kia are recalling 281,000 SUVs and warning owners to park their cars outside and away from homes due to fire risks. The models include Hyundai Palisade and Kia Telluride vehicles. The problems, an accessory tow hitch sold through dealerships. In some cases, an electrical short can spark a fire even when the ignition is off. Sales of the SUVs have been halted. A silver lining to a persistent drought in China. Receding waters in the Yangtze River uncovered these lost treasures. Three Buddhist statues believed to be 600 years old, possibly from the Ming or Qing dynasties. The river's water level plunged because of drought and a heat wave in China's southwestern region. 
Owning a home has long been considered the pinnacle of the American dream, but what happens when the home and space that you've occupied and invested in is not viewed as as valuable as it should possibly be simply because of the color of your skin? Well, that's how one couple describes their experience when getting an appraisal on their home, and they say that it was undervalued simply because they are black. Joining us now are doctors Nathan Connolly and Shani Mott. Thank you both for being here. So let's just walk through the process here. The two of you were looking to refinance your home to take advantage of the low interest rates. And then what happened? Well, we experienced discrimination. Um, we made a pretty straightforward application to get our house at a reduced interest rate from 4.65% to two and a quarter. And we thought we were in pretty good shape to be able to meet the mark. We had made investments in the house that exceeded you know, $30,000. We had seen the market on a steady uptick and we had a baseline amount that was labeled as pretty conservative, both by us and by the loan officer at Loan Depot with whom we worked. And so we were very surprised to learn upon a drive down to Florida we were making as a family that the home did not come in at value. I mean, it's important to know that when we first started this process, we looked at a range of, of loan companies. And one of the things that I really appreciated about Loan Depot was just how communicative they were. And I had lots of questions. You know, I was trying to kind of go by the book and collect at least, you know, four to five estimates and talk with people and see who I vibed with. So then you go and get a second appraisal after, in effect, whitewashing your house. Give us a sense, first of all, what you did to whitewash your house. <laughs> Well, well, we were aware that there were um, examples of whitewashing being effective um, in helping black families get the value that they were entitled to. And so we had to have a, a very careful conversation with our children. Um, we knew that we would have to remove evidence of their presence in our home, evidence of our own presence in the home. Because right from the beginning, it seems that you jumped to the conclusion our house came in with this low appraisal simply because we're black. Well, I don't know if it was that we jumped to that conclusion. I mean, we certainly gave um, the representative from 2020 Valuations, Mr. Shane Lanham, a chance to do his job. I mean, when he we were in the home during the first appraisal, right. we made you know light conversation with him. We certainly gave him free run of the place. Um, you know, we ha again had some sense that discrimination was a problem, but we didn't expect that it would happen in this particular case. And so when the number came back at 472,000, my jaw dropped. Right. I, I just I was like, this is racism. Right. Because we had done the research. Right. right? Like, I mean, it's aside from researching um, to try to figure out what the numbers would be for what we could sell our house for, I would ask a neighbor if they were in the process of refinancing, you know, what did their their homes come in at? And right. so um, we didn't go into this in, into this process, this refinance process blindly. Like we were, uh, yeah, we were educated consumers. We did the whitewashing experiment. And even though we had already given Loan Depot comps that had reflected a value in the mid sixes or even higher, and we had been rejected, we left the whitewashing experiment to kind of be that final bit of evidence that we needed to be made whole. So what did the experiment bear out? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we, we had a we had a white colleague meet the uh, new appraiser at the door. Um, they apparently had some light conversation and um, you know shared some anecdotes. Um, it, it apparently um, was a pretty easy appraisal um, by the, the, the observation of our colleague. It didn't seem to, that there were a whole lot of questions, um, and the appraisal came back. I want to say within the, the same week yeah. um, at, at seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Um, which was and obviously... And your jaw dropped again, I have to imagine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it was it was just one of those moments where, um, you know, you're kind of like, okay, this is real. Um, you know, you, you, you know about the, the history, um, but to feel like we're very much part of that historical process of, of right. Black folk being devalued, of not being able to get um, a fair shake, and, and it also feels as though, frankly, we're at a moment where we need a new movement that is able to operate and be able to kind of distill this particular form of racism and really challenge it. So despite this being your expertise, you still found this very hurtful. Yeah, I think that that's that. I mean, what 
it's it's so interesting because there's a, a dilemma, right? Like it's there's a continue you live a contradiction. Like there are things that happen in this country where you're like, ah, oh, things have progressed significantly. Um, and you you never think that somehow you would be the the victim of discrimination. Like you're like, I play by the rules, I do all that I'm supposed to do. The other thing that made it very challenging was 20 minutes um, after we had gotten the call about our home not reaching value, we had gotten a notification from one of Shani's doctors that she had a mass somewhere on her, around her kidney or her adrenal gland, we didn't know. And so the process of trying to appeal the low valuation was actually simultaneous with us grouping around for answers about her health. Let me just say that I did this very resentfully. <laughs> I, I had, I kept thinking, what are we prioritizing? Right, you know, right. are we putting responding to Lone Depot ahead of my, you know, ahead of my health? You know, and so I just, but I was like, this is something we have to do. Right. I'm curious how you explained all this to your children, right? Because there are certain experiences that you all are familiar with from enduring or studying yourselves. But then when you're trying to discuss with a younger generation about this is America, how do you go about doing that? Well, I think it's important to note that the conversation that we have with our children was new in terms of um, this housing sit situation, right. but we make racial literacy a constant in our house. Right. Um, we we name power, we name blackness, we celebrate blackness, and so um, I think we just talked about it in terms of us making decisions um, to get what we deserve. It, lastly, it, kind of a two-parter and unrelated questions, but. Uh, Shani, I'd love to follow up on, on your health at this point and at the same time on your household, because what did you ultimately have happen with the appraisal? Well, my health, ah, oh God, it's been a long um, journey. I'm currently starting a trial um, at NIH on rare cancers, because it seems as though the chemo that I was on worked for a bit, and then they put me on immunotherapy, and I just had a serious allergic reaction to it and had to take three months off. And um, now I am, you know, hope hoping that this trial um, does something with the, the, yeah, the cancer, that the adrenal gland cancer that I have because I'm not ready to um, leave this world. There's so much work to be done, and I am definitely ready to um, continue to love on my children, dream on my children, and educate them um, to be a force. Relative to the, the house, um, you know, I mean, one, it, it was important to in some ways get more photos of the family and yeah. kind of, you know, reassert our, our place here. Um, it was also, uh, I think, important that we did, in fact, at least get a, a refinance that allowed us to um, bring our mortgage payment down. The market conditions did change. The interest rates uh, went up, so it, it was not the same rate that we initially were supposed to be approved for. Um, we had to change the terms of the loan by virtue of that from uh, a 15-year mortgage to a 30-year mortgage. And so now we'll be you know, expected to pay an additional 15 years of payments on the property. And that means there are a whole host of things that we won't be able to do in terms of investments in, you know, kids' college funds, being able to have equity, you know, accumulate more quickly, um, just freeing up our income, you know, in general. All of that has been lost um, through the actions of, you know, a very small number of people. Well, we thank you so much for sharing your experience. It was mouth-dropping to you and eye-opening, perhaps, for, for many others. Uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Shani Maud and Nathan Connolly, we, we really appreciate your, your insight tonight. Thank you. Thank you for having us. In 2017, former Marine Brian Brown easily handed a note to a clerk at a Wells Fargo in Marietta, Georgia, that said, I have a bomb. His motivation behind the resulting robbery is chronicled in the upcoming thriller drama Breaking, starring John Boyega. It reveals how Easley's actions were fueled by his mental health struggles caused by war and his quest to get money that he felt the government owed him. With an escalating hostage situation and lives at stake, the film is equally as thrilling as it is tragic. Take a look. Is this what I need to do? No, we're gonna... We're gonna take this care of this. what I need to do? Okay. Okay. Is this what you need? 
Is this all the motivation you need to give me what I need? You have hostages in here, ma'am. Hostages, and they scared. Brian. They scared for their damn lives. Brian. I need a phone call. You can feel the intensity there. Joining us now is actor John Boyoya in the studio with us and director and screenwriter Abby Damaris Corbin. She is joining us via Zoom. Abby, John, thank you both so much for joining us well, tonight. Thank you. thank you for having us. I mean, let's just start right off with that gripping scene. Yeah. Uh, I'm so curious because when we talk about the typical, the stereotypical bank robber, right, they're motivated by greed. But this mm. is something totally different. This is somebody who went into a bank and asked for $892.34 sense. Right. How do you channel uh, playing a role of somebody who's alive and, and such a multifaceted character? I think it starts off with, with Abby and, and the accessibility to research. We have a lot of documentation that surrounded the case. Uh, Brian himself, access to the family, you know, so his, his ex-wife Jessica told me about his speech, the way in which he spoke, such so quite soft-spoken uh, young man. Um, CCTV footage, unfortunately, images, a whole bunch of information that I had to take in just to portray this amazing an amazing man in this amazing story. And, and so many veterans, you know, they want to be seen and, yeah. and heard and, yeah. and feel that they are owned something, and, and perhaps rightfully so. Did you yes. do that that research, or, or how did you connect with that yeah. veteran spirit? I had to because um, I don't have any family members that actually serve, and I don't have any extended friends, nothing. So for me, I had to I had to transcend, go past myself, and, and find individuals at that time to, to speak to. Um, Abby's in a fantastic position. I mean, her father, who, who, who has served, gave us a lot of, you know, pointers. And, and Abby herself, who has who is been deeply related to those issues, also gave me some, some motivation and help and information. So we really, really worked hard with our quick turnaround time, by the way, before, before shooting, to just get all the information right to portray this man. And Abby, going to get right to you in a moment. But last performance from Michael K. Williams, yeah. what was it like connecting with him on, on multiple levels, just working with him, but also mm -hmm. as, as fellow veterans? I feel like... Um, Michael is one of my inspirations for getting into acting in the first place. I've, I admire a lot of the people that worked on The Wire, HBO's The Wire and, and Boardwalk Empire, and to have him included in this film and to portray this role in such a way. I mean, he plays the negotiator, someone that's supposed to become with um, an, a level of empathy, um, also a level of authority. And that balance that Michael Kay played, man, it just shows why he's one of the most versatile actors in the game. So. And, yeah. and Abby, your father was also a veteran, and you've said that when you heard about this story, you immediately had a strong feeling of empathy. It tell us about why you connected so much with this story and when you decided that it needed to be a film. You know, uh, a friend actually texted me the article about Brian Brown, Brown Easley. I pulled over to the side of the road and read the whole 40-page thing in one sitting. My heart was broken, and I, I, nobody else had heard this story. It hadn't made it to a broad level, so I wanted to make sure that it was told. Um, mm. I recognized my dad's story in it, and I'm so grateful to be here with you today so that we can tell Brian's story. And unfortunately, so many of our veterans struggle with PTSD and, and the feeling of being lost in the system, lost in the world, perhaps. Watching the film, it feels like that's the message that Brown Easley is trying to get across in some way. Abby, you've studied how these struggles impact veterans as both a, a director as well as a writer. How did you balance portraying those issues with words and emotions all through the experience of, of just one person? Well, I was really fortunate to partner with John here. He came in with an immense amount of craft. As an actor, he's able to hold the duality of uh, the heart, the, the empathy, the action. So you put all that down on the page in conjunction with Brian's wife, and John just lets it out. How do you, what do you draw on for that? I mean, just even in that one scene where we mm. just saw that, that, desperation and, mm. and panic. Mm. I think it's the frustration of the detail. Uh, it's the collective uh, notes from various veteran uh, individuals who have, haven't got the opportunity. That, that, that frustration is, is able to be manifested in that bank in a way that's just dynamic um, and in a way that, that shows his true anger and concern for his livelihood, not only for himself, but his livelihood of his wife and his, and his daughter. Um, and, and from that, just even as a person, as a human being in, in, in an empathy state, us thinking about that, it will, and I'm sure will frustrate you. Uh, imagine then I gave you a scene to be able to do it. I'm sure you go in I to be able to know. give that, that, that <laughs> you'll be able to give it some energy, you know, that some takes energy. Some talent. It takes some time, <laughs> but you know, it, it's, it's some energies come, it, come from that it comes from a natural place of empathy. Like, I, I can't believe that 
I'm in a role which I'm grateful for, but I'm in a role that is, is telling this narrative um, and, and, and then that frustration kind of builds naturally. And such an important one. I yeah. feel like the veterans just don't get their due so often. Yeah. Uh, just switching gears here, of course, you're part of major franchises, Pacific Rim, yeah. Star Wars. I told you, my yeah. son, he's a oh, huge yeah, fan. Yeah, yeah. He's like, wait, who do you have on the show tonight? Um, but any taste of, of what you're working on that, that you have coming up? I know you have a, a new movie that you're working on with Viola Davis. Yeah, I've got a new movie called uh, The Woman King with Viola Davis. And then I've got another movie coming out later this year with Jamie Foxx called They Clone Tyrone. So. Yeah, we look forward to that one. We are all looking forward to it. Brian, Abby, we thank you so much for joining us Good to us see you, Abby. <laughs> you too. <laughs> and their film, Breaking, is out in theaters on August 26th. You're not going to want to miss this. So many treasures from our national parks have been photographed, but so have the effects of climate change. Will Reeve spoke with a renowned National Geographic photographer who's capturing its impact. What I try to do is capture a place that's familiar, but I want to show it to you in a way you've never seen it before. I'm a storyteller. National Geographic photographer Stephen Wilkes's pictures tell compelling stories. From the ghosts of Ellis Island to showcasing an alternative dimension even stranger than we could ever imagine. I think what really makes a great and meaningful photograph is the story that it tells. You know, does it make you feel something? His award-winning day-to-night photography series showing time passing in a single image. It's one of his best-known projects. What is the process for a photograph like that? It takes months sometimes. I put cranes in places. I build scaffolding. What we just did in, from Shai Shai Beach, I took three separate trips to finally get that photograph. And I stood on a rock for almost 20 hours photographing this epic seascape. When I went to Bears Ears National Park in Utah, Colorado border, we hiked in over an hour and we camped for three nights to capture the moon rising. And after 20 years photographing our national parks, Wilkes has borne witness to the impact of a changing climate. In the Yukon, we were expecting 55 degree temperatures and a, a migration to come through. And we ended up having 30 degree temperatures, 50 knot winds and snow. The Peace J. L. Bar Ranch in Yellowstone for America the Beautiful. Do you know that two weeks later, the bridges that I traveled to to make that photograph don't exist anymore? The Yellowstone River flooded at a scale and a magnitude it's never been seen before, you know, hundreds of years. We really have to change our behavior because we've been a species uh, that's constantly taken and not given. And our planet needs a steward right now. The future of our national parks all the more important to Wilkes, who has a big reason to care. Because this last year, I've been blessed with a beautiful granddaughter named Sadie Ray, and she's inspired me. I watch the way she sees the world. And when you see the world through a child's eyes, it, it touches your soul. And it made me think about what are we going to leave her? What is her world going to be like 20 years from now? And so, you know, for me, every day I'm, I'm with her, I'm thinking about the joy in the moment, the magic that I see, but also, what can I do to make sure that she gets to see that flower 20 years from now? Just astonishing images there. Our thanks to Will Reed for that. And before we go tonight, our image of the day on this primary night, Florida voters are making their voices heard. Thomas Jefferson once said, we do not have government by the majority. We have government by the majority who participate. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. And coming up in the next hour, we're staying on top of a few things. A new possible plan from the Biden administration on student loan forgiveness and continuing coverage of tonight's primary races in New York and Florida as we follow key races for both governor and congressional seats. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free.
This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. Amber Rose Isaac was the love of my life. She went into the hospital. And then I just see Shimani as... She was as good as dead as soon as she walked into that hospital. Black women are four times more likely to die than their white counterparts with the same symptoms. I can't let Amber be another statistic. We need to make sure that this doesn't happen to anyone else. This fight is not over. We're doing this together, man. Lindsay Davis, thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. The AP is reporting that tomorrow President Biden will announce his long-delayed move to forgive up to $10,000 in federal student loans for Americans who earn less than $125,000 and extend a pause on payments till January. More than 43 million Americans have federal student debt, with almost a third owing less than $10,000. The IRS is reviewing safety and security measures in response to, quote, abundance of threats and misinformation information on social media about the agency and its employees. Last week, President Biden signed into law a sweeping law that provides the IRS with $80 billion in new funding to beef up compliance and service over the next decade. The provision has prompted Republicans to claim that the IRS is hiring an army of 87,000 new agents to police tax collections. A man who randomly punched Canadian actor Rick Moranis on a Manhattan sidewalk has been sentenced to two years in prison. Moranis, known for his roles in Honey, I Shrunk the Kids and Ghostbusters, was blindsided by the man on Central Park West back in 2020. And we do have a projection to make right now in Florida's Democratic primary for governor. Moderate Representative Charlie Crist, who once served as a Republican governor of Florida and later became an independent in a failed bid for the Senate, ABC News is projecting that he will go on to win his race and face off against Governor Ron DeSantis this fall. And in Florida's Democratic Senate primary, ABC News is projecting Representative Val Demings will win her race. If Demings wins in November, she would become the second woman to represent Florida in the Senate and the third black woman to be elected to the Senate. For more on tonight's key races, let's bring back in ABC News political director Rick Klein. Rick, let's start in Florida there where the race for governor is center stage. What's at stake tonight? Yeah, this is a bit of a surprise in, in terms of how quickly it's being projected by ABC News. Charlie Crist uh, is winning by about 25 points against Nikki Freed in the in the Democratic race for governor. The only county, in fact, that Nikki Freed is winning in is Alachua County, uh, as Gainesville, where, where she is from. Charlie Crist winning everywhere else. And basically, it's Democrats saying pretty loudly tonight that they want that moderate voice to go up against uh, Ron DeSantis. DeSantis won very narrowly in 2018. Donald Trump won the state a little bit more comfortably in, in 2020. The question is, what kind of head of steam DeSantis might get in, get behind him uh, if he was to launch a 2024 campaign. Is he able to prevail? He's going to first have to, to get past Charlie Crist, who was, was uh, as we just mentioned, already the governor of the state, although as a Republican about a decade ago. And Val Demings, of course, projected to win the Democratic nomination for the Senate in Florida there as well. What are her chances against Marco Rubio this fall? Yeah, look, this state tells you a lot about Florida. The, this picture, the, the pictures here, you see how divided the state is. Val Demings from the Orlando area, she was the police chief there as a 
matter of fact, she's been out fundraising Senator Marco Rubio. Now, Democrats have had a hard time getting anyone elected statewide to Senate races, to governor's races. Uh, a lot of people were surprised that Val Demings put her political reputation on the line, gave up a safe House seat. She was on Vice President Biden's, uh, the, 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 President Biden's uh, vice presidential shortlist a couple years ago, got some national prominence. She ran into this, got into this race, and she's hoping to, to ride some, some of the, the, the waves that other Democrats are expecting, particularly on this issue of policing. She's got a little bit of protection to some of the fights that Republicans uh, are, are often throwing at Democrats because she's able to say, look, as a former police chief, she doesn't ascribe to some of the same, uh, quote unquote, defund the police ideas. And in New York tonight, all eyes on that showdown between incumbents in Manhattan. Just break down how Democrats got into this situation. Yeah, look, it was a question of them being a little too greedy in redistricting. They tried to draw a map that would allow a lot more Democrats to get elected, and the opposite happened because the judge says, no way, you can't do that. So they're stuck with an absolute jumble there in the 12th Congressional District in Manhattan where you've got Jerry Nadler and Carolyn Maloney, allies for 30 years. Only one of them can walk away tonight. Also, an incumbent had to move to another district to get down to lower Manhattan, and another incumbent uh, up here in the Hudson Valley uh, where you've got uh, the, the head of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee who has a progressive challenger. So it's kind of a perfect storm of awfulness for Democrats. They lose a seat in New York. They lose their effort to redistrict it and gerrymander it in a way that's going to give them more Democrats. And some of their biggest leaders in Congress have primary challenges tonight and may face very tough re-election battles in the fall, even if they get through tonight. What did you say? A storm of awfulness. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> likes to hear that. Okay, so also the fallout over the Supreme Court's overturning of Roe v. Wade. That's certainly in focus in a special election here in New York tonight. Explain the dynamics there. Yeah, so this is one of the last special elections that we're going to see uh, in, in all of uh, 2022, one of the last opportunities for voters to go Democrats versus Republicans and weigh in. We've got a district up here in the lower Catskills of the 19th Congressional District. The old lines still apply here because it's just for the last three months. Those last three months matter a lot in terms of messaging, though, because you've got the Democratic candidate who says Roe v. Wade was a disaster of a, of a decision to overthrow that. The Democratic candidate there saying abortion rights on the ballot tonight. Question is, do Democrats agree with that? You've got the Republican candidate who's trying to downplay it a little bit and say, look, we, the abortion rights aren't really in jeopardy in New York. The question becomes, here in the middle of the summer, do enough voters on the Democratic side get out in a seat that could go either way? Again, we're going to learn a lot about the electorate, uh, one of the last opportunities before the fall. All right, Rick Klein, we'll keep checking in with you all throughout the night. Thanks so much. Now let's take a closer look at the state of play here in New York with ABC News Deputy Political Director Avery Harper, who joins us tonight from Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney's campaign. So Avery, the longtime incumbent Maloney faces a difficult challenge against fellow incumbent Congressman Jerry Nadler. How is the Maloney campaign bracing for the potential end of her congressional, congressional career tonight? Well, her team tells me that they are focused on winning. They have uh, been out all day around the district. They have been speaking with voters, engaging with voters, appealing uh, to folks for uh, their vote. And, and they are hoping to come out victorious tonight. Despite that, we know that the momentum is behind Congressman Nadler, uh, who earlier today was speaking with reporters and said, you know, even though the pair of these lawmakers have been uh, in neighboring districts representing New York City and have been collegial for the past three decades, they have not spoken in the lead up to this event. We are watching to see what happens tonight. Uh, because this is an unusual primary, the fact that uh, they are voting in August when many folks are on vacation year, here in New York City, uh, anything could happen. And so we're going to be watching here tonight. And, and you've also been watching the race for New York's 10th congressional district where a moderate former federal prosecutor is facing off against progressives. Break that race down for us. Well, in that race, there are a dozen candidates, so it's a very crowded primary. But uh, the person who's considered the front runner is Dan Goldman. He is a former uh, prosecutor, federal prosecutor, who uh, investigated former President Trump during his first impeachment. Uh, he is someone who has self-funded his campaign, put $4 million of his own money into his campaign. He's the heir uh, to the Levi Strauss uh, fortune. Uh, but there are progressives on the other side of the party, the progressive wing, who are banding together uh, in order to push back on his candidacy. Uh, including uh, Congressman Mondier Jones, who uh, moved to Brooklyn in order to run in this race. Uh, but the fact is that uh, despite the fact that those progressives are banding together, that might not be enough uh, to break up the coalition that Goldman has built uh, in the lead up to this election night. And we've also seen some tensions within the Democratic Party between the progressive wing and the chair of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, Congressman Sean Patrick Maloney. Explain the dynamics there and how it's impacting the races that are being contested tonight. 
Well. Right. Uh, Sean Patrick only took a lot of heat from uh, folks within his own party. He is the head of the campaign arm uh, of the House Democrats. Uh, and there were feelings that he kind of big-footed Mondaire Jones, uh, who could have run in that seat. Uh, that's most of his home turf, uh, is where uh, he is now running. Uh, and now he's going to be challenged by a progressive challenger, someone who is backed by uh, AOC. Her name is Alessandra Biagi. She is a state senator. Uh, we are watching to see what happens in that race. It could be pretty embarrassing uh, if the chair of the House Democrats campaign arm loses uh, his primary to a progressive challenger. But that's something that we are watching. The polls are still open here in New York City, so we're waiting to see what happens and to get more of that vote in. All right, Avery Harper, our thanks to you. We'll be checking back in with you throughout the night. Now I want to go to Representative Darren Soto, a Democrat serving Florida's 9th District. Welcome, Congressman. Thanks for having me. So you're running unopposed in the Democratic primary, but will be challenged, of course, in November. Make the case that the Democrats' agenda in Washington is actually helping your constituents in Central Florida. This has been one of the busiest legislative bodies I've ever served in, from helping folks out with the American Rescue Plan, recover from the pandemic, infrastructure in our district, which is the fastest growing in the nation, uh, to helping our veterans with the PACT Act, bipartisan gun safety reform, helping out with chips, which we make microchips right here in the district. And of course, ending with the Inflation Reduction Act, lowering health care costs and uh, combating climate change, all key issues that we're delivering for Central Florida. And on the flip side, there's evidence that Florida's trending Republican. Trump, of course, won in 2020. Governor Ron DeSantis has emerged now as a Republican star. Why do you think the Democrats are losing ground in the Sunshine State? You know, in 2018, we had a good year here. We took back two seats from the Democrats. And Nikki Fried, ironically, was elected that night statewide. Uh, Trump was the only one on the ballot also living here. Uh, and it was in the middle of pandemic when Democrats really couldn't uh, do the field campaign we normally do while the Republicans just ignored the pandemic. Uh, but this time around, we're able to start much earlier, strong field campaign. Uh, we have Val Demings leading the top of the ticket, a, an amazing candidate with an amazing story. And we've delivered. While all those bills I talked to you about, the Republicans all voted no in Florida. And Charlie Crist, of course, served as a governor of Florida, previously as a Republican. ABC News is projecting that he'll now be the Democratic nominee for governor. Do you see a path for him to beat DeSantis in November as a moderate Democrat? No question. It seems like there's na national amnesia. Governor DeSantis won by 0.3% in 2018. Uh, there's hundreds of thousands, millions of independents here in the state of Florida. The slight edge in registration really just reflected the reality of Dixie Kratz over the years. Charlie Crist is now in this to win it, and he is an easy choice against uh, the governor who has tried to divide Florida and make it a fascist state uh, to stop people from voting, to attack minorities in the LGBTQ community, to attack women. And inflation is worse down here in Florida because DeSantis would rather pursue an agenda of divisiveness rather than work on economic issues. Meanwhile, Charlie was part of this busy Democratic Congress that delivered on so many issues that Floridians care about. You're the first member of Congress of Puerto Rican descent from Florida and recently visited the border as part of a bipartisan group. How's the immigration issue factoring in for Florida voters? You know, it's interesting. It came into focus when Lieutenant Governor Nunez totally botched an interview and stated that they were going to ship Cuban immigrants up to Delaware. You know, I went to the border, bipartisan trip, and I saw Venezuelans and Cubans and Haitians coming across the border, fleeing political persecution, many of them coming to Florida. And we need to help respect these folks and help them resettle. And instead, you see uh, the lieutenant governor shunning her own Cuban population, saying the door is shut in Florida, and it exposed a window in the extreme anti-immigrant agenda of DeSantis in a state that's nearly a majority-minority state. Congressman Soto, thanks so much. We hope you'll come back on and talk with us in November. Happy to do it. And still to come, new details on the search of Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate. A new letter now alleges hundreds of classified materials were in his possession. The police believe may have led to the death of a girl whose body was found in a river. This is ABC News Live.
with the crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. Now to new details stemming from the search of former President Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago home. Today, the National Archives released a letter that highlights the sheer volume of classified records the former president allegedly took from the White House to his Florida estate. The Department of Justice has said it's still in the early stages of the investigation into how those documents got to Mar-a-Lago. All of it comes as Trump's legal team is trying to stop the DOJ from reviewing any of the records it seized. Here's Terry Moran. Tonight, a newly released letter from the National Archives reveals the scope and the magnitude of the trove of classified material Donald Trump took with him to Mar-a-Lago when he left the White House. Over 100 documents with classification markings comprising more than 700 pages. Some include the highest levels of classification, including Special Access Program's SAP materials. That security designation is reserved for the most sensitive secrets in the government. It restricts access to the smallest number of individuals possible, only those with a need to know. The letter from the archives was released by a representative of Trump himself. This past January, the Trump team handed over 15 boxes of documents to the archives. The New York Times reports they included documents from the CIA, the National Security Agency, and the FBI. According to the paper, Mr. Trump went through the boxes himself before turning them over. But even after that, Trump still had not returned everything sought by the government. Months later in June, more documents were given back. And then, in that search on August 8th, the FBI seized 11 more sets of classified materials. Our thanks to Terry Moran for that. And now we head to Florida, where our Victor Kendo is live in Miami, where Governor DeSantis is located. And Victor, DeSantis is running, of course, unopposed tonight, but people are still showing up to support. Give us a sense of what the vibe is like in the room right now. That's right, Lindsay. We are just outside of what is being dubbed the Keep Florida Free Tour. You can see what's happening inside that room behind me. Right now, you've got the lieutenant governor. She is on stage right now. That room, it is packed. He's got a lot of supporters. And I can tell you, it definitely has that celebratory, that party atmosphere going on inside. You can hear the cheers behind me, even though Governor Ron DeSantis wasn't even on the ballot right now. He is running unopposed. We're expecting to hear from the governor and Senator Marco Rubio at some point tonight. Lindsay? And the Democratic candidate projected to win and run against Ron DeSantis is no other than former Florida Governor Christ, who was once a Republican himself, no stranger to Florida politics. That's right. And Chris was the favorite all along in this race. He is a household name in the Sunshine State. As you mentioned, he was once the Republican governor. He has since switched parties. And Chris would no doubt have a number of hurdles to clear. This would be an uphill battle for him. He would have to convince Democrats that he is, in fact, a Democrat, given that he's been a part of just about 
every party, and he's held almost every office in the state for the last three decades. And in speaking with voters over the last few days, despite all of his experience, some only voted for Chris because they feel he has the best chance against DeSantis. Uh, some, on the other hand, see his GOP experience as a bonus. All right, Victor Kendall will be checking back in early. Tonight. How come? Well, because he's an old swamp rat from Florida. You know, he was governor of Florida. He, he, he can walk on water. I think he moves with the times and the, and the current, uh, current uh, situation in this country. And I, I kind of respect that. And last thing, Lindsay, he would absolutely need those independent voters. He is confident that he will get them. He feels he is the best man to take on a very popular Ron DeSantis. Lindsay? All right, Victor Kendo, we'll check back in with you later on tonight. Tonight in Atlanta, murder charges have been dropped against two police officers accused of killing Rayshard Brooks. Steve Osinsami on why the officers have been cleared. Police officers in Georgia are celebrating this tonight. It's my conclusion that the use of deadly force was objectively reasonable and that they did not act with criminal intent. The special prosecutor has announced that he will clear the two white police officers seen here in an arrest that turned deadly at the parking lot of this Atlanta fast food restaurant in June of 2020. Authorities today shared that the victim, 27-year-old Rayshard Brooks, wasn't just drunk behind the wheel, but was also on cocaine and other drugs. And that officers Garrett Rolfe and Devin Brosnan, who were responding to calls from the restaurant, acted within the law. The police didn't come into this encounter hot. They, there was no uh, hostility. They were businesslike. They were polite. In announcing their decision, authorities replayed videos of the 40-minute encounter, pointing out that not only did Rayshard Brooks grab a police stun gun and run, but that he was pointing the weapon at the officer who shot and killed him. Brosnan and Rolfe committed no crimes. This was the summer of demonstrations over the killings of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery, the Wendy's fast food restaurant where Brooks was killed, burned to the ground. The family of Rayshard Brooks tonight is heartbroken. This family lost a father and they deserve a jury trial. Steve Osinsami joins us tonight from Atlanta. Steve, what happens to the officers now? Do they get their jobs back? Well, one of the officers who lost his job fought it and got his job back already. Both officers are still on the police force tonight. The police association here says that they will now get training. Uh, they're currently on administrative leave. And I should kind of put this in, into some context, Lindsay. You know, this all happened during the summer of street protests after the killings of Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd. And these officers have argued that they were sacrificed by authorities to help calm the streets, which of course didn't work. Lindsay? All right, Steve Osinsami, our thanks to you. We're now tracking several headlines around the world. Flash floods caused by unusually heavy monsoon rains have killed at least 783 people in Pakistan over the last two months. Government agencies and the army have set up aid and relief camps in flood hit regions and we're working to help relocate families and provide food and medicine. The flooding has damaged more than 95,000 houses. The body of a Guatemalan girl was found in the waters of the Rio Bravo River between Mexico and the United States, making it the latest incident in which a migrant has died while trying to reach this country. According to officials, the girl had been trying to cross the river with her mother when strong currents ripped the child from her mother's arms. She's believed to have been dragged for about three miles downstream. The girl's mother was put under the care of Mexican officials. A car thief's crime came to an end at a bus terminal in Madrid. Look at this video showing firefighters using a pulley to move the car from the lower floor to the ground floor via the stairs. Police said no one at the terminal was injured and the driver of the car was taken to the hospital. A new study finds that young adults using marijuana and hallucinogens hit their highest level in decades. Trevor Alt now has more on the new numbers and popular infused beverages that are sparking new concerns. A new study shows marijuana and hallucinogen use among young adults 19 to 30 years old has increased significantly to the highest levels since the late 80s. In 2021, 43% said they'd use marijuana in the past year, up from 34% five years ago and 29% 10 years ago. Now more than one in 10 say they use marijuana every day. Recreational marijuana use is now legal for adults in 19 states in the District of Columbia. It's already a gigantic industry. $24 billion in legal sales last year, and that's expected to nearly double by 2026. 
Many advocates claim marijuana is as safe, if not safer, than alcohol, which is believed to contribute to tens of thousands of deaths every year. And researchers say they have seen some negative effects. It is particularly concerning for teenagers and young adults who have developing brains that are particularly susceptible to the negative effects. Pretty much everybody who ends up having a problem with substance use started as a teenager. Um, and continued use as a young adult. One trend growing increasingly popular, drinks made with THC, the active ingredient in marijuana. Take the brand Pabst Labs, a company selling infused beverages, marketing them as a great opportunity to experience a completely different kind of buzz without any hangover. Cannabis data company BDSA says in the 12 markets they track, sales of cannabis beverages increased 65% from 2020 to 2021. Some doctors urge caution, saying you may not know exactly what's in the drink or how it might affect you, and that the beverages are both understudied and under Underregulated. Well, thanks to Trevor Alt for that. Still to come, high stakes night in Florida and New York. We'll tell you about the races you need to watch. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award winning, powerful, eye opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Ready for a little GMA ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Welcome back, everyone, on this primary night. Let's bring back in ABC News political director, Mr. Rick Klein. Rick, we're starting to see those results coming in from Florida at this hour. What are you keeping an eye on there in particular tonight? Yeah, the headline is that Charlie Crist is going to be the Democratic nominee for governor. It's a familiar name in Florida because he was once the Republican governor of Florida. And he just said at his victory speech that, that the people of Florida have, uh, have sent a message. And it's an interesting message because Ron DeSantis, who won pretty narrowly back in 2018, looking for this uh, a second victory, a re-election win that might lead right into a 2024 bid, Charlie Crist says he's going to stop that with a message of unity and saying uh, he doesn't want to divide Floridians. It, it, the little bit of an echo there is... In the, in the Biden message back in 2020. Uh, and Florida voters in the Democratic primary by a wide margin going for the tried and true choice of Charlie Crist, someone who was formerly Republican, formerly independent, a well-known name, as opposed to Nikki Freed, uh, substantially younger, uh, for only woman, uh, to, to, the, potentially the only woman to, to, to serve as governor. She's thwarted in that, uh, in, in that particular ambition and the only Democrat now in statewide office. So to me, it's really interesting to see Democrats send that message, particularly when they've got their targets as squarely on Ron DeSantis as they as they have. And both Florida and New York saw major impacts from the battle over redistricting. How is it playing out differently in each state and how could it impact control of the House? Yeah, Lindsay, it's two sides of a different corn, a coin with a much different outcome uh, for Democrats. So Republicans under Governor DeSantis had a very aggressive gerrymander. It could be that they added three or more Republicans to their House delegation come next year, depending on how things play out over the next couple of months, based on those new, dis new districts. Now, in New York, the Democrats had this map that they thought would undo all of that and maybe even go further, adding more Democrats to the delegation. But a judge said no way to that. That's what pushed back the primary, and that's what's created this story of, uh, of a pile 
pileup in, in New York. Uh, there's some big rivalries in, in New York today. You've got the Yankees and the Mets. You've also got uh, Carolyn Maloney and Jerry Nadler running against each other uh, for, for all the goods in a, in a newly created congressional district. You've also got uh, members of Congress challenged, including the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee chairman. Uh, we've had people have to change district. So really, it's a, it's a careful what you wish for type of moment for Democrats, because they thought that Democrats uh, would be able to deliver for them in Albany gains that would help them in Washington. In, in fact, in a year where the, New York's actually losing a congressional district, they're going to lose potentially several Democrats from Congress, uh, starting with at least one incumbent who we know won't win tonight. Uh, we haven't seen any results there, though. The polls are still open in New York City and, and throughout New York State. But as that develops, realize that, that we're taking seats off the board for Democrats tonight. Meanwhile, Republicans almost certainly adding to their margin in New York as well as Florida. So redistricting has a major impact. It's a much different map than they had in the past, and it is one that is going to clearly tilt toward Republicans as they try to take over control of the House this year. And Nadler, Maloney, it probably is about as contentious as, as the Mets uh, versus the Yankees. You know, a lot of people are sitting at home in Texas, in Kansas, perhaps in, in California, saying, what difference does it make what happens in New York and Florida tonight? Kind of explain the national implications. Yeah, number one, control of the House. As we, as, as mentioned, we've got uh, Democrats hoping to hold on to whatever ground they can in New York and Florida both. I think the direction of the Democratic Party is another big question there. I mean, taking a look at, at, at the dynamics there in Manhattan alone, when you have all these different choices, that's going to be a Democratic seat. What kind of Democrat do you want? Meanwhile, you've got something like Sean Patrick Maloney up here in the, in the Hudson Valley area of New York running against a more progressive challenger. The soul of the Democratic Party continues to be litigated through these primaries. It's been a mixed season for them. Frankly, Donald Trump has had a better campaign season uh, than progressive. So if you're looking at, at how the parties are positioning, you've got Republicans going more extreme in, a, in an election-denying fashion, in a pro-Trump fashion. Uh, Democrats, though, are, are tending to, to stick more with moderates. Um, we'll see how that plays out in New York, but we know that they've already made a choice in Florida. All right, Rick Klein, our thanks to you once again. We'll check back in with you later tonight. That will do it for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a good night. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. The tragic update in the search for a California teenager who disappeared after a party a few weeks ago. A well-known volunteer group joined the search and made a surprising discovery. It's left her family heartbroken and is raising even more questions. Here's ABC's chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman. Kylie Rodney seemed to have vanished without a trace. The 16-year-old was last seen on August 6th at the Prosser family campground near Truckee, a community north of Lake Tahoe. There, she attended a party with several hundred other teens, many of whom were drinking. Her mother said she got a text from Kylie saying she was heading home. An hour later, at 12.30 a.m., her cell phone pinged for the last time near this lake. She never came home. 
The case was initially treated as a possible abduction. We have stories about the beginning of the night and the middle of the night, but we don't really have. There are no stories about her leaving, when she left, or who she left with. Authorities launched a massive search, but no one could find her. Then a team from a volunteer group called Adventures with Purpose joined the search, and just two days later, they detected an object with cutting-edge sonar technology in nearby Prosser Lake. It was a vehicle submerged in 14 feet of water, 55 feet offshore. You know, it's very tragic. At that point, we were, uh, you know, all hope for her coming home was gone. Today, authorities confirming it was Rodney's vehicle with human remains inside, explaining that early searches had missed it, but not for lack of effort. The lake was extensively searched with side sonar, with an ROV. Uh, we had divers, we had swimmers. Kylie Rodney has still not formally been identified. The official autopsy is tomorrow. Tonight, Rodney's family issuing a statement saying Kylie will surely remain with us, even though we will not get her back. A family's heartbreak, our thanks to Matt. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. It's an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The Hunt. True crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. It's a big day for the Leggett family. And today is the last day. Are you guys excited? Yes. After just four really weeks excited. of lessons, James and Cairo are about to be official swimmers. Cairo, you got your goggles in there? At a very special swim club. Belt on, boys. We are going to the Nile Swim Club. We should be there in about... Two minutes. They're really good swimming class because they managed to teach us how to swim from scratch. Right here in the borough of Yaden, just outside Philadelphia, sits a piece of American history. Hold your mouth. No, no stop. Hold your mouth. Your stop. stop holding your breath. Come on, stop holding your breath. The Nile Swim Club. The oldest black-owned private pool in the country. Is on a mission to save lives. Ready? Put your hand on my shoulder. With drowning still one of the leading causes of death among children, 
young black girls and boys are facing even grimmer statistics. African Americans drown at a rate 50% higher than that of white people, and nearly 64% of black children have little or no swimming ability. For white children, the number is 40%. The CDC classifying drownings as a serious public health problem. But these numbers aren't just a coincidence. They stem from a legacy of racism and inequality, where black Americans were systematically kept out of pools and beaches, passing down a crippling fear of water in families for generations. Is swimming a civil rights issue, an issue of equality? I think so. I think that it's a lack of access. I think our lifeguards do a phenomenal job. Anthony Patterson is the current president of the club and says these swim classes are vital. It's all part of the club's No Child Will Drown in Our Town campaign. It's up to us because it appears that, you know, counting on other folks to teach our children how to swim is not happening in our community. The free program has taught this fundamental skill to hundreds of children since it first started in 2018. Why do you think it's so important to know how to swim? Say somebody slips in and they need help. You can come and get them, right? If you know how to swim, that's important. Eight-year-old Cairo is now one of the Nile's many success stories. Cairo just had a big fear of water, period. He don't even want to, like, wash his face, like, get his face wet really? in the shower. He don't want the water, like, coming down on him. But today... There you go. That's yours, too, OK? Cairo, James, and their classmates graduated. Their final test, jumping off the diving board into the deep end. Now, when you say private swim club, right. what do you think comes to mind in most people? In those cases, I think they're looking for exclusion. The Nile Swim Club was created in 1958 after two black families were denied membership into the racially segregated Yadin Swim Club. As a matter of fact, when they went to submit their applications, they forgot to write some information down. They went back up to the pool and they found their applications in the trash. In the trash? In the trash. Our founders decided instead of fighting and protesting and forcing them to uh, have us join their club, they decided, you know what, we'll go back to our community, raise the money we need, and pretty much purchased this four and a half acres of land and put the Nile Swim Club here. The swimming deficit in the black community is uniquely American and can be traced back to when enslaved Africans were forbidden to swim. Access to beaches and pools played a key role in the struggle for civil rights, leading to an often forgotten seminal moment on June 18, 1964. On that day, a group of black and white protesters staged a wade-in, jumping into the whites-only pool at the Monson Motor Lodge in St. Augustine, Florida. In response, James Brock, the owner of the hotel, doused the protesters with acid. Similar acts of civil disobedience emerged across the country, eventually leading to integration at public pools. But white swimmers then began to abandon them, and funding dried up. Closures ensued, paving the way for exclusive private clubs, where allegations of segregation persist. In 2012, the Justice Department found that the historically white and now defunct Valley Club, 20 miles north of Yaden, discriminated against black children during a camp pool trip in 2009. This shouldn't be tolerated that people are still thinking like this and that like they are still like criticizing people just because of the color of their skin. So you're saying even today, People yes. are still Absolutely. denying blacks Absolutely. entrance into private swimming clubs. Absolutely. Fortunately, Listen up. the now swim club. 75 fly, 75 back with fins on. Isn't the only program trying to fix the narrative. We teach them how to swim, and then Jim teaches them how to swim fast. I have a need for speed. Meet Jim Ellis. You'll usually find the 74-year-old just a few miles away from the Nile Swim Club, still coaching some of the world's best up-and-coming swimmers. What does it mean to be on our team? Pride, determination, and resilience. That's the name of the game. All his life, Ellis says he's heard the misconceptions about African Americans in swimming. African Americans can't swim. Their bones are too heavy, they're not built right. Well, I'm African American. I've been swimming all my life. So this is a stereotype. Growing up, Ellis was fortunate to have access to pools. And when he didn't, he found a way. I went to pools that my parents couldn't swim in when they were younger. And uh, once I got to be a teenager, 
I swam in those pools every day in the summertime just to make up for what they couldn't do. In 1971, Ellis would go on to create the Philadelphia Department of Recreation swim team, the first all-black swim team in the country. We had to deal with some issues, uh, people not being receptive to us. You know, we, how dare you sit there, that type of thing. Swimmer, take your mark. In 2007, he received the Hollywood treatment, his life and achievements profiled in the film Pride, starring Terrence Howard. This is our house, and it's built on pride, determination, and resilience. Jim Ellis's program has qualified swimmers for the U.S. Olympic trials, and though no Olympians have come from PDR yet, he's still cheering on the swimmers who've reached that elite level. Colin Jones, I watched him grow up. Simone Manuel, I watched her grow up. Marissa Carrera, so I'm very proud of him. We think of trailblazers yeah. like swim coach Jim Ellis. Yes. Do you think his contributions to the field opened up doors for people like you and others? I love that man, and I don't think I say it enough. U.S. has the slight lead in the third leg of this four-man event. It was at the 2008 Olympics in Beijing when Cullen Jones solidified his name in history, swimming on a legendary team comprised of Jason Lezak, Garrett Weber-Gale, and Michael Phelps. Jones won gold in the 4x100 freestyle relay and broke the world record, becoming the first African-American to accomplish this feat. He says it was rare to see other swimmers who looked like him. You are really regarded as one of the best swimmers our community has to Thank offer. You. Why do you think there aren't more of you? It's not just access, because access is a very easy way for a lot of people to be like, oh, this is the reason why black people don't swim. That is something that has been pushed out of our culture, but we were swimmers. Team Nigeria is great. There are swimmers in other countries. Black people swim. It's a U.S. problem that we believe that this is something we don't do. During the course of his career, Jones was a world-class sprinter, winning four Olympic medals, two gold and two silver, as well as several gold medals at major international swim competitions. Do you ever think that swimming would take you around the world like it has? N never. I mean, I Why just not? never, I never thought that this was for me. I've been put in the same sentence and I, I am humbled by this. Arthur Ashe. Jackie Robinson, Tiger Woods, right. Venus and Serena. But I think that that's the biggest reason. I think that we, we just never saw ourselves do this. A native of Irvington, New Jersey, Jones's first introduction to the water was a frightening one. At five years old, he almost drowned at a water park. My mom heard her only child, her spoiled little brat, ah, nothing. So she shoots down the ride. She doesn't know how to swim. So she's drowning on the right, I'm drowning on the left. Um, so they had to fish me out. I had to be resuscitated. But uh, I'd never want to see any other parent have to go through that. You know, a lot of kids usually, they go forward when they have a moment like that or they retreat back. What do you think was in you that made you say, you know what, no, 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 this isn't the last time. Oh, it's not me, it's my stubborn mother. <laughs> my mom was like, yeah, no, this is not happening again. You're gonna learn. Now a water safety advocate, Jones has partnered with Team USA and their Make a Splash campaign, which helps make swimming lessons more accessible for kids. Mm, we don't like to use the word drowning prevention. Anyone can drown. I can drown. Michael Phelps can drown. What we like to do is say that we are becoming safer around the water. You don't die from not knowing how to play basketball. You wouldn't put your child in a, a, in a car without a safety belt or play football without pads, but you send your child to a pool when it's hot without swim lessons. It's a life skill. A skill he's now passing on to his three-year-old son, Avent. How's that going along? I can teach any <laughs> child to swim. This will be my greatest work. <laughs> <laughs> we went with the pair to see what an Olympic swim lesson looks like. It seems like little Avon is fearless, joining the new generation of young swimmers. We're seeing progress, and for any person that is interested, fearful, I won't tell you my mom's age, but she's learning to swim, so that it's never too late. <laughs> Get out there and learn to swim. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free.
This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Admit it, these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7", is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Can we tempt you with the most incredible ice cream sandwiches, sundaes, and milkshakes in America? Or how about the most delicious, and we mean OMG delicious pies? Next week, GMA's traveling the country to find the sweetest spots in America. Will we be at your favorite spot? Oh, this is going to be sweet. So sweet. When you wish upon a star, makes no difference who you are. Anything your heart desires will come to you. Cinderella, can you believe it's been 25 years since we shot this thing? Girl, 25 years, and I'm still wearing this same dress. Still got it. <laughs> When I was a little girl, Cinderella, to me, what I saw was a little blonde girl. You know, she'd be in a garden with butterflies and bluebirds. I mean, that was me. The image that I had in my head of Cinderella was Disney's original animated version. It was a, a girl in a blue, big, poofy blue dress with blonde hair. Never would I have thought she was a black girl with a raspy, sultry tone to her voice with braids. So. My dreams when, when I was a young girl was to be a singer, have my own band, and meet Whitney Houston. That was it. I had no idea that my destiny would take me to a role, Cinderella, be the first woman of color to play her, and then for Whitney Houston to be my fairy godmother. you got to be kidding me. Impossible, 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 impossible. I remember like it was yesterday. And so this, this like magic is happening and I'm like, oh my God, she really sings like this. Impossible. Impossible. Why are you down there? Because I can't sing as high as you, girl. Do no, that. I, 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 no. whole project is is magical once Whitney and Brandy became involved 
with it, it seemed like we had to change how we were going to present the musical. She's a black woman. It's sassy and like, okay, this is a black show now, honey. <laughs> and there ain't no turning back. You want to know what her problem is? She can't handle how fabulous she was. People were so inspired because it changed people's lives. It changed the way black little girls believed in themselves. I hear to this day, I believe I can be a princess now. That movie is the reason why it's possible. I know it, like, it's timeless. And you can watch Cinderella the Reunion tomorrow night right here on ABC. This is the sound of slow but steady progress. I see the phoenix rising from the ashes. The burned out remains of tree logs taken away. Young seedlings ready to restore the California forest. A welcome sign for this historic gold rush town of Greenville turned to ash by the largest single origin fire in California history. We lost Greenville tonight. In August 2021, the Dixie Fire torched nearly one million acres, burning for months. In Greenville, nearly every building destroyed. This is what's left of Greenville. That used to be a hair salon right there. This is a town that was built more than 160 years ago and burned down in just 30 minutes. But everyone here survived, and a majority of them plan to rebuild. Primo Castle's home, standing for more than 100 years, completely destroyed. When I break, I don't have to think about it. The massive fire requiring an equally large response to rebuild. Primo, just one of 1,100 residents forced to start over. And there's a lot to be done. It's more than taking hammer to nail. There's serious innovation at work. Randy, a third generation logger, part of that support, turning millions of burned down trees into affordable lumber. We're trying to do what we can. Lumber prices are so high and all this natural resource is going to waste. And you know, something had to be done. Due to a lack of sawmills in the state, larger mills have been overloaded for years. Unable to process the millions of trees killed in wildfires and historic drought conditions. Acknowledging the value in the materials, this sawmill was the brainchild of people directly impacted by fire and made possible in part through a grant from the Sierra Nevada Conservancy. It's so important that California retain the characteristics of rural communities. Last year alone, nearly 3 million acres of California forests burned. Homes, communities, generational growth forests wiped off the map. I was here as it was burning. You see those flames are going hundreds of feet into the air and you see the embers that are flying off those flames so those can start new fires some five miles away. It's sad to see it now. It's sad for me as well. I mean, it's, uh, it's devastating the, the amount of destruction that's happened in the last three years. But the trees that survived can't do it alone. If you didn't intervene and replant this area, it would be forever scarred. It would accumulate shrubs, it would accumulate fuel, and then when the next fire came, it would be even larger and more severe. The Forest Service is finding it difficult to keep up with the wildfires. Currently, they're facing a backlog of 1.2 million acres in need of reforestation. Enter the largest seed extractory in the country and the Placerville Nursery. Between July and October, they process thousands of seeds every single day. Those months also coincide with some of the largest fires, leaving national forest geneticists to hike into fire zones and collect cones. It was a little bit stressful, but uh, a feeling of reward, because in a weird way, you're feeling like a hero, you're going there to save a population. Foresters need 7 million seedlings to meet their target of reseeding 30,000 acres a year. That rate, it would take 50 years to catch up with the current backlog. So then will you eventually go plant these? Correct. Where we're standing right now is a success story. It is. So this is the 1992 Cleveland fire. 
This is an example of where the Forest Service has done the site preparation. We've removed the dead trees that were killed by the fire. We planted, we controlled the competing vegetation and got the trees to live and grow. Forester Dana Walsh says they can't even begin forest reconstruction until the ground is cleared. So it's great to see small communities like Greenville taking matters into their own hands. You have to do something with that wood. And if they're able to productively pull together as a community, use that wood and rebuild their community, that is something that we definitely all want to support. And it's already happening. Primo has used wood burned in his community to build his fence, the first step in coming home. I'll just come down here and sit. Just sit. What do you think about? About how my house is going to look. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. Elizabeth Holmes found guilty on four counts of fraud, facing the possibility of decades in prison. Now, we take you inside the courtroom and behind the scenes. The Dropout, Elizabeth Holmes on Trial. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Tonight, primary night in America, and the races are some of the most consequential of the campaign season so far. Our team is standing by as the results come in. In New York, a clash of Democratic titans. For years, they held their own seats, but after Democratic gerrymandering backfired, Representatives Carolyn Maloney and Jerry Nadler are in a battle for their political careers. And at the 11th hour, that race is getting ugly. I think that you should uh, read the editorial in the New York Post today. They call him senile. Have you been disappointed by some of the comments from Congressman Maloney? Yes. I've been very disappointed when she talks about uh, that I'm not really running for the seat or that I'm senile. I mean, it's absurd. I'm surprised at her. In Florida, a Sunshine State showdown. The stage is set for Governor Ron DeSantis and one of the highest profile governor races this fall. And his opponent will be a former Republican governor of Florida, now running as a Democrat. Florida's a beautiful place and we need to bring her back together. We can never, ever surrender to woke ideology. And it could be one of the priciest and most consequential Senate races. Representative Val Demings punching her ticket to the general election, and Democrats hoping that she has what it takes to take down Marco Rubio. And that is why I am running for the United States Senate, and I'm running. 11 weeks to go to the day until the midterm elections, and so much is at stake. ABC News Live's special primary election coverage starts right now. 
Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. It is the last major primary night of this election season, and it features some of the biggest clashes that we've seen so far this year, with implications far beyond the states that are voting. Our team will have you covered every step of the way. Polls are now closed here in New York, where tonight could determine which Democratic committee chair gets to stay in Congress. Redistricting, turning longtime friends, Representatives Carolyn Maloney and Jerry Nadler into somewhat of foes. In Florida, polls closed in hour hour ago, and we now know the Democrat who will ultimately take on Governor Ron DeSantis will be someone who ran the state years ago as a Republican. ABC News now projects moderate representative Charlie Chris will go on to win his race and face off against Governor Ron DeSantis this fall. And in Florida's Democratic Senate primary, ABC News is projecting representative Val Demings will win her race. If Demings wins in November, she would become the second woman to represent Florida in the Senate and the third black woman to be elected into the Senate. And in the Sooner State, we will know very soon just which Republican will be on the ballot this November and likely represent deep red Oklahoma in the U.S. Senate. Uh, we have so much to get to tonight, and we'll start with political director Rick Klein, who's at the big board for us once again. Rick, let's start off in Florida, where the race for governor for November is now set. Break things down for us. Not even close. Charlie Crist, who uh, has run for a lot of offices in Florida, held some of them, uh, lost in some other bids, is going to be the Democratic nominee to take on uh, to take on Ron DeSantis. And what's interesting is that Democrats went with maybe the more proven choice, um, maybe also the, the, the least inspiring choice. He's someone that ran on healing, ran on moderation. In fact, Lindsay, he ran on a hug, the same hug that basically ended his career uh, as a Republican when he offered it to Barack Obama about a decade ago, uh, now was featuring that hug front and center in the kind of politics that he would put forward, almost a Biden-esque style of politics. And what's interesting in part on that is that his congressional district uh, here in the, in the, the Tampa St. Pete air, area is likely to be filled by a Republican, Anna Paulina Luna, endorsed by former President Trump. Uh, she has called herself an antidote to AOC, a much different style of politics being offered up by the Republicans. Uh, Democrats going with uh, more of a proven choice, someone that has actually done the job and gotten votes from Floridians before, although he's also lost some big races. Val Demings projected to win the Democratic nomination for the Senate in Florida as well. What are her chances against incumbent Senator Mark Rubio this, this fall? It's easy to forget how closely divided Florida is because Democrats have had such a rough go in the last couple cycles. But Ron DeSantis won with barely 50 percent of the vote. Donald Trump even did a little bit better, but about 51 percent of the vote. Uh, and keep in mind with Val Demings, you have a different kind of biography uh, than a lot of members of Congress. Uh, she represents the Orlando area where she was uh, the, the former police chief of, of Orlando. So a lot of a lot of Republicans like to throw around defund the police type labels. This is someone that uh, that, that can rebut that pretty easily. Also serving as one of the impeachment managers for Donald Trump. Uh, and, and keep in mind that, uh, that, that she is also someone that was on Joe Biden's shortlist for vice president. So again, some associations with the, the Biden wing of the Democratic Party going up against Marco Rubio, one of the big titans of, uh, of Republican politics between him and DeSantis. Those are very big targets and they are uphill climbs, frankly, for Democrats. And in New York, all eyes tonight on that showdown between incumbents in Manhattan. Just break down how Democrats got into this situation. Quite a pickle. Oh, man, this really was a rough one because they thought they could redistrict their state, get some extra Democrats elected to the House, and the opposite happened when a court threw that out. It means that they had a map that was ordered by uh, by the courts, and it's a map that put a bunch of them in the same congressional district uh, right here in, 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 in Manhattan to have those two members of Congress, uh, both of them elected in 1992, uh, both of them longtime allies, committee chairs. The only one of them is going to be able to survive. Maybe both of them lose, depending on the votes, because there's an outsider candidate as well. And the head of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee are going to be watching to see how he fares. Sean Patrick Maloney, he's got a, a progressive challenger, kind of an AOC-style Democrat running against him. Uh, very, very unlikely, very rare to have someone that powerful in Congress lose in a primary. And the fallout over the Supreme Court's overturning of Roe v. Wade is still in focus now in a special election in New York tonight. Explain the dynamics at play. Yeah, and, and look, a lot of people were looking at the Nikki Freed race in Florida, saying, how is she going to do against against Charlie Crist as someone that's a, long, a longer time as a Democrat than Charlie Crist? It doesn't appear to have made, had much of a difference in terms of turnout. But this is different, because this is a race here uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the Hudson Valley, in the lower Catskills, where you've got a Democrat and Republican running against each other in this special election. It is a swing district. The Democrats would love to keep it in their column, keep their very narrow margin intact going into the fall, and, Lindsay, to send that message 
message. As the Democrat in that race has been saying repeatedly, he says abortion is on the ballot. We have to, we're waiting to see now as votes start to roll in whether voters act that way here in the middle of August. All right, Rick Klein, of course, we're going to be checking in with you throughout the night. Thanks so much. Now let's take a closer look at the state of play here in New York with ABC News Deputy Political Director Avery Harper, who joins us tonight from Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney's campaign. Avery, the longtime incumbent Carolyn Maloney facing a difficult challenge against fellow incumbent Congressman Jerry Nadler. What's the sense of things from the Maloney campaign tonight? Right, well, they are hoping for victory. You're starting to see folks come into this room here. Uh, the congresswoman is actually not even here yet because she was campaigning until polls closed just a few minutes ago uh, before she's going to make her way here. I think that really demonstrates just how uh, things are in this race. It's really anybody's game, and uh, the congresswoman's team says that she really wanted to be out with the people today. She spent much of her day uh, canvassing out uh, in the community, in the district, and that's because she is up against... Uh, another incumbent, a fellow House member, uh, somebody that she served alongside uh, for the past three decades. Uh, we know that the momentum right now is behind Congressman Nadler, uh, but she has been honing in on the fact that she is a woman. Uh, she's been homing, honing in on uh, her fight for reproductive rights, and she's hoping that that takes her over the finish line. I, I spoke to folks who are here in the room tonight, and uh, many of them echoing that fact that uh, because reproductive rights are at stake, uh, that they want to see a woman woman sent to Congress in that seat, uh, each of them saying that, you know, if uh, Congresswoman Maloney does not come out victorious today, that they believe that she will still be active around women's rights. But we will see what happens as those votes start to come in. And you talked about the momentum, Avery. Want to take a look now. We do have some results. Uh, Nadler leading with 56 percent of the vote. Uh, Carolyn Maloney trailing with 27 percent of the vote. That's with 66 percent of the expected votes reporting at this point. So clearly she saw the need of why she needed to be out there trying to uh, be with voters up until the last minute. You also caught up with Congressman Nadler today and got a chance to ask him about questions that he and Maloney faced on calls for new leaders in Washington. How did he respond? Right. There is a third candidate in this race, Serge Patel, who has uh, made the argument that there is a need for new energy, new ideas, uh, generational change in Congress. And uh, I asked Congressman Nadler about that today, and here's what he had to say. And, and right, what would you, you say to folks who are calling on, uh, calling for a new generation of leadership in this seat? There is a new generation of leadership. There's constantly turnover in Congress. Um, number one. Number two, Congress works by seniority. With seniority, you build up clout. Um, and clout means you can get more done legislatively, and it means you can bring more resources, more pork, so to speak, back, back to the district. I think from New York's point of view, it's very unfortunate that we're going to lose one committee chairman. To lose two would be catastrophic. There you hear the congressman noting the fact that both he and Congresswoman Maloney are uh, chairs to prominent House committees. Both have been key to investigating former President Trump, and uh, we know that one of them will be out of a job after tonight. And you've also been watching a race for New York's 10th congressional district where a moderate former federal prosecutor is facing off against progressives. Break down that race for us. Right. Dan Goldman, that former uh, federal prosecutor who uh, had a hand in investigating former President Trump during the first impeachment, uh, he is the candidate who is considered the front runner. He is the person who has uh, the endorsement of the New York Times. Uh, he is a more moderate candidate. He is a self-funded candidate, has poured millions of his own uh, money into this race. Uh, but there are uh, many progressive choices. There are about a dozen candidates in this race, and the progressives have kind of banded together in order to push back on his candidacy, uh, including uh, Congressman Mondaire Jones, who moved to Brooklyn to run in this open seat. Uh, and uh, the fact is that uh, despite that banding together of those progressives, it might not be enough uh, for any of those progressives to come out on top or to defeat the coalition that Goldman is building uh, in the district. And you see a pretty close race there. Dan Goldman with 27 percent of the vote so far. Uh, but again, just 51 percent of expected vote reporting right now. And, and before you go, Avery, uh, we've also seen some tensions within the Democratic Party between the progressive wing and the chair of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, Congressman Sean Patrick Maloney. Explain the dynamics there and how it's impacted the races being contested tonight. 
Right. Sean Patrick Maloney is running in a race in an area that is, uh, for the most part, represented by uh, currently uh, the, the Congressman Mondaire Jones. And uh, there are a lot of feelings within the Democratic Party that he's sort of big-footed Jones in that uh, area. And so now he is running against uh, an AOC-backed challenger, a state senator named Alessandra Bianchi. She is a uh, AOC-style progressive, as uh, Rick mentioned earlier. Uh, and uh, listen, we will see what happens. It could be very embarrassing if a, uh, you know, a prominent Democrat like Maloney loses uh, to a progressive challenger in this way. He is the chair of the House Democrats campaign arm, and so this could be uh, an interesting one to watch. All right, ABC News Deputy Political Director Avery Harper, thank you. We'll be checking back in with you as well. We shift now to Florida to where our Victor Akendo is with the DeSantis campaign. Victor, while DeSantis is running unopposed, ABC News projects that he'll be facing Charlie Crist in the fall. But before we talk about that race, another Republican there in Florida also ran unopposed, Senator Marco Rubio. How are things shaking out with who his opponent will be this fall? And Lindsay, that was another Republican who we heard from tonight, Senator Marco Rubio taking the stage not too long ago. He'll be going up against Val Demings, the former chief of police in Orlando. She's been touting her record as the chief of police while slamming Marco Rubio's attendance record. You could see all of her ads. They were running nonstop, but probably continuously here in the Sunshine State. Well, tonight, Marco Rubio fired back in front of this friendly crowd. He said, remember, she's the former chief of police, that Val Demings wanted to defund the police. That was his claim. He also says that she's just votes with Nancy Pelosi. This will be an interesting one to watch, Lindsay. Sure will. And Victor, when it comes to the governor's race and your conversations with voters, did you get the sense that they were excited about Chris, or did they go into it thinking about who had the best chance of defeating DeSantis? I think it's a combination of both. It really depends on who you ask. Look, Chris has been involved in Florida politics now for three decades. He was once the Republican governor. He's been an independent, and now he is the Democratic nominee for governor. Um, come November, it is going to be an uphill battle for Charlie Crist. Governor DeSantis is very popular in this state. He has a lot of momentum going for him right now. He's got a firm grip on Florida. Here's what we heard uh, from voters today who voted for Charlie Crist. I think it's just because of, you know, people knowing already who he is. Although he's flip-flopped, he was a Republican, then he was a Democrat. But somebody that we know and we can kind of stand behind. So Chris is definitely the household name here. And between him and his opponent today, the agricultural commissioner, Nikki Freed, who's more progressive, Chris was the more moderate. And it looks like that's who Florida voters back today. Lindsay? All right, Victor Kendo, our thanks to you. We'll be checking in with you as well. Let's check in on Oklahoma Republican Senate runoff. ABC News is projecting Representative Mark Wayne Mullen will win his race against former Oklahoma Speaker of the House T.W. Shannon. Mullen, who was endorsed by Trump, won a large share of the vote in June but did not pass the 50 percent hurdle. Now he'll go on to face Democrat Kendra Horn in November. Both Mullen and Shannon have the potential to become the first indigenous people to serve in the Senate since 2005. Now I want to welcome in Chris Christie, former Republican governor of New Jersey and an ABC News contributor. Governor, always good to have you on the show. We're now 11 weeks out from the midterms. Which race in particular do you find most intriguing tonight? Well, look, I think the setup in Florida is, is interesting. Um, it's a good year for Republicans in terms of environment. Uh, Marco Rubio in the Senate race is someone very well known. Um, but we'll have a serious challenge in Val Demings. Uh, given her law enforcement background. Uh, and in the governor's race, the Democrats have chosen the best known person uh, in picking Charlie Crist. Believe me, I've, Charlie Crist has been around a long time um, and is well known. Uh, I think he's got a very uphill race against Governor DeSantis, um, but he is certainly the best known candidate the Democrats could have put up against Ron DeSantis, and so we'll see how the next 11 weeks now plays out. You said he's been around a long time. He was, of course, a Republican governor in Florida when you were elected in New Jersey. Uh, now he'll be the Democrat trying to unseat an opponent in Governor DeSantis, who has emerged as a, a Republican star and potential 2024 frontrunner. You know Florida well. How do you see that race playing out? 
Well, you know, Charlie Crist is the answer to the old joke, you know, a Republican, a Democrat, and an independent walk into a bar, and they're all Charlie Crist. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think the problem is for, for, for Charlie Crist is that he is known well. It's both an advantage and a disadvantage. Uh, the advantage is that there's no name ID problem with Charlie Crist, and, and I would assume close to 100 percent of the voters uh, who will vote in November know Charlie Crist. Uh, the bad side is that Charlie Chris has been all over the ideological map, looks like an opportunist and somebody who just goes whichever way the wind blows. Um, you could say a lot about Ron DeSantis, um, but he's pretty, you know, solid in where he uh, where his views are and what he's done as uh, governor of Florida. And so uh, the fact is that that's going to be a very interesting race against someone who's seen as really someone who's been all over the map and is everything to everybody versus someone who is trying to be one thing to a specific constituency in Florida in Ron DeSantis. DeSantis is clearly the favorite. He'll have, uh, you know, a ton more money than Charlie Crist will. And the big question is going to be, will the Democratic Governors Association come in and support Charlie Crist financially in a big way? If they do, it could make the race more interesting. If they don't, I think everyone will expect Ron DeSantis um, to win in a blowout, and the expectations will be very, very high for his performance on election day. I want to switch gears now. Uh, there's new reporting tonight about the scope of the classified documents former President Trump had in his possession when he left the White House and how the Justice Department actually got involved. Earlier this month, you called the FBI search of Mar-a-Lago, quote, fair game. What's your reaction to today's developments? Well, look, I, you know, that's why, Lindsay, when you see these developments, you know, that have been coming out in the last 24 hours, why I tried to be very cautious in my remarks, unlike some other folks who commented on it. You know, I, I was a U.S. attorney for seven years, dealt with highly classified information. Remember, I was U.S. attorney in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, and so we were dealing with highly classified materials on foreign terrorist threats on a regular basis, especially in a state like mine, where one of the 9-11 attacks originated. And so, uh, look, I think that the nature of what these documents are um, tell you in part why the Justice Department felt so strongly about going and getting them. Um, these are not things that can just be lying around um, to show people on the veranda at, uh, at Mar-a-Lago. And what we're also finding out is that there appears to have been a number of efforts by the National Archives and the Department of Justice, well short of a, uh, of a search warrant, uh, to try to get these documents back. And for whatever reason, Donald Trump decided not to return them. Uh, so those are things that he's going to have to answer for now as to why he didn't return them, what he was doing with them in the first place. Uh, fact is, once you leave the White House, you're no longer president. No matter your protestations to the contrary, you're not the president anymore. And you're not entitled um, to have this stuff in your possession. And so let's see how it continues to play out. I'm not ready to say that the search warrant was the absolute necessary thing to do. But what I'm also saying is that those who attacked it from the beginning as being baseless or a political witch hunt, I think now are starting to see uh, that there are some materials there that are very, very important to our country's future, uh, to our intelligence effort, and that we just can't allow those to be hanging out uh, in the basement or at Mar-a-Lago or in Donald Trump's bedroom. And as you mentioned, you're a former federal prosecutor. Based on that, curious to get your perspective here. Since the FBI sees those documents, there's been an increase, as you know, in threats against FBI agents and other law enforcement. How dangerous are those types of threats, and what responsibility do you think that politicians have from both parties to try and stop them? Well, look, I, I think that we should be being very clear about this. The FBI did not initiate this raid. The raid was initiated by the Attorney General of the United States and by a federal judge who signed off on it, saying that there was probable cause that evidence of a crime existed at that site. The FBI agents merely execute what's given to them by those people empowered to make those decisions uh, in our justice system, the prosecutors and the federal judge in Florida. And so to be taking off after the FBI for doing what is their job, when they're given a search warrant by a prosecutor, duly executed by a judge, it's their job to go in and collect those materials and bring them back to the government for the government's review. So I think these attacks on the FBI are wrong. Um, if you want to attack anybody, if you attack the attorney general if you want, in terms of whether or not his decision was right or wrong, that can be debated and I'm sure will be debated much over the course of the next number of months. 
But this attack on law enforcement is bad. And quite frankly, as Republicans, I think we have to be supporting law enforcement. Now, you know, we're against the defund the police movement. We were very loud about that. And now I hear some Republicans talking about defund the FBI. That's just as wrong as defund the police. We do not need to be defunding the people who are on the front lines of protecting our country against terrorism from around the world and terrorism inside our country um, and who are working hard every day to stop the scourge of drugs that are trying to come into this country and killing over 100,000 of our citizens in the last year. I am for supporting the FBI and all law enforcement in doing what they do. When they break the rules, Lindsay, they should be held responsible. But we should not be having irresponsible talk about defunding the FBI. And lastly, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell made headlines last week when he said that there's a greater likelihood Republicans flip the House than the Senate, citing what he called a, a, a quote, candidate quality. Several Trump-backed candidates, including J.D. Vance in Ohio, Mehmet Oz in Pennsylvania, and Herschel Walker in Georgia, have really been kind of struggling to gain some traction. Bottom line, do you think that the former president backed flawed candidates? Look, what I think is that it's always going to be harder to flip the Senate than it was to flip the House. As you know, Lindsay, from being on the Sunday morning programs, I've been saying all along that that was much tougher for the Republicans because of the map this year and the kind of candidates that we're nominating as well. Um, and so we're going to see what happens. I think it's much, much too early to judge. I think that Senator McConnell is sounding a warning signal, trying to wake up the campaigns of those candidates who I think are underperforming right now to get them to perform. But the, the fact of the matter is, Senator McConnell and, and his fund are supporting those candidates with large, large contributions uh, for television ads and other support. Uh, he's doing everything he can to try to become the majority leader again. Uh, but in the end, as I've said all along, the most important thing in any particular race um, is the candidate. And the candidates will either win or lose this race. Um, not Mitch McConnell, but the candidates on the ground in each one of these states. I think it's going to be a very competitive Senate uh, set of Senate races. We might take the majority. We might lose the majority. Either way, um, Lindsay, it's going to be by a couple of votes one way or the other. What I'm much more certain of is that we will be uh, taking over the majority in the House uh, come January of next year. Governor Chris Christie, always a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me, Lindsay. Good talking to you. Joining us now are our contributors, former Democratic Senator from North Dakota, Heidi Heitkamp, and former Republican Congresswoman from Virginia, Barbara Comstock. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, Barbara, let's start with you. Charlie Chris certainly has an interesting journey in Florida, serving as a governor, as a Republican governor, then becoming independent, now running as a Democrat. Uh, what does this transformation uh, say about today's Republican Party? Well, uh, I mean, I, I, I think... He, he left the party before really Trump came in and another thing. So, you know, he has his own problems to answer for, as Governor Christie pointed out. He's been kind of all over the board, too. But I, so, but I think it, it's going to come down to, um, you know, how uh, you know, certainly it's seen that uh, Governor DeSantis is certainly stronger here, but he's certainly running for president. Certainly, if you're Governor Christ, you might point out, hey, I'm going to stick around for all four years. This guy that I'm running against is already running for president. So that might be a powerful argument. And also point out that he's been out campaigning with some pretty extreme candidates, election deniers, uh, people who have had problems with anti-Semitism and, and other issues. So. You know, each of them has a lot to work with to um, go after their um, opponents. So it should be an interesting race. Heidi, also in Florida, Republican Senator Marco Rubio faces a strong challenge from Congresswoman Val Demings. What are the implications of that race? Well, I think they're huge. They're also huge for the governor's race. We've seen a, a reduction in split ticket voting, which means people go and they vote for one party or the other. Are they going to go and vote for Be Val Demings and then DeSantis? Probably not. Um, and so if Val can energize the base, if she can uh, move uh, uh, Floridians to uh, support her based on her record, I think that um, that's good for Charlie Crist. If Charlie Crist brings some more moderate Republicans to the table, that's good for Val. And so I think what's going to be interesting um, is the conversation you just had with Governor Christie. When you talk about you know who took those records and what is in those records, 
Marco Rubio is in kind of a tough spot. He's the vice chair of the Intel Committee. He signed a letter um, basically saying to the Department of Justice, we want to know what you seize. We want to know what the danger is. If, in fact, these records are what we have been, uh, what's been reported, very highly classified records, what does Rubio do? What does Senator Rubio do? Does he condemn it? Does he stand with Trump? If he doesn't stand with Trump, what's the implications for him in Florida? And so, you know, I, I agree with Chris. Everything is about the last uh, month of the campaign. We'll see what spins out of this. But Marco is in a tough spot because he may, in fact, have to step up as somebody who is a leader in the intel community and say this was wrong if he says that. What does that mean um, for his chances in Florida against a very, very good candidate, Val Demings, who has great law enforcement background. She's uh, she's feisty. And I think it's going to be a very, very interesting Senate race. I'm just marking down this date, August 23rd. Heidi Heitkamp agrees with Chris Christie. And <laughs> that, I'm sure, is, is a first. Barbara, uh, Governor DeSantis isn't on the ballot today. But as you said, we've seen him hit the campaign trail with Republicans in other states. He's rumored, of course, to be considering a run for president in 2024. What do you make of the way that he's introducing himself on a national stage? Well, I, I think, you know, his real challenge is going to be not to irritate the big guy, uh, Donald Trump, who still expects everyone to come and ask permission from him. And uh, clearly, Ron DeSantis has not done that. So you've already heard grumblings from Mar-a-Lago, from Trump himself reportedly, but also Trump Jr. has kind of been openly kind of disparaging him, some, Ron DeSantis some. So I think you might see a little infighting here sooner rather than later, particularly when Donald Trump goes uh, to his rally in, in Pennsylvania. I'm sure you're going to hear Donald Trump announce how his rally is bigger and better and more people came to it. And, you know, mm -hmm. who's, who's bigger and better here is, is you know, what you're usually going to hear from Donald Trump. <laughs> uh, Heidi, uh, Florida has, of course, become more red in recent years. Do you think that someone like Charlie Chris has a shot there or that Marco Rubio could perhaps lose his seat? I think I think Val Demings is the real story here. I mean, she's a, I, I know Val. We sat together at a peace officer memorial. People don't talk about this, but her husband was a sheriff at the time, um, escorting a family who lost a loved one um, uh, as a law enforcement agent. She understands this. She's a daughter of a of uh, school teachers. She she didn't she wasn't born with a silver spoon in her mouth. And quite honestly, Marco hasn't shown the kind of enthusiasm for politics. If you think about it, he was going to quit and then he came back to run again. And I think she's basically hitting the right notes, which is he doesn't show up for Florida. She will show up for Florida. She's a very dynamic campaigner. She's been out on her Harley um, traveling around to rural parts of the state. And I think she will generate a lot of enthusiasm. Whether that's enough in Florida remains to be seen. But I wouldn't count her out, especially after the Dobbs decision, um, because I think we're seeing this in places like Kansas. We're seeing it in places like Ohio. More women are registering to vote. And she's a very, very attractive candidate, a smart pick for the uh, Democratic Party in Florida to pick Val. Barbara Comstag, Heidi Heidkamp, we thank you both so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Much more primary coverage coming up as we are standing by to talk live with lawmaker Richie Torres from New York. Stay with us. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon.
12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Welcome back, everyone. Breaking news in now. We have a projected here at ABC News. New York House District 12 is going to Jerry Nadler with 56% of the vote. Uh, this is two, obviously, longtime committee chairs. This uh, race pitted them against each other. Carolyn Maloney ultimately falling uh, to Jerry Nadler. Carolyn just getting 25% of the vote there. Checking in now on New York's 17th Congressional District Representative Sean Maloney heads the Democrats' House campaign efforts, but now he's in a fight to keep the seat himself. You see him there, though, 77% of the vote, but 4% uh, of expected vote reporting only right now. So still very early in the night in that race. We'll continue taking a look there. Now in New York's 10th congressional district, this used to be Jerry Nadler's seat, but his home is, is now in New York's 12th district. So we're following this free for all open seat tonight. Dan Goldman served as counsel for House Democrats during the first Trump impeachment trial in 2019. He received a likely backhanded endorsement from President Trump last week. And we are also tracking what could be a bellwether spe special election as we get closer to the midterms. Democrat Pat Ryan has made abortion rights a central theme of his campaign. Republican Mark Molinaro has tried to focus more on inflation. Joining us now is Congressman Richie Torres, who represents parts of the Bronx in Congress. Congressman Torres, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Always a pleasure to be here. So as you know, redistricting has really thrown Democratic politics yeah. into disarray in New York. It's reshaped your district as well. You ran unopposed during this primary, but how have you had to adjust your own campaign and, and the issues on which you're focused? So we have the most dysfunctional redistricting process in the country. Um, 30 to 40 percent of my district is new. Uh, so even though I had no primary opponent, I had to travel throughout the district as if I were campaigning actively and familiarize myself with the new neighborhoods and the new districts. And, and but I'm proud that you know, I get to celebrate the achievements of the Democratic Party, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which caps the price of insulin at $35 a month for senior citizens on Medicare, uh, which preserves health care for 13 million people, uh, 13 million Americans, uh, which empowers the federal government to negotiate more affordable drug prices for senior citizens on Medicare, and which cuts greenhouse gas emissions by 40% by 2030. Uh, so I've, I've enjoyed the experience of communicating those achievements to uh, the residents of the Bronx. Uh, you're just 34 years old, the fourth youngest member of the House. You recently referred to yourself yeah. as a, quote, infant in Congress. So what did you mean by that? Well, look, 
there's a sense in which Congress is a geriatric institution. Right? <laughs> the, the three leading Democrats are above the age of 80. All but a few of the committee chairs are at or above the age of 70. So it's highly unusual to have a millennial in the ranks of Congress. Uh, and I found out that um, uh, a candidate by the name of Maxwell Frost in Florida is set to be the first Gen Z member of Congress at age 25. So uh, a new generation of leadership slowly but surely is beginning to emerge. Uh, what do you think when you see two longtime members of Congress in their 70s, speaking of age there, Representatives Jerry Nadler and Carolyn Maloney, competing against each other right here in New York? Look, it, it was a tragedy because both of them were committee chairs. Both of them had a wealth of seniority and were assets to the New York congressional delegation. Uh, and it was an unfortunate situation that was brought upon us uh, by the special master. Uh, but ultimately, in districts like New York 10 or New York 12, uh, the New York Times endorsement is so powerful as to be decisive. And it, it appears to be the case that the endorsed candidates of, of the New York Times will win both New York 10 and New York 12. Today's elections have highlighted a lot of ideological differences as well. You're a member of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. How do Democratic candidates espouse progressive ideas while still convincing voters that they can win general elections? Look, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that we are well positioned in the general election. I mean, uh, you know, according to the latest polling from Politico, Democrats are leading Republicans by four points on the generic congressional ballot. And if you look at key Senate races in Pennsylvania, Nevada, Ohio, Arizona, Georgia, there's a consistent pattern of Democrats leading Republicans, often by double digits. So I am cautiously optimistic that we will do much better on, in the midterms than the pundits predict that we will. If Democrats fail to retain control of the House this fall, how do you think that President Biden and other Democratic leaders will need to really retool their strategy heading into 2024? Look, it will be challenging if, if the Democrats lose control of either the Senate or the House or, or both, and the president will have to rely more heavily uh, on executive orders. But I'm confident that we have a fighting chance of retaining control of the House. Uh, and despite what happens in the midterms, you know, President Biden has had the most productive presidency in recent memory. You know, from the American Rescue Plan to the bipartisan infrastructure investment to the bipartisan gun safety compromise to the bipartisan semiconductor research and development bill to the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, he has had more landmark achievements than any president in recent memory. And, you know, when I first entered this, the, the United States Congress, I said that we have the makings of an FDR moment. And President Biden has made that FDR moment a reality. Congressman Torres, we thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you coming on the show. Always a pleasure. Let's go back now to Avery Harper, who's at Carolyn Maloney headquarters. Uh, we can imagine uh, quite a night of, of disappointment there, really just kind of starting to sit in, sink in. Right, when we were here as they read that projection uh, out loud here, you could hear a collective sigh in the room, the disappointment from uh, supporters who came here uh, in hopes of celebrating a victory for uh, Congressman Maloney. We know that that is now not the case. ABC can project that uh, Jerry Nadler, Congressman Jerry Nadler, uh, will win the primary in the 12th district. Uh, we are still waiting for uh, Congresswoman Maloney to uh, appear here at this party. She he was campaigning until just about 40 minutes ago when uh, those polls closed here in New York. Uh, but uh, look, uh, we all knew this was going to be an uphill battle for her. Uh, the momentum was really behind Jerry Nadler, who uh, not only got the endorsement of the New York Times, but also that of uh, Senator Chuck Schumer, of Senator Elizabeth Warren, of the Working Families Party. Uh, he really had uh, a coalition behind him of uh, progressives uh, in this district uh, that wanted to see him head back to Washington. Uh, but earlier today when I spoke with, with Jerry Nadler, he uh, called it unfortunate uh, that the Democratic Party was going to lose one of its committee chairs, uh, and now we know it's not him. All right, ABC News Deputy Political Director Avery Harper, we thank you so much once again. And joining us now is Yvette Simpson, the CEO of Democracy for America. Yvette, always great to have you on the show. As we heard from Congressman Torres just a moment ago, Democrats are facing major generational tensions. How do you think that the party will navigate that challenge? 
You know, I hope that we'll look at it as an opportunity to make a shift. You get, you know, Maxwell Frost down in Florida, which um, Representative Torres was talking about, who is one of our candidates, and we're excited. He's one of the first and will probably be the first Generation Z member of Congress. Uh, and then you have Jerry Nadler. You know, you have this, this wide range of, uh, of folks, but it's time for a new generation. There was some polling that was just released not long ago that showed that 52 percent of Generation Zers don't identify with either the Democratic or the Republican Party. That number is almost the same for millennials. It's a great opportunity, I think, for Democrats to capture the spirit of young people by seeing them represented in leadership. And so if we can do that now, when you think about how big the millennial generation is and how big this next generation behind them is going to be, they need to see themselves reflected in leadership if we want them engaging in the electoral process. So it's a great opportunity for us to turn the page. Unfortunately, we're doing it way too slow. One race that we've been watching in particular is taking place just north of New York City, where Sean Patrick Maloney, the head of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, is fending off a progressive challenger. Uh, what are your takeaways from the way that election has played out? You know, it was messy. It started with a lot of overreach in the in the redistricting process, as you said earlier. Uh, folks trying to get more seats, New York, that New York group trying to get more seats than we we needed, uh, and so we ended up stuck with maybe getting three seats if we're lucky. Um, and I think with Sean Maloney being the head of DCCC, uh, he should have taken the new district, um, and instead he decided to go the safe route. Uh, and forced Mondaire Jones into a ridiculous position where he would either have to challenge Jamal Bowman, another African-American and progressive, or run for this new district. Uh, I believe if Sean Maloney had taken the new district, we could have had two incumbents come out of this race clean, and Jamal Bowman would have also been successful. But now we might be in a situation where we lose Mondaire Jones, and we don't know what's going to hap happen with Sean Maloney. So it was a really challenging set of circumstances. A lot of people on both sides of the aisle appealed to Sean Maloney not to do this because the new district would have been more favorable for him. And with Mondaire Jones representing 75% of Sean Maloney's new district, it would have made more sense to allow him to stay there. So a lot of messiness in New York around this redistricting that is going to cost us one, two, three, four, maybe, incumbents in New York, which was the opposite of what I think they intended to happen. Since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, abortion, of course, has taken center stage in races across the country. In upstate New York, the Democratic candidate in a special election for Congress has made abortion rights a central theme of his campaign. Do you think that will motivate voters as much as economic, economic factors like inflation? I think that's right. I think the tide is turning on inflation being a major issue for folks. We saw a poll not long ago that said the threat to democracy is actually more of a concern than cost of living for people right now. So that's a whole nother idea uh, that we need to be pushing as we go into the, the election against Republicans. But certainly uh, this choice issue has been motivating not just for Democrats, but independents uh, and uh, Republicans, particularly women and those who support women's choice. So I think it's the most galvanizing issue. I know that Biden wants to do a victory lap around the IRA, but unfortunately, those, those provisions are way too far off and way too obtuse, unfortunately, for people to be able to wrap their heads around right now. I think the better issue is this very present issue of choice, particularly when we think about the very extreme proposals that we're already starting to see in states across the country, especially in Republican-run states. In Florida, you have four Democrats vying to take on Republican Governor Ron DeSantis, who is rumored to have presidential ambitions. And it looks like Representative Val Demings may face off against Marco Rubio for his Senate seat. Do Democrats have a realistic chance of winning there this fall? You know, I think it's difficult. We haven't won the Florida governor's race, I think, since 1994. Uh, we got really close in this last election. But I think part of the reason why we got closer in 2018 was because you had a progressive in Andrew Gillum and then you had a moderate in Bill Nelson running uh, for Senate and for governor. I think Nikki Freed is more of a progressive. I think with Charlie Chris kind of being the known commodity, we're going to probably end up with a Virginia-like situation with, like we ended up with Terry McAuliffe not being able to beat the more Trumpy candidate. So we'll see if Charlie Chris can inspire enough Democrats to come out. Val Demings can't carry that alone in a big state like Florida. We might end up winning Val Demings' seat and maybe losing, um, losing the governor's race. We do have an amazing progressive running for AG uh, who looks like she's going to make it out, uh, Aramis Ayala, who has pledged to make sure that she gives DeSantis the 
business, if you will, on all these issues around Don't Say Gay, around banning books, and of course around uh, choice. So we could get a win in the AG seat. She's a progressive. Uh, and maybe with the three of them on the ticket, we might be able to galvanize enough people in Florida to maybe pick two of the three of those seats. President Biden is hitting the trail in Maryland later this week, but across the country we've seen Democratic candidates really reluctant to campaign with him. How are they adjusting their messaging while the president remains so unpopular? You know, most people are focusing on the issues and where people are. I do think you're right. I think talking about Biden at this time with a 39 percent approval rating that has kind of been stuck at that level for a long time, I think are trying to figure out how to win in spite of him, which is not exactly what you want going into a midterm election with a big presidential coming up behind it. Again, folks are talking about the issues, the galvanizing issue around choice and making sure that we're talking about what's possible if we can gain more seats in the Senate and what will absolutely happen if Republicans gain the House or gain the Senate. We know that the uh, often what we counsel candidates to do is to talk about what we've done when we're in power and we're asking people instead to talk about and consider the alternative because unfortunately Biden isn't carrying the day uh, as he should in a midterm election like this one. Yvette Simpson, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Lindsay. As we continue to get results in here on ABC News Live, much more coverage straight ahead. Stay with us. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis, the powerful series, streaming free on ABC News Live. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Welcome back, everyone. As they have in other Republican races this season, many election deniers are running in today's Republican primaries in Florida and New York, drawing attention to the wider issue of Republican election deniers running in and winning primaries ahead of the midterms. Here's a look at election deniers by the numbers. 171, that's the number, according to ABC News' 538, of Republican nominees nationwide were full-blown election deniers. They're running for U.S. Senate and House seats, as well as state races across the country. That comes out 
to a total of 37% of all Republican nominees running right now who embrace Trump's lies about the 2020 election. An additional 54 nominees, or 12%, have expressed doubts about the 2020 election, despite the evidence that there was no widespread fraud. Meaning, 49%, basically half of all Republican nominees, either deny or cast doubt on Joe Biden's election in 2020. Republican nominees for the House of Representatives are the most likely to deny the 2020 results. 42% of all Republican House nominees deny the election. That's 145 out of 349 nominees. And while lower in number, election deniers are also running in state races for Secretary of State. In fact, some 22%, more than one fifth of Republican nominees for those offices deny President Biden won the election. And many of those are running in swing states where the 2024 election could be decided. And we still have a lot more election coverage ahead on ABC News Live. Stay with us. But first, to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Now to new details about the extent of classified materials that President Trump took with him when he left office. Our senior national correspondent Terry Moran reports. Tonight, a newly released letter from the National Archives reveals the scope and the magnitude of the trove of classified material Donald Trump took with him to Mar-a-Lago when he left the White House. Over 100 documents with classification markings comprising more than 700 pages. Some include the highest levels of classification, including Special Access Programs, SAP materials. That security designation is reserved for the most sensitive secrets in the government. It restricts access to the smallest number of individuals possible, only those with a need to know. The letter from the archives was released by a representative of Trump himself. This past January, the Trump team handed over 15 boxes of documents to the archives. The New York Times reports they included documents from the CIA, the National Security Agency, and the FBI. According to the paper, Mr. Trump went through the boxes himself before turning them over. But even after that, Trump still had not returned everything sought by the government. Months later in June, more documents were given back. And then, in that search on August 8th, the FBI seized 11 more sets of classified materials. Our thanks to Terry Moran. For more analysis now, we're joined by 538's Galen Druk. Galen, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Uh, former President Trump, as you know, now facing multiple investigations, which have really dominated political headlines as of late. What's the latest polling showing as far as how voters are reacting to all this and how it could potentially impact the midterms this fall? Absolutely. A recent poll from Politico Morning Consult shows that 
49% of Americans approve of the FBI search of Mar-a-Lago, while 37% of Americans disapprove. Now, that reflects similar numbers that we see in terms of how Americans are viewing some of the other investigations of President Trump, former President Trump, or investigations that may touch him. That also happens to be pretty similar to what his approval rating was for much of his presidency, about 50% of Americans disapproving, around 40% approving. We also see, though, that when it comes to broadly how Americans feel about whether or not Trump has been on the right side of the law, in that poll as well, we see that 58% of Americans say that Trump probably or definitely broke the law while he was president. That's a clear majority. So even if that means that independents, maybe some Republicans, in this poll in particular, a quarter of Republicans even said that Trump probably or definitely broke the law while in office. So there's a general sense here that he's not always on the right side of the law. And we heard earlier from Avery Harbor on some of the key New York races. You've been also watching New York's 19th Congressional District special election tonight. Break down that race for us and how the impact of the abortion issue is playing out there tonight. New York's 19th congressional district is about as swingy as they get. Biden won by only a point and a half in 2020. He voted for Trump before that, and it voted for Obama twice. So this is a great testing ground for how the messages that Democrats and Republicans want to run on in the fall will do in a competitive race. And we have seen that the Democrat there, Pat Ryan, has run pretty heavily on abortion as an issue. Mark Molinaro, the Republican, has tried to avoid the issue. We're gonna find out tonight, based on the margin there, how that's going over. But regardless, we've already seen in polling that abortion has become a more salient issue for Americans. In a Pew poll out just today, we saw that in March, 40-some percent of Democrats said that abortion was a major issue for them when it comes to voting this fall. Now it's about 70 percent. At 538's Galen Drew, we thank you so much for your insight. Appreciate you coming on the show. Absolutely. And before we go tonight, our image of the day on this primary night, Florida voters making their voices heard. It was Thomas Jefferson who once said, we do not have government by the majority. We have government by the majority who participate. That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. We, of course, have much more primary coverage coming up at the top of the hour. Thanks so much for streaming with us. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. Elizabeth Holmes found guilty on four counts of fraud, facing the possibility of decades in prison. Now, we take you inside the courtroom and behind the scenes. The Dropout, Elizabeth Holmes on Trial. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. 
Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. It is the last major primary night of this election season, and it features some of the biggest clashes that we've seen so far this year, with implications far beyond the states that are voting tonight. Our team will have you covered every step of the way in Florida. We now know that Governor Ron DeSantis will face Democratic Congressman Charlie Crist in his re-election race. Crist, of course, once served as governor of the Sunshine State as a Republican. And Republican Senator Marco Rubio will face a test from Representative Val Demings, the former police chief in Orlando. And polls show she might be within striking distance. Here in New York, a primary face-off between two of the most powerful House Democrats as a result of redistricting, with House Judiciary Chair projected to beat House Oversight Chair Carolyn Maloney in the 12th District. ABC News political director Rick Klein joins us once again at the big board. Rick, let's start back in Florida, where the race for governor for November is now set. Yeah, Charlie Chris, the big winner tonight, take, uh, now, now the nominee on the Democratic side to take on uh, Governor Ron DeSantis, one of the leading uh, conservative firebrands, a leading light in the Republican Party, now seen as someone that could run in 2024. First, he's got to get through 2022. And this was a resounding victory by Charlie Crist. In his, in his victory speech just a few moments ago, uh, we, we heard him talk about healing Florida. We heard him talk about being the governor for all Floridians. And, he, of course, he was the governor once before for all Floridians, only as a Republican, telling that, re that Democrats would go with someone who is a former Republican over now the, the, the current Democratic secretary... Or, Secretary of Agriculture in the state, Nikki Freed, uh, they decided to go with someone that was tried and true, tested before. Look how close that race was just a couple years ago. Democrats still hoping they can get it back in contention, even though uh, the state has been slipping away from them in the last couple election cycles. And all eyes, of course, here in New York do want to report we do just have in the New York's uh, Congressional District 17, Democratic House primary, ABC News reports incumbent Sean Patrick Maloney is projected to win. But I do want to go back to that showdown between the two incumbents in Manhattan where Congressman Jerry Nadler has come out on top. But just break down how Democrats got into this situation where incumbents were facing off against each other. Yeah, not a lot of Democrats happy about this, even if they were Nadler supporters. They aren't happy uh, about having to, to go up against one of their own, someone that was elected the same year in Congress as Jerry Nadler uh, and Carolyn Maloney. Both of them came to Congress in 1992, longtime allies from adjoining districts. But because a court said that the Democrats went too far in trying to gerrymander the state, they were forced into the same district there, the Upper East Side and the Upper West Side, uh, facing off in an uh, intra-city showdown. And, and in the end, Jerry Nadler winning by quite a lot. But they had to sacrifice one of their own members, not the only member of Congress who is endangered in races today. But as you mentioned, Sean Patrick Maloney, the head of the DCCC, the, 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 the Democrats campaign arm, uh, was able to prevail in his primary against a more progressive challenger. But it was a mess and a messy situation uh, that, that Democrats uh, were sorting through today in New York City. What did you say before? A perfect storm of a mess or, or something like that, which seemed to, yes. <laughs> yes, to seem to adequately really kind of capture what, what happened there. The fallout over the Supreme Court's overturning of Roe v. Wade is in focus in a special election in New York tonight. Explain the dynamics there and, and what we're seeing in, in the results so far, which you see with Pat Ryan with 66 percent of the vote so far, with just a little over half of the expected vote reporting. Yeah, I mean, this is the district that we're talking about right here. And the, 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 the man who held that seat went to, became a lieutenant governor uh, of, of the state of New York. And that left it open just for this three-month period. And it put... Roe v. Wade and its aftermath on the front and center on the ballot. And we heard consistently from Pat Ryan, the Democrat, that Roe v. Wade and abortion rights on the ballot this year. Mark Molinaro, a county executive, the Republican nominee, he was blindsided. He said, look, I thought this was settled law. I never thought I'd be campaigning on this. He's wanted to talk about anything but the issue of abortion rights. We'll see how it prevails. The vote mostly so far uh, is the early vote and mail-in vote. It would tend to trend more Democratic, so it's not clear that these margins are going to hold. But uh, Democrats Democrats would love to love to hold on to the seat, show that they can win in a seat that could be a swing seat this fall, and particularly show that the issue of abortion rights gets their voters engaged even in the middle of the summer. Rick Klein, our thanks to you. We'll check back in with you before the end of the night. Now we head to our Victor Kendo in Florida, where Governor DeSantis is wrapped up after running unopposed this primary season. He'll be facing Congressman Charlie Crist in the fall. Uh, Victor, lay out to our viewers what kind of bitter battle we can expect out of the governor's race in the Sunshine State. Just how different these men are, especially since Crist was once a Republican. Lindsay, this should be an interesting one to watch. Charlie Chris, the congressman, he was the favorite in this one and certainly the more moderate choice between him and Nikki Freed. Chris has been in Florida politics for three decades now. Of course, as you mentioned, he was once the Republican governor. He's been part of the Independent Party, and now he is the Democratic nominee for governor. Uh, 
And tonight, Governor Ron DeSantis basically took a victory lap here during his speech a few moments ago. He didn't mention Charlie Crist a single time. He knows how popular he is right now in the Sunshine State, how much momentum he has behind me. And DeSantis feels that Florida kind of needs to set an example for the rest of the country. Take a listen. We need to win across the board in November uh, to make sure that we solidify this state as the nation's citadel of freedom. And I can tell you this, uh, we are going to be running awfully hard all across this state, and we are going to generate the biggest Republican turnout this state has ever seen. Lindsay, no doubt this is going to be an uphill climb for Charlie Chris, but I've spoken with him myself. He says that he is up for it. Lindsay. All right, and Victor, let's talk about the Senate race now. Marco Rubio will face Val Demings. You have the Rubio, uh, who's been senator for more than a decade and tried running for president in 2016, going against Val Demings, the former top cop in Orlando. How different are their platforms? Uh, I'd say very different, Lindsay. Val Demings, the former top cop, the chief of police there in Orlando, she has been going after Marco Rubio's attendance record. She's actually raised more money than Marco Rubio, and she's definitely put a lot of that money right into her campaign ads going after the senator. Uh, Rubio fired back, though, tonight in front of this friendly crowd. He was on stage. God claiming that Val Demings wanted to defund the police, something he said before and something that Demings has knocked down as well. Uh, Rubio also saying that Demings only votes with Pelosi. This one l might be a little bit tighter than the race for governor, Lindsay. All right, Victor Akendo, our thanks to you. Now let's get back to ABC News Deputy Political Director Avery Harper. Uh, Avery, uh, you're with the Maloney campaign tonight. Uh, I, I know you talked about earlier the disappointment. You heard that collective sigh in the room. But people still hanging out there tonight. Yeah, people are actually listening live to Congressman Jerry Nadler's uh, remarks at his party. And uh, we've heard many boos in the room as he has given those remarks. Uh, we're still waiting to see if we will uh, have an appearance from Congresswoman Maloney. She is not in the building yet, but we do know that she uh, spent uh, her very last moments until polls closed uh, campaigning, trying to get the word out about her campaign. We know that was unsuccessful, uh, that uh, Congressman Jerry Nadler uh, is projected to win in this race. And listen, I spoke with Congressman Nadler earlier today, and he said it is unfortunate that uh, the Congress and that the Democrats will lose a senior member, uh, a committee chair. Uh, Congressman Maloney is the chair of the House Oversight Committee uh, in this race, but uh, we are still waiting to hear if she will give remarks tonight. Not the victory celebration they were anticipating there. A couple of other key races in New York where moderates are facing off against progressive challengers. Break down those races for us and where things stand tonight. Right. Well, we are looking at a, a very close race in New York 10. That is that uh, race where there was at least a dozen candidates, uh, you know, many, uh, you know, pushing back on Dan Goldman, who is the uh, more moderate candidate in the race. Uh, he is leading right now, but uh, by a very narrow margin. We were looking at uh, Yuli Nu, who is uh, trailing him uh, by only a few hundred votes. But I, I think what's important to point out in this race is that uh, Congressman Mondeer Jones, who is currently uh, representing a a district of the northern suburbs in New York City. He was running in that race, and he is not one of the top two finishers. So, uh, you know, this is a, a sad moment for him uh, in that he will not be uh, in Congress, uh, you know, come next year. Uh, also, we were watching uh, Sean Patrick Maloney. He was going up against a progressive challenger, an AOC-backed uh, progressive challenger, a state uh, senator named Alessandra Biagi. Uh, we can project now that Sean Patrick Maloney has won his race, uh, and so uh, you know, a, a loss for progressives there, uh, but progressives are holding out hope uh, in, in New York's 10th district. Avery Harper, our thanks to you. Joining us now are our contributors, former Republican Congresswoman from Virginia, Barbara Comstock, and CEO of Democracy for America, Yvette Simpson. Yvette, we are now 77 days away from the midterms. Uh, nearly all of the races have taken shape at this point. What will it take for Democrats to main, maintain control of the Senate? 
You know, one, we've got to stay on message, and our strongest message right now is on choice. We definitely need to have a broader majority in the Senate in order to get anything done, and the conversation about how we get that done has to be consistent, and so we need to add more uh, Democrats to the Senate, so I think that's part of it. I think we need to not get distracted. We need to make sure that folks understand that there's a real choice here. You know, we got Republicans who are pushing forward a regression on, on all policies that we've won over the last half of century. Uh, and Democrats represent the future. So I think if we continue to have that message be strong and we stay on message together, I think we're going to be in good shape. I think if we veer off of that and we try to talk about ancillary things, I think we're going to be in a lot of trouble. Barbara, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell said last week that the quality of candidates may hurt Republicans' chances of taking control of the Senate. President Trump endorsed a number of them. Has he hurt Republican prospects this fall? on giving to Democrats. And I think one of the reasons here, we've been talking about Florida tonight, I think one of the reasons there probably won't be able to be a lot of Democrat investment, either in the Democrat Senate or governor race, is because there's so many opportunities elsewhere in the Senate with um, Dr. Oz, Republicans you know, in Pennsylvania, with um, Blake Masters in Arizona, with uh, J.D. Vance in Ohio, and, and other candidates that are weak um, in the Senate, and then also the governor candidates in Arizona and Pennsylvania um, and Michigan. So those other states with the weak candidates, as Mitch McConnell mentioned, really provide Democrats with better opportunities than, than Florida has. Yvette, there are divisions, of course, in the Democratic Party over how much emphasis to put on issues like abortion or voting rights compared to the economy and inflation. How can Democrats balance that heading into the fall? You know, I think we have to work for what, you know, have to use what works. We know that right now, even though uh, gas prices are going down, even though we've passed the IRA, people still don't feel like Democrats are stronger on the economy. They don't believe that we're doing enough to make them feel like they are cared for, that they have everything they need. And right now, we're able to galvanize people around these very divisive issues that Republicans have set up. What kind of world do you want to have? What kind of freedoms do you want to have? And more importantly, the threat to our democracy. We just recently uh, saw a, a poll that suggests that threats to democracy are more significant to Americans right now than the cost of living. And I don't know that we've had an opportunity like that to be able to run on issues like um, these very important freedoms in a year where Democrats really are not um, winning on issues of the economy. So we've got to go for what we know. And I also think I want to echo what Barbara said, take advantage of these very, very disastrous candidates in P Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Georgia. Um, that we've been gifted by the Republicans. Barbara, we've heard so many Republican candidates deny the results of the 2020 elections. Half of all Republican nominees, in fact, deny or cast doubt on Joe Biden's victory. How could that impact their chances in midterms? Well, I think any day that Donald Trump is front and center in the news is going to make it tough for those Republicans in swing seats, both in the House and then swing states in the Senate. So the majority makers for Republicans are in these swing purple areas. So when you have Donald Trump every day, I mean, today was bad news for Donald Trump again. And, you know, what went on at Mar-a-Lago looks very bad. And these classified documents and all these stories, you know, whether it's indictments of his friends or potential indictments of Donald Trump himself, I mean, even his own people are saying they expect him to be indicted. So every day he is in the news making all Republicans, you know, pay fealty to him and say that he didn't do anything wrong. That is bad news for Republicans and hurts their shots of gaining more seats. Overall, I still think the House goes Republican. Senate, maybe after all the money is spent, Senate ends up 50-50 or maybe Democrats gain one seat. Barbara Comstock, Heidi Heitkamp. Thank uh, and it's uh, not Heidi. I, I'm sorry, <laughs> Yvette Simpson. We thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Lindsay. New York and Florida aren't the only states voting tonight. Voters in the state of Oklahoma cast their ballots in a special election runoff for one of the state's Senate seats. And ABC News can report that Congressman Mark Wayne Mullen is expected to win the GOP nomination for November. He celebrated that win earlier tonight. Take a listen. Once we are successful in November. No one will work harder for the state of Oklahoma than me. Washington, D.C. has no business influencing us. 
we need to be influencing Washington, D.C. Congratulations, Congressman Mullen. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome back to the show. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. So Oklahoma has not elected a Democrat to the U.S. Senate in more than 30 years. So as the projected winner of your primary, you'll likely end up in the Senate next year. What are your top priorities in the Senate that you may not have been able to accomplish in the House? Well, shrink the size of government. Um, you know, these bureaucrats that run these agencies, they get confirmed through the Senate. And unfortunately, what's happening is we're making um, we're making rule, rulemakings becoming legislation. They're reaching back to the Clean Water Act in 1972. Uh, they're looking at EPA rules uh, and Department of Labor rules that reach all the way back into the 80s. And that's not the intention. That wasn't the intentions of creating these uh, these um, regulatory agencies. They were supposed to be um, uh, beholden or they were supposed to be accountable to Congress. And that doesn't happen right now. And the uncertainty that happens through that is causes a lot of confusion in the in the business world, which is where I come from. Uh, if we're ever going to get this economy back on track where it needs to be, then we, we, we have to quit allowing Washington, D.C. to influence us. Washington, D.C. was never designed to create jobs. They're supposed to create an environment where entrepreneurs, job creators, um, uh, world changers can go out and create those jobs that Washington, D.C. politicians like to talk about. We heard Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell weigh in last week saying that the Republican Party may face an uphill battle for regaining the Senate. And he cited, quote, candidate quality as a factor. Many are pointing to candidates that former President Trump endorsed as not living up to expectations. What's your view? Has Trump helped or hurt the Republicans' chance of taking the Senate this fall? Well, as you know, Lizzie, Trump, uh, President Trump endorsed me, and I consider him a friend. Um, I, I think his record speaks pretty good. Uh, what is it, 95 percent of his endorsed candidates have been able to win the primary. And I think you're going to see that uh, he's going to have a huge influence in the, in the Senate, too. Uh, the, the get America um, uh, back and and make America great again, an agenda that President, uh, that President Trump ran on, it was good for our country. We see what's happening now. We have record high inflation. Uh, we It's not if we're in a recession. It's, it's how deep the recession is going to go unless you're going to have somebody redefine the definition to it. Uh, and we see uh, the American people are saying the country's going in the wrong direction. Let's not forget the disastrous Afghanistan withdrawal uh, just a year ago. So uh, people like the policies. They may not always like his rhetoric, but they like the policies that President Trump put in place. And uh, I believe when uh, November comes out, we're going to take back both chambers. As you just stated, former President Trump did endorse you in the primary. I'm wondering, I know you talked about his policies, but, but let's talk about the pressure that he's facing right now with the FBI investigation into classified material uh, taken from Mar-a-Lago and the ongoing January 6th investigation. How do you think that, that Trump's support will play into your campaign as, as well as how you plan to legislate in the Senate? Well, in Oklahoma, uh, we, we love President Trump. Uh, but let's talk about the classified information a lot of people want to talk about. Keep in mind, the GAO, the Government Accountability Office, made documentations. They knew every piece of paper he had in his possession because they took it there. And it was over 500 days later that they decided to go get the information back. 500 days. Unless it was an immediate threat, there's no excuse for Director Ray and the Attorney General Garland to authorize that raid on his private residence. There's no reason for that to get uh, to go to that place. What rose to, all, to the occasion that all of a sudden this information that everybody knew he had required them to go in and spend nine hours uh, raiding a former president of the United States House? I think it's very dangerous what they did there. Uh, and, I, and it's going to be very difficult for us to say that it wasn't politically motivated considering the record of the FBI pre towards President Trump. Uh, just curious, though, have you thought at all, do you, have you questioned or been curious, why did he hold on to these confidential documents? Well, you can ask the same thing about Hillary Clinton, why she held on to it when she was Secretary of State, or even the document, the, the class information that Barack Obama took out when he first left office, too. I get people say, well, now they're back in their archives. Well, how long did he have them beforehand? Uh, and, and, and keep in mind, again, all this information was known to the Government Accountability Office. It's not like he snuck the papers out. And people still talk about, well, is in his personal residence. Yeah, this personal residence is probably guarded better than the White House was, and it was still guarded by the United States Secret Service. I think they're pretty good at their job. In fact, I think they're probably the best at protective service detail than anybody in any agency in the world, considering they haven't lost a president or vice president quite some time. And so for them to say that this these documents were in danger, 
Well, what was the endanger? What was the danger then? What was the immediate threat? What was the national security risk that required them to do what they did? And all we're saying, I said on the House Intelligence Agency, which means we had the highest clearance. There isn't anything that they have to redact from us. And yet they still refuse to come in and brief the House Intelligence Committee. Why? Why is it they won't even, even though we have direct oversight, why won't they come in and talk to us? Well, I believe that this was politically motivated. Until they prove me wrong, that's where I'm going to be. Uh, you've questioned the results, of course, of the 2020 presidential vote and voted against certifying the election even after the January 6th insurrection. Do you think that this is a winning platform for Republican candidates going forward, especially in states that are less conservative than in Oklahoma, for example? Well, everybody's got to run their own race, Lindsay. Uh, for us, it, it wasn't a political vote to me. It's what I, I truly believe. You're going to have a hard time convincing me that President Joe Biden was the most popular president out there. I, I just... That, that just blows my mind. He got more votes than Barack Obama. Uh, he's got more votes than any president out there. I think there's a lot of questions that we need to make sure are answered so we never repeat this again. And, and so for me, it's personal. Uh, I just want to make sure we have fair elections and make sure that the American people can trust our election system because that's what our republic is built upon making sure we can trust those around us and that every vote truly counts that means my vote and that means your vote and on the issue of abortion you said that you support national ban on abortion and that you personally don't support exceptions we did recently see what happened in traditionally conservative kansas where uh, voters upheld abortion rights is there a danger that republicans could face real backlash on abortions this fall well, once again, this is something that I think everybody has to make a decision. For me, it's personal. Uh, as a father of, of six children, three that came natural to us and three we chose, which means three that we adopted, um, someone's going to love that child. And that child deserves an opportunity of greatness. That child deserves an opportunity to live just like the the the, the, the person that's carrying that baby. And uh, and so for me, it's, it's a time we celebrate. For the first time in 49 years, we're not killing our world changers, our entrepreneurs, our go-getters here in Oklahoma. And while we celebrate that, there's still people that that um, uh, that are still boarding babies. And so a baby in, in California or Massachusetts is just as important as a baby in Oklahoma. And we want to make sure that every child has an opportunity to live up to their fullest potential. And to that point, though, when you say every child, uh, you know, recently we were talking about in the state of Indiana where there was a 12-year-old who was raped, right? And and so she's really a child still, right? And, and so just playing devil's advocate right. here, does she have a chance to grow up and, and, and be a child still without being forced into motherhood? You know, I have, um, I have three daughters. Uh, my twins are 11, which are adopted. And then um, one of my biological children, uh, Lara, who just turned 14. I can't imagine. I, I just I just can't imagine as a parent dealing with that and, and especially I'll never be able to understand that perspective uh, from a child's perspective. But I'll still go back and say someone can love that child. Um, you know, uh, our, 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 um, our, our twins, they came from um, a young lady that got pregnant at 15 years old. I would argue she was still a, a, a child too. And, and she still went ahead and gave these twins an opportunity to live a full and productive life. And I'll tell you what, those twin girls are just something special. I mean, they are smart, they're loving. Um, they don't meet a stranger. And Lindsay, if you met them for 30 seconds, you just absolutely fall in love with them. Every child should have that same opportunity. Well, we see that twinkle in your eye when you talk about him. Congressman Mark Wayne Mullen, once again, congratulations tonight, the GOP candidate for Senate in Oklahoma. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me on, Lindsay. And for more analysis now, 538's Galen Droop joins us again. Let's take a look at the, the state of play for control of the Senate. First, just break down the latest 538 Senate forecast for November. According to 538's forecast, Democrats have a 63% chance of keeping control of the Senate, and Republicans, of course, then have a 37% chance of winning control of the Senate. Now, what do those percentages mean in practice? To give some perspective, a good batting average in professional baseball is around 30%. So a talented hitter will hit the ball 30% of the time in a baseball game, which means that if you've ever seen a hitter hit the baseball, you know that things with a 30% chance of happening happen all the time, which is to say that this is not a done deal. Republicans could certainly win control of the chamber, but right now Democrats clearly have the upper hand. And their upper hand has grown. 
Their chance of controlling the chamber used to be only 40% at the beginning of the summer. Now it's grown to 63%. That's a really good analogy, the baseball one, that really helps put that in, in perspective for us. So Democratic chances, they're improving to hold on to the Senate. We heard Senate Mitch McConnell's recent comment on candidate quality hurting Republicans. Uh, what are some of the races where GOP candidates may be falling short of expectations? So what does Senator Mitch McConnell mean when he says that candidates may be struggling from quality issues? We know empirically from the work that we've done at 538 that all things being equal, candidates that are more towards the center of the political spectrum do better in competitive general elections. We also know that all things being equal, candidates who have run in and won elections previously also do better. We also know, empirically speaking, that candidates, and it may be intuitive as well, the candidates that aren't facing scandals also do better. So when we think about those three issues, who are some Republican nominees that we could look at that may not be high quality candidates? First, I would say Herschel Walker in Georgia. He's never run in an election before, he's never won an election before, and he has a lot of baggage. He's facing various scandals in the state. We can also look at J.D. Vance in Ohio. He's also uh, a newbie when it comes to running for elected office. He hasn't won before. Also, Dr. Oz in Pennsylvania. And so right now, we see that in all those three states, Democrat, the Democrat is actually leading in the polling average. That's surprising. You know, Ohio should be a real easy, you know, state to keep control of in the Senate for Republicans. You know, in an environment where there's a really unpopular president like Joe Biden, you know, his approval rating is still only around 40 percent. Republicans should be able to pick up a state like Georgia. They should probably be able to keep a state like Pennsylvania. But they're struggling from issues with candidate quality because they're running a lot of new candidates who don't have a lot of experience. And as though, even though Trump may have made it look easy in 2016, it is quite hard to run for office, especially statewide office, if you have no experience doing it. 538's Galen Drew, we thank you so much again for your time and insight. Appreciate it. Absolutely. More election coverage straight ahead. Stay with us. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen She's in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. Welcome back. ABC News political director Rick Klein joins us once again. Final thoughts for this hour, Rick? Yeah, in Florida, the moderates held, the center held. It's almost like Bidenism 
is catching on in places like Florida. Charlie Crist, a big winner in Florida. He pitched himself as someone that could heal the divisions up against a firebrand in Ron DeSantis. DeSantis barely winning just a few years ago. He has gained in popularity by some measure. The question about how he matches up becomes a big one now. And Val Demings, the Republican nominee for Senate to take on Marco Rubio. That is potentially a, a, a dream team of a ticket. Democrats are excited about what that means with Charlie Crist's experience uh, as well as Val Deming and her, Demings and her background. There's some real possibilities for them to put Florida in play. Democrats feeling good about the night they're having. Meanwhile, in, De in, 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 in New York, we saw the, the, the biggest matchup of the year so far. Jerry Nadler, a very easy winner over Carolyn Maloney. Uh, that, that was a little bit of a bust of a showdown, but uh, as we've talked about, Lindsay, it's not the kind of thing that Democrats wanted to face at all. The fact that they had to lose one of their own in Carolyn Maloney after being in Congress for 30 years really stings, uh, despite some other victories up and down the ticket. Yeah, there was going to be no victory, really, no matter how that one went. Rick Klein, our thanks to you. Thanks, Lizzie. That's our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award winning, powerful, eye opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. As a professional athlete, you want to do stuff that's awe-inspiring, death-defying. I've continued to chase that feeling, but there's an absolute moment of leap of faith. To be an elite adventure athlete, you have to push past the fear to achieve a transcendent experience. Sometimes the only way to find the edge is to go over it. We all like saving money at the supermarket, but... 31.8 million. What? I was just like in shock. Okay, how did a mother of three turn clipping into a $31 million ripoff? You can see nothing yet. She was living the dream. So, how did her con come crashing down? Now, the jailhouse interview. Oh, let's come to the Wait prison. until you hear what she says. Absolutely mind-blowing. This is the con. All new, Thursday night on ABC. Ready for a little GMA-ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Tonight, the news on former President Trump. The National Archives indicating the former president had more than 700 pages of classified documents at Mar-a-Lago. Also, major news coming in from Ukraine tonight. President Zelensky warning the Ukrainian people of potentially brutal Russian strikes tomorrow. First, those 700 pages of classified documents the National Archives indicates were at Mar-a-Lago. This new information tonight from a letter released by the former president's own team. The former president asking for a special master to review the evidence seized. And tonight, 
what a judge is now saying about that request. Terry Moran with late reporting. Also breaking that warning in Ukraine tonight from President Zelensky, telling the Ukrainian people brutal strikes could be coming from Russia. What the U.S. State Department is saying tonight as well, sharing declassified intelligence with Ukraine. Ian Panel from inside Ukraine with what we're learning at this hour. In this country, the deadly flooding torrential rains on the move tonight across several states. And now we learn of the wife and mother on the phone with her husband as her car was lifted by the waters. What she said to him, she did not survive. Trevor Alt in the flood zone, Ginger Z, timing out the storms tonight. This evening, two men convicted in the plot to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Murder charges dropped against two police officers accused of killing Rayshard Brooks in Atlanta. Why the officers have been cleared tonight. The ABC News countdown to the midterms tonight in primary day in New York and Florida. In New York, two veteran members of Congress turning on each other, now competing to represent the same district, Jerry Nadler and Carolyn Maloney. And what about the third candidate in this race? And in Florida tonight, voters deciding who will take on Governor Ron DeSantis in November. Rachel Scott standing by to break it all down. The husband of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi pleading guilty to DUI after his crash in California. Tonight, the sentence. Two major recalls from two separate automakers tonight involving SUVs and a potential fire risk, urging owners to park their vehicles away from their homes. And America Strong tonight, why it clearly pays to live next door to a firefighter and a nurse. From ABC News World Headquarters in New York, this is World News Tonight with David Muir. Good evening. It is great to have you with us here on a Tuesday night. We have two major headlines tonight. The news coming in from Ukraine with President Zelensky has now warned the Ukrainian people tonight to be prepared for possible brutal Russian strikes in the coming hours. What the U.S. State Department is also saying tonight. But we begin with former President Trump and that eye-opening new reveal. Tonight we have learned the National Archives in a letter that they wrote to the former president's lawyers said they had retrieved more than 700 pages of classified material from Mar-a-Lago earlier this year. Now, this new information tonight actually was released by the former president's own team. And those 700 pages, that was the number even before the FBI raid weeks ago. In fact, it was that discovery from the National Archives, those 700 pages that in part prompted the Department of Justice to get involved. And the New York Times now reporting the documents at Mar-a-Lago included some from the CIA, the National Security Agency, and the FBI. The Times also reporting the former president himself went through the boxes before turning over the first batches of documents. Tonight, the former president still asking that judge to appoint a special master to review all of the evidence seized by the FBI and what that judge is now saying about that tonight. ABC's Terry Moran leading us off again tonight. Tonight, a newly released letter from the National Archives reveals the scope and the magnitude of the trove of classified material Donald Trump took with him to Mar-a-Lago when he left the White House. Over 100 documents with classification markings comprising more than 700 pages. Some include the highest levels of classification, including Special Access Program's SAP materials. That security designation is reserved for the most sensitive secrets in the government. It restricts access to the smallest number of individuals possible, only those with a need to know. The letter from the archives was released by a representative of Trump himself. This past January, the Trump team handed over 15 boxes of documents to the archives. The New York Times reports they included documents from the CIA, the National Security Agency, and the FBI. According to the paper, Mr. Trump went through the boxes himself before turning them over. But even after that, Trump still had not returned everything sought by the government. Months later in June, more documents were given back. And then, in that search on August 8th, the FBI seized 11 more sets of classified materials. So let's get right to Terry Moran with us from Washington again tonight. And Terry, the former president, is calling for the court uh, to appoint a special master to review all this evidence seized from Mar-a-Lago. And tonight, we're hearing from that judge. That's right, David. The, the Trump team wants a special master that's an individual appointed by the court to review all of the documents seized by the FBI. But the court fired back with an order that asked for basic information lacking in the Trump team's request. Like, what law are you invoking? Like, how does the court have the power in this instance to give it to you? And why her court? This is a different court than the one that handled the search warrant. This was a stunning rebuke from a judge appointed by Donald Trump. 
David. A lot of questions to be answered in the coming days on that. Terry Moran leading us off. Thank you, Terry. The other major story, as I mentioned, we're following tonight comes from Ukraine. Tonight, President Zelensky issuing an urgent warning to Ukrainians that especially brutal strikes could be coming from Russia in the coming hours. They are now in the early morning hours in Ukraine. Their Independence Day has begun. And tonight, the U.S. State Department urging Americans to leave Ukraine, sharing declassified intelligence with Ukraine. Our chief foreign correspondent, Ian Panel, back in key for us tonight. Tonight, President Zelensky issuing an ominous new warning to his people, saying Russia may be planning, quote, hideous provocations and brutal strikes as Ukraine prepares to celebrate Independence Day. And tonight, the U.S. again urging Americans to leave Ukraine amid that threat of intensified Russian attacks. State Department sources saying declassified intelligence shared with the Ukrainians shows the Kremlin may be preparing to launch strikes on highly populated areas. Ukraine's banning large gatherings during the event. ABC's Britt Klenert asking President Zelensky about the threat. What's your reason for urging people not to gather tomorrow? Is it because Kyiv is under threat? Amid these concerns over what Russia may do next, the United Nations holding an emergency meeting on the volatile situation at Ukraine's Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Ukraine saying Russian strikes damaged infrastructure and transformers, briefly cutting off power at Europe's largest nuclear plant. The Ukrainians also claiming Russians are shelling the plant's nearby ash pits, where nuclear waste is stored, raising clouds of toxic radioactive dust, stoking ongoing fears of a potential nuclear disaster. And so let's bring in Ian Panel tonight reporting from Kiev. And Ian, I want to get right back to the U.S. State Department again, urging Americans to leave Ukraine, saying it shared a declassified intelligence with Ukraine, suggesting that Russia might in fact be planning these strikes on Independence Day, which of course is in the hours ahead. Uh, President Zelensky, in your report there, obviously clearly very concerned about the, the real possibility of this. Yeah, that's right. In fact, Independence Day has just begun and this country is braced. But Zelensky also doubling down tonight. He's saying that they won't relent until they retake back parts of the country occupied by Russia, not just in the last six months, but for years, even Crimea. Forget any peace deal for now. This war looks set to drag on for a long time. David. Ian Panel in key for us. Ian, thank you. Back here at home tonight, the deadly flooding. Torrential rains on the move at this hour across several states. Much of Dallas still recovering after the most rain there in a 24-hour period in nearly 100 years. And tonight here, we are learning about the wife and mother on the phone with her husband as her car was swept away. She did not survive. Ginger Z is tracking the storms ahead tonight, but first Trevor Alt in the flood zone. Tonight, those record-breaking storms pushing east, now dumping torrential rain on the deep south. In northeast Louisiana, a tractor trailer exiting Interstate 20, losing control and overturning. This after the Dallas-Fort Worth area received the most rain over a 24-hour period in nearly a century Monday. Hundreds of calls for help, dozens of homes damaged. What well, people in the Dallas area, as well as this entire region, sustained uh, was an extraordinary challenge. In Mesquite, just east of Dallas, 60-year-old Jolene Gerald killed after her vehicle was swept away. Friends telling our affiliate WFAA the mother of three was working as an Uber driver and that before she was killed, she was on the phone with her husband telling him it felt like someone was pushing her car. Tragically, searchers in Utah finding the body of Jaytel Agnihotri Monday missing after flash floods tore through Zion National Park Friday. And in Mississippi tonight, a stalled storm system making for an anxious evening. Evening ahead. And David, we're already seeing the flooding here in Jackson, and this flood watch continues all the way through tomorrow night because we still may get another half a foot of rain. David. All right, Trevor Alden, Mississippi. Trevor, thank you. Let's get more on this. Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z on the storms again tonight. Hi, Ginger. Hey there, David. After all of that extra rain that Dallas got on top of what was already breaking records, we've now seen the wettest August on record. That's coming from exceptional drought, the highest level. And I want to take you to the map because that flash flood threat does not only there in Jackson, Mississippi, but over to Meridian. If you're driving I-20, Hattiesburg, don't drive if you get a flash flood warning on your phone. That is the best way to stay alive because you cannot beat moving water. And that is what we're going to see more of that stationary front 
barely moves the next 36 hours. It's going to allow all of that tropical moisture to pool up against it, and that's where you get that three to six inches. Some places could even see higher numbers than that, David. All right, Ginger, thanks again tonight for being with us. Meantime, tonight in Michigan, a jury convicting two men of conspiring to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Here's ABC's Ike Kajaji. Tonight, a key victory for the Justice Department in its fight against domestic terrorism. A jury finding two self-styled militiamen guilty of plotting to kidnap and kill Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer in 2020. All of our elected officials, everyone, deserves to be able to live in safety and not in fear. Adam Fox and Barry Croft convicted on all counts, including conspiring to obtain a weapon of mass destruction in the form of a bomb. The verdict coming four months after a different jury deadlocked on the charges against these two men, prompting prosecutors to file a motion to quickly retry the case. In October 2020, the FBI arrested Fox and Croft along with four other men as they allegedly tried to buy explosives with the goal of attacking Whitmer before Election Day. According to authorities, the plot was months in the making, driven in part by the Democratic governor's COVID-19 restrictions. The FBI infiltrating and wiretapping the group after one member turned informant alarmed by the talk of killing police. At both trials, however, the defense arguing this was a case of entrapment and that the defendants were just big talkers. My client is disappointed in the verdict. Um, it's been a good fight. But evidence submitted at trial showed Fox, the group's ringleader, conducting surveillance on Whitmer's vacation home and firing a stun gun. The men allegedly planning to blow up a nearby bridge to slow police response, then take Whitmer to a secret location in Wisconsin for a trial that would end in her execution. Now, David, Governor Whitmer releasing a statement saying today's verdicts prove that violence and threats have no place in our politics and that those who seek to divide us will be held accountable. Now, both Fox and Croft face life in prison, but their lawyers are considering an appeal. David. All right, Ike Ajaji in Chicago. Ike, thank you. And tonight in Atlanta, murder charges have now been dropped against two police officers accused of killing Rayshard Brooks. Steve Osinsami tonight on why the officers have now been cleared. It's my police officers in Georgia are celebrating this tonight. It's my conclusion that the use of deadly force was objectively reasonable and that they did not act with criminal intent. The special prosecutor has announced that he will clear the two white police officers seen here in an arrest that turned deadly at the parking lot of this Atlanta fast food restaurant in June of 2020. Authorities today shared that the victim, 27-year-old Rayshard Brooks, wasn't oh, just drunk behind the wheel, but was also on cocaine right and other now. drugs. And that officers Garrett Rolfe and Devin Brosnan, who were responding to calls from the restaurant, acted within the law. The police didn't come into this encounter hot. They, there was no uh, hostility. They were businesslike. They were polite. In announcing their decision, authorities replayed videos of the 40-minute encounter, pointing out that not only did Rayshard Brooks grab a police stun gun and run, but that he was pointing the weapon at the officer who shot and killed him. Brosnan and Rolfe committed no crimes. The family of Rayshard Brooks tonight is heartbroken. This family lost a father, and they deserve a jury trial. This all happened during the summer of protests after the killings of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery. And the two officers who won today argue that they were sacrificed by authorities here to help calm the streets. They spent the last two years trying to clear their names, and tonight they are still on the Atlanta police force. David. All right, Steve Osinsami tonight. Steve, thank you. And to the Breonna Taylor case now in Kentucky tonight, a former Louisville police detective has tonight pleaded guilty to helping to falsify the warrant that led to the deadly raid that killed Taylor. Kelly Goodlett pleading guilty to a federal conspiracy charge. She may now be cooperating with investigators. Brianna Taylor was fatally shot more than two years ago now by officers who knocked down her door while executing a drug search warrant. Three other officers involved in the incident are also facing federal charges. We turn next tonight to the ABC News countdown to the midterms and primary day in New York and Florida. In New York, two veteran members of Congress turning on each other to now compete to, for their political careers. They're competing to represent the same district now. And in Florida tonight, voters are deciding there who will take on Governor Ron DeSantis in November. Rachel Scott here in New York City tonight. They are two of the most powerful Democrats in Congress. Jerry Nadler presided over both Trump impeachments as chairman of the judiciary. Carolyn Maloney leads the House Oversight Committee. But now a redrawn New York congressional map has forced these longtime allies to run against each other. And in the 11th hour, 
the race has gotten ugly. I think that you should uh, read the editorial in the New York Post today. They call him senile. Have you been disappointed by some of the comments from Congressman Maloney? Yes. I've been very disappointed when she talks about uh, that I'm not really running for the seat or that I'm senile. I mean, it's absurd. I'm surprised at her. Both were elected in 1992. Nadler has emphasized he's the city's only remaining Jewish congressman. Maloney has emphasized her fight for abortion rights. You cannot send a man to do a woman's job. Today I asked Nadler what happens if his constituents vote him out. And if you lose this race, is this district still in good hands? Uh, it's in good hands, yes. Not as good. In Florida tonight, another hard-fought Democratic primary. Two candidates battling it out to take on Republican Governor Ron DeSantis. The winner, former Governor Charlie Crist. He was a Republican then, he's a Democrat now. Florida's a beautiful place, and we need to bring her back together. Chris defeating State Agriculture Commissioner Nikki Freed. I have been in the trenches fighting Ron DeSantis for three and a half years. I am ready for this battle. DeSantis himself has his sights set on a possible presidential campaign. We can never ever surrender to woke ideology. He has spent the past week on tour of the battleground states, campaigning for Republican candidates in New Mexico, Pennsylvania, Arizona, and Ohio. All right, so let's get Rachel Scott tonight. And Rachel, that New York congressional race pitting these two veteran lawmakers against each other. And I know there's a third candidate in the race who's really trying to make the case it's time for a generational change. Yes, David, 38-year-old Serge Patel. He used to work for former President Barack Obama. He says it's now time for the Obama generation to take over, but he's up against two Democratic titans with decades of political experience. Congressman Jerry Nadler has represented the Upper West Side for more than 30 years. That makes up a large section of this district, and it typically has high voter turnout, David. All right, we'll be watching in the coming hours. Rachel Scott tonight. Thank you, Rachel. Next here tonight, the explosive allegations against Twitter from a former head of security now turned whistleblower. Peter Zotko has filed complaints with several government agencies accusing Twitter of dangerous lapses in cybersecurity, including those fake accounts, bot accounts, saying those lapses, quote, threaten national security and democracy. Twitter fired Zotko in December. They deny his claims, but members of Congress already taking notice tonight, and this could impact Twitter's legal fight with Elon Musk. When we come back on this busy news night, the husband of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi pleading guilty to his DUI after his crash in California, and tonight the sentence. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7, there for you with one touch. The ABC News app, download Load it now. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Tonight, the husband of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi pleading guilty to DUI after his crash in California. Prosecutors say 82-year-old Paul Pelosi's blood alcohol level was .082 when he and another car collided in Napa County, California in May. The judge sentencing him today to five days in jail and three years probation. He receives credit for four of the days. The fifth day will be spent doing community service. There's new data tonight showing overall life expectancy here in the U.S. falling in all 50 states. The CDC reporting a drop by 1.8 years from 2019 to 2020, falling from 78.8 to 77 years. New York State seeing the largest decline by three years, D.C. falling 2.7 years, Hawaii with the highest life expectancy in the country. The decline, of course, blamed on the pandemic and the rise on fatal drug overdoses in this country. When we come back tonight, two automakers, two major recalls involving SUVs and a potential fire risk. They're actually urging owners to park their cars away from their homes. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live.
America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis. The powerful series, streaming free on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. To the index into that major SUV recall tonight from two separate automakers, Hyundai and Kia, both recalling 281,000 SUVs because of a potential fire risk linked to a tow hitch circuit board. The company's issuing stop sale orders for the Hyundai, Palisade, and Kia Telluride. Recent model years, 2020 to 2022, and owners tonight are being urged to park their cars outside and away from their homes until a fix is available. Of course, we've got more on our website later this evening for you. And when we come back tonight, why it really pays off to live next door to a firefighter and a nurse. You have to see this. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. I had never heard of a homicide like this. The three victims had been murdered execution style. Guns are business. Stabbing is personal. And then in April 2013. Those two brothers could be linked to a triple murder on the anniversary of September 11th. The most immediate question, if police investigated this case thoroughly, would they have prevented the Boston Marathon bombing? I just want to scream. Finally tonight, the firefighter and the nurse next door, America Strong. It all played out in York Haven, Pennsylvania, where Chris Favorin and Beth Villarreal are getting married next month. Chris was doing a workout at home when suddenly he felt pain in his chest. In a panic, he went to his neighbor's house, the firefighter and the nurse next door, the Mulrays. Ringing the doorbell, leaning on the porch railing, collapsing, his fiance behind him. Chris, the firefighter, Rachel, the nurse practitioner, both performing CPR until the ambulance arrives. Rachel would ride with him to the ER, and he told her, just keep me alive for the wedding. Four days later, that neighbor, back on that same front porch, hugging the husband and wife, the firefighter and the nurse, who saved his life. And right here tonight. Hi, David. His gratitude. It's nice to know that I can go over to them in my time of need and get the CPR that it, that. I needed that day. He's also ready for the wedding. We're looking forward to a long life together because of the actions of my neighbors. Hi, David. And tonight, the neighbor, the firefighter, with a message for us all. Anyone on the street who takes this class and takes a CPR class, they could do the same thing. It's true. The wedding next month, the firefighter and the nurse will be there. Good night. so much at stake in our world right now. We wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. 
What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find. Unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Tonight, primary night in America, and the races are some of the most consequential of the campaign season so far. Our team is standing by as the results come in. In New York, a clash of Democratic titans. For years, they held their own seats, but after Democratic gerrymandering backfired, Representatives Carolyn Maloney and Jerry Nadler are in a battle for their political careers. And at the 11th hour, that race is getting ugly. I think that you should uh, read the editorial in the New York Post today. They call him senile. Have you been disappointed by some of the comments from Congressman Maloney? Yes. I've been very disappointed when she talks about uh, that I'm not really running for the seat or that I'm senile. I mean, it's absurd. I'm surprised at her. In Florida, a Sunshine State showdown. The stage is set for Governor Ron DeSantis and one of the highest profile governor races this fall. And his opponent will be a former Republican governor of Florida, now running as a Democrat. Florida's a beautiful place and we need to bring her back together. We can never, ever surrender to woke ideology. And it could be one of the priciest and most consequential Senate races. Representative Val Demings punching her ticket to the general election. And Democrats hoping that she has what it takes to take down Marco Rubio. And that is why I am running for the United States Senate, and I'm running. 11 weeks to go to the day until the midterm elections, and so much is at stake. ABC News Live's special primary election coverage starts right now. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. It is the last major primary night of this election season, and it has featured some of the biggest clashes that we have seen so far this year. And now with 11 weeks to the day until the midterms tonight, we're getting a clearer picture of what will be some of the most important races to watch this fall. In Florida, we now know that Governor Ron DeSantis will face Democratic Congressman Charlie Crist in his re-election race. Crist, of course, once served as governor of the Sunshine State as a Republican. And Republican Senator Marco Rubio will face a test from Representative Val Demings, a former police chief in Orlando. And polls show that she may be within striking distance. And here in New York, in a clash of two Democratic titans, as a result of redistricting, House Judiciary Chair is projected to beat House Oversight Chair Carolyn Maloney in the 12th District. ABC News political director has Rick Klein has been with us every step of the way all night long, and he joins us now from Washington at the big board. So, Rick, big picture for us here. Uh, what are your biggest takeaways of the night so far? Yeah, Florida is the big story of the night because Ron DeSantis is such a major political force. So is Marco Rubio in the Senate. So the Democrats have made their picks. And what's interesting is that Charlie Crist, as, as the former governor, was seen overwhelmingly by Democrats as the best matchup to go up against Ron DeSantis. DeSantis barely won the state four years ago. Tonight, he's promising the biggest turnout in the history of, uh, of Republican politics in Florida. And he may need it to overcome what could be the Democrats newly motivated with this new team that they have with Charlie 
Harley Crist and, uh, and Val Demings. Val Demings uh, vying to become only the third black woman senator in American history. Uh, it's an interesting matchup. The state is still very tur turning red, but there are blue dots there. And these are places that they're going to look to exploit. And they're trying to do it now with kind of consensus, moderate type candidates as opposed to uh, more progressives or firebrands, uh, even though Ron DeSantis has made a name for himself as a conservative uh, firebrand himself. And I want to ask you about that bellwether race that we've been talking about all night, the special election in New York's 19th congressional district. The results have gotten even tighter here. What's the message for Democrats across the country here if Democrat Pat Ryan is able to hang on to this lead in this swing district? Yeah, this is such an interesting district because actually Donald Trump carried in 2016, Joe Biden carried it in 2020, and the Democratic candidate barely won uh, his House seat then. Now it's vacant, only about three months remaining on that term, but Democrats have wanted to hold on to that to show that they can still win in a place that might swing either way, despite the, the generally favorable wins that might favor a Republican. Uh, and what happened in the middle of this campaign is that Roe v. Wade got overturned. Pat Ryan, the Democratic candidate on this, uh, as you can see, clinging to a narrow lead. He has said explicitly abortion on the ballot today. Mark Molinaro, the Republican candidate, hasn't wanted to talk about that. He has tried to say, look, this is settled in New York. Don't make this an issue. So far, we're seeing big Democratic turnout in, in Pat Ryan's home county. That's kind of the Democratic base here. I think no matter whether they win or lose, the Democrats are going to say they have a way to get their base out and that they're building on the, the victory they had in Kansas a few weeks ago, building on turnout in some special elections, that their, their base continues to be motivated by opposition to the Supreme Court's decision on Roe v. Wade overturned. And with the overall Senate map now virtually set, the battle lines are taking shape ahead of what could be a bruising campaign, campaign season ahead. I understand just one more Senate race that's outstanding in the next couple of days? Yeah, just one big one that's on our map. When you look at the, the 10 or so seats that are likely to be targeted, New Hampshire is the only state that we're waiting on the Republican nominee on. And Lizzie, it's been the tale of two parties through this primary season. The Democrats have had basically bloodless primaries throughout in Wisconsin a few weeks ago, in Florida tonight. Basically Basically, all of the, the major candidates um, rallied behind the person who would end up winning. It has been a much different story on the Republican side. We saw Trump endorse candidates win in, uh, in, in Nevada, in Arizona, uh, also already having in Wisconsin. We saw it in Ohio. We saw it with Dr. Oz in Pennsylvania. We saw it in North Carolina. Uh, and we saw it with Herschel Walker in, in Georgia. This is a Trump-dominated field on the Republican side. Many of them are election deniers. Many of them uh, have never run for office before. Uh, now now they're going to put, be put to the test. And so far, Democrats, as our friends at 538 have been reporting, have maybe a slight advantage, maybe slightly favored going into the general election when it comes to control of the Senate. Rick Klein, appreciate your work on the big board for us all night long. Appreciate it. You bet, Lindsay. Thanks. We head now to our Victor Kendo in Florida, where Governor DeSantis has wrapped up after running unopposed this primary season. He'll be facing Congressman Charlie Crist in the fall. Victor, uh, lay out to our viewers what kind of bitter battle we might be able to expect out of the governor's race in the Sunshine State. Just how different these men are, especially since Charlie Crist was once a Republican. Yeah, Lindsay, this should be an interesting one to follow. Charlie Chris was the favorite in this one. He's also the more moderate choice between him and Nikki Freed. Chris has been in Florida politics for a very long time. He is, no doubt, a household name in the Sunshine State. Three decades now in politics, once the Republican governor, then an independent, now the Democratic nominee for governor. Many voters that we've spoken with either today or during the early voting period told us that they weren't necessarily inspired by Chris. They weren't in line with everything that he was putting out there, but they felt that he had the best chance to take on Governor Ron DeSantis. Meanwhile, we heard from DeSantis tonight, not even on the ballot, as you mentioned, yet he took this victory lap. Um, he didn't mention Charlie Crist once during his speech. He knows that he has a very firm grip on Florida right now, that he's got a lot of momentum coming into this election, and he also feels that Florida needs to set an example for the country. Take a listen. We need to win across the board in November uh, to make sure that we solidify this state as the nation's citadel of freedom. And I can tell you this, uh, we are going to be running awfully hard all across this state, and we are going to generate the biggest Republican turnout this state has ever seen. Lindsay, this is going to be an uphill battle for Congressman Charlie Crist. And let's talk about the Senate race now. Marco Rubio will face Val Demings. You have uh, Rubio, who has been senator for more than a decade and tried running for president back in 2016, now going against Val Demings, a former top cop in Orlando. How different are their platforms? 
And Lindsay Val Dummings has been touting her record as the former top cop, the chief of police there in Orlando. She was also a contender to be Joe Biden's vice president. In her speech tonight, she spoke about her vision for the country. Just looking at some notes here, she wants to reduce gun violence and she wants to protect public education. Meanwhile, Marco Rubio on the big issues, he is staunchly pro-life. He is uh, also supported the majority of those controversial policies set forth by the governor. These are very different people. Lindsay. All right, Victor Akendo, our thanks to you. And now let's take a closer look at the state of play in New York with ABC News Deputy Political Director Avery Harper. She joins us now from Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney's campaign where uh, we know that they're disappointed, got to be, after the loss to, to Congressman Nadler. Yeah, there were a lot of teary eyes in this room uh, just a few minutes ago. Uh, the Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney, she came in here uh, to lots of applause uh, from her supporters uh, as she gave thanks to uh, the folks who are here for supporting her. Uh, she ran through some of her accomplishments in her three decades uh, in the House. Uh, she talked about, you know, securing funding for 9-11 responders, the uh, credit card holders, Bill of Rights, uh, and her work to uh, push the Equal Rights Amendment forward. Uh, but we know now that uh, she will not be returning to Congress next year. She uh, is a prominent uh, committee chair. She is the uh, committee chair of the, the House Oversight Committee. And uh, earlier today, when I talked to uh, Congressman Jerry Nadler, he spoke about how unfortunate it was that the Democrats would lose a senior member in a, a, a House uh, committee chair like this. Uh, but uh, there is a clear message from her staff tonight. They say that you have not not seen the last of uh, Congresswoman Maloney. They expect that uh, she will continue to stay active uh, in, in terms of activism as it relates to women's rights. And you've also been watching the race for New York's 10th congressional district where a moderate former federal prosecutor faced off against progressives. Uh, break down that race for us and, and where it stands tonight. Right. Well, that race is really close at this point. It's, it has not been called. Uh, and uh, we are seeing remarks from two of the leading candidates. That's the moderate Dan Golden. He's that former prosecutor, uh, heir to the Levi Strauss fortune, uh, who uh, put a lot of money into self-funding his campaign. Uh, he is essentially uh, claiming victory tonight uh, in remarks to his supporters, uh, while Yulin knew uh, she was one of the progressives uh, that was pushing back on uh, Goldman's campaign. She says she is not conceding. Uh, and so uh, we still have to wait. At the last check, there were only a few hundred votes that were separating the two candidates. Uh, and so we're just going to have to wait to see what happens in that case. And we've also seen some tensions within the Democratic Party between the progressive wing and the chair of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, Congressman Sean Patrick Maloney. Explain the dynamics there and, and what impact it could have in November. Right, well, uh, Sean Patrick Maloney, he came out on top uh, tonight in his primary. Uh, he uh beating out his uh, progressive challenger, Alessandra Biagi, who was uh, endorsed and, and backed by uh, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Uh, he ran in a district that was newly drawn that uh, was really a lot of uh, current Congressman Mondaire Jones, his district, uh, you know, a lot of folks within the Democratic Party uh, saying that it was inappropriate for him to uh, Bigfoot Jones in, in that way. Uh, but look, I, I think this is a win for moderates. Uh, this is uh, a, a person in a candidate who is a Biden style moderate, uh, a loss for Demo uh, excuse me, a loss for progressives in that race. All right, Avery Harper, so appreciate you reporting in all night for us. Joining us now are our contributors, former Democratic Senator from North Dakota, Heidi Heitkamp, and former Republican Congresswoman from Virginia, Barbara Comstock. Ladies, thanks so much for joining us again. Uh, Heidi, uh, let's start with you. We've seen moderate Democrats win their races tonight. Charlie Crist in Florida. You're, of course, a moderate Democrat who managed to win in a deep red state before. Florida, not as deep a red state, but a Democrat hasn't won a Senate seat there in 10 years. What advice would you give Val Demings? I keep being Val Demings. Keep talking about your record. Talk about your history. Talk about your parents being public school educators. But you know, I, I watched Lindsay as you were interviewing the now uh, candidate from Oklahoma, where he basically said that he is going to support a bill in the United States Senate that would, in fact, impose 
um, uh, right to life uh, ideology on the entire country. Um, this is exactly what Val Demings and a lot of the moderate Democrats will be running on. They will basically say this is an extreme party, the Republican Party. That may work well in Oklahoma. It's not going to work in, in Ohio. It's not going to work in Pennsylvania. And I don't believe it's going to work in Florida. So Val's got her work cut out for her. Um, obviously, uh, DeSantis is going to run a race as if he is the the potential nominee for president. He's got to win big, and he made that uh, declaration tonight. It's her job, and it's Charlie Crist's job to basically make sure that uh, he doesn't return to the state house and that uh, uh, Florida, once again, is in play for the Democratic Party. Big lift, but you know, the more extreme the candidates are on their side, the more and the more moderate ours are, the more I like our chances. And Barbara, let's talk about Charlie Chris for a minute. Of course, he used to be a moderate Republican. Why do you think that he switched parties? And do you think that this is something that we might see more Republicans start to do? Well, you know, I think Charlie Chris's move uh, predated sort of the, the Trump problems. I think the concern that many Republicans these days have is not so much an ideology concern as a democracy concern and a and a Trump concern, you know, sort of the cult of personality, because Donald Trump isn't really about any particular ideology. Donald Trump is about himself and this cult that he has created around himself. So I do think those are two different things. But I do think some of this extremism that you see in some of the candidates, um, you know, apart from Donald Trump, um, does present challenges. And as as um, as Heidi mentioned, you know what what might sell in a red red state versus um, some of, again these these swing states and swing districts is very different. And I think because uh, particularly in the House, because the caucus has become the Republican caucus is so red, deep red, ruby red that they don't have a sense of these swing districts and those are the majority making districts so that's generally the problem they they feel like they can go all in for trump go all in you know um far right uh where it, whereas that's not going to get them those you know those extra majority seats Heidi, we're now 77 days from the midterms. President Biden is about to ramp up his campaign schedule. I'm curious to get your thoughts on the student loan issue, which will likely campaign on. The White House may forgive up to $10,000 in loans. How will this issue play out more in rural red areas in America? I think it's going to be pretty divisive. And, you know, I've said all along, there's a way to give student loan relief without forgiving, forgiving the principal. I've, I've been for writing down the interest rate, applying uh, lower interest rates retroactively. The interest rate on a lot of student debt is usury compared to what the federal government pays. And so it's going to really divide, I think, the country. I, I hope that the president is very measured in what he does and that it doesn't pit them versus us. I, immediately the answer goes to well I'd save money I for you know I didn't go on vacation I didn't buy a second home so I could pay for my kids education but yet I see somebody who didn't do that getting a free ride and these are the kinds of issues that I think divide the country um, there's a way to give student loan relief which I think we need but, um, but across the board Debt forgiveness, in my opinion, is not politically popular and it's not, you know, the way to do it. And Barbara, crystal ball for us here. As President Trump continues to throw around his cloud in the Republican Party, do you anticipate he's going to announce a presidential bid ahead of midterms? No, I don't think he will. I think he does that just to keep the others out of the race. Um, he, he wants to keep on uh, getting money from the RNC for his legal bills, and he wants to keep raising money without having to do the reporting required on a presidential race. So I always think that has been a head fake, and he's never intended to announce before November. And, and I think it's also, he says he might, because he thinks that might help him not be indicted. I also don't think that will impact whatever the Justice Department will do. So again, it's Donald Trump just, you know, trying to fake it. Barbara Comstock, Heidi Heidkamp, we thank you both so much for your time. You bet.
Of course, with 11 weeks uh, to the day until the midterms, we'll be checking back with both of them uh, throughout uh, our critical election day coverage. Now to new details stemming from the search of former President Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago home. Today, the National Archives released a letter that highlights the sheer volume of classified records the former president allegedly took from the White House to his Florida estate. Terry Moran reports. Tonight, a newly released letter from the National Archives reveals the scope and the magnitude of the trove of classified material Donald Trump took with him to Mar-a-Lago when he left the White House. Over 100 documents with classification markings comprising more than 700 pages. Some include the highest levels of classification, including Special Access Program's SAP materials. That security designation is reserved for the most sensitive secrets in the government. It restricts access to the smallest number of individuals possible, only those with a need to know. The letter from the archives was released by a representative of Trump himself. This past January, the Trump team handed over 15 boxes of documents to the archives. The New York Times reports they included documents from the CIA, the National Security Agency, and the FBI. According to the paper, Mr. Trump went through the boxes himself before turning them over. But even after that, Trump still had not returned everything sought by the government. Months later in June, more documents were given back. And then, in that search on August 8th, the FBI seized 11 more sets of classified materials. Still allegedly holding on to those classified documents. Terry Moran joins us now from Washington. And Terry, former President Trump is calling for the court to appoint a special master to review the material taken from Mar-a-Lago. Tonight, we're hearing from the judge in that case. It, what is she saying? Lindy, the Trump team has asked for that special master. That's an individual who would be appointed by the court to review the documents seized by the FBI. And the judge in this case came back very quickly with the request for clarification, elaboration on what the Trump team is actually doing here. Uh, it is a pretty stunning order because she said, you have to clarify what law you are asking me to apply here, what precedents there are, why I am the right judge for it, because this is a different judge than the one that handled the search warrant. Uh, and she is essentially saying, go back to the drawing board, figure out what you want me to do and what legal justification there is for me to do it, come back and we'll talk. It was a pretty stunning rebuke for a judge appointed by Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Lindsay? All right, Terry Moran, our thanks to you as always. Torrential rains have moved across several states. Much of Dallas is still waterlogged after the most rain in 100 years in just a 24-hour period. Tonight, we're learning about the wife and mother who was on the phone with her husband as floodwaters swept her car away. Ginger Z is tracking the storm, but we start with Trevor Alt in the flood zone. Tonight, those record-breaking storms pushing east, now dumping torrential rain on the deep south. In northeast Louisiana, a tractor trailer exiting Interstate 20, losing control and overturning. This after the Dallas-Fort Worth area received the most rain over a 24-hour period in nearly a century Monday. Hundreds of calls for help, dozens of homes damaged. What well, people in the Dallas area, as well as this entire region, sustained uh, was an extraordinary challenge. In Mesquite, just east of Dallas, 60-year-old Jolene Gerald killed after her vehicle was swept away. Friends telling our affiliate WFAA the mother of three was working as an Uber driver and that before she was killed, she was on the phone with her husband telling him it felt like someone was pushing her car. Tragically, searchers in Utah finding the body of Jaytel Agnihotri Monday missing after flash floods tore through Zion National Park Friday. And in Mississippi tonight, a stalled storm system making for an anxious evening. Evening ahead. There is good reason for them to be anxious. Trevor Alt joins us now from a very wet Jackson, Mississippi. Trevor, what have mm -hmm. conditions been like for people there? Well, Lindsay, as you can see, I mean, we already have some flooding and this is continuing to grow. We're watching this street fill up behind me. This flood watch, though, is going to continue all the way through tomorrow night because as much rain as we've already seen, and we've had about a foot, half a foot already so far, we could have another half a foot on the way. Lindsay. All right, Trevor Alt, our thanks to you. ABC's chief meteorologist Ginger Z is tracking it all for us. Ginger, where is this headed next? Right, so just to wrap up, because Dallas did get a little bit since I spoke to you last night, they now have had their wettest August on record, coming from that exceptional drought, the highest level of drought. So we'll see in the drought monitor later this week what happens and how much of it absorbed into the soil. But let me take you through the flash flood threat, because there are a lot of folks are getting that heavy rain right now. Uh, Hattiesburg, Meridian, if you're driving I-20. And if you're driving and you get a flash flood warning, you stop. That is the best way to stay alive. You do not drive or not even mess with any of that water. 
water because water moves vehicles and water moves people really easily. Uh, that stationary front that has been trapping all the moisture is going to do just that. It's going to barely move the next 36 hours. And that means, Lindsay, that through the Gulf Coast, you know, right from New Orleans over to Mobile, you could end up with two, three inches. They drain really easily. They're not in that severe of a drought. However, when you add six inches to the already six inches, parts of Mississippi will absolutely see some flash flood threat. And that goes into western Alabama as well. Lots of concern in the pink area there. Ginger Z, our thanks to you. An update now on the case of a missing teen two days after a car was pulled from a lake with a body inside of it. An autopsy has now confirmed that body found is 16-year-old Kylie Rodney. Investigators say that she was at a large party near a campground on August 6th when she vanished along with her car. The lake where Rodney's body was found had been searched by sonar and divers, but a volunteer group with high-end equipment located the vehicle on Sunday. Police say this is still an ongoing investigation. Tonight in Atlanta, murder charges have been dropped against two police officers accused of killing Rayshard Brooks. Steve Osinsami now with why the officers have been cleared. Police officers in Georgia are celebrating this tonight. It's my conclusion that the use of deadly force was objectively reasonable and that they did not act with criminal intent. The special prosecutor has announced that he will clear the two white police officers seen here in an arrest that turned deadly at the parking lot of this Atlanta fast food restaurant in June of 2020. Authorities today shared that the victim, 27-year-old Rayshard Brooks, wasn't oh, just drunk behind the wheel, but was also on cocaine right and other now. drugs. And that officers Garrett Rolfe and Devin Brosnan, who were responding to calls from the restaurant, acted within the law. The police didn't come into this encounter hot. They, there was no uh, hostility. They were businesslike. They were polite. In announcing their decision, authorities replayed videos of the 40-minute encounter, pointing out that not only did Rayshard Brooks grab a police stun gun and run, but that he was pointing the weapon at the officer who shot and killed him. Brosnan and Rolfe committed no crimes. This was the summer of demonstrations over the killings of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery, the Wendy's fast food restaurant where Brooks was killed, burned to the ground. The family of Rayshard Brooks tonight is heartbroken. This family lost a father and they deserve a jury trial. Steve Osinsami joins us tonight from Atlanta. Steve, what happens to the officers now? Do they get their jobs back? Well, one of the officers who lost his job fought it and got his job back already. Both officers are still on the police force tonight. The police association here says that they will now get training. Uh, they're currently on administrative leave. And I should kind of put this in, into some context, Lindsay. You know, this all happened during the summer of street protests after the killings of Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd. And these officers have argued that they were sacrificed by authorities to help calm the streets, which of course didn't work. Lindsay? All right, Steve Osinsami, our thanks to you. A jury has convicted two men of conspiring to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Ike Ajachi describes the plot and how the FBI found out. Tonight, a key victory for the Justice Department in its fight against domestic terrorism. A jury finding two self-styled militiamen guilty of plotting to kidnap and kill Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer in 2020. All of our elected officials, everyone, deserves to be able to live in safety and not in fear. Adam Fox and Barry Croft convicted on all counts, including conspiring to obtain a weapon of mass destruction in the form of a bomb. The verdict coming four months after a different jury deadlocked on the charges against these two men, prompting prosecutors to file a motion to quickly retry the case. In October 2020, the FBI arrested Fox and Croft along with four other men as they allegedly tried to buy explosives with the goal of attacking Whitmer before Election Day. According to authorities, the plot was months in the making, driven in part by the Democratic governor's COVID-19 restrictions. The FBI infiltrating and wiretapping the group after one member turned informant alarmed by the talk of killing police. At both trials, however, the defense arguing this was a case of entrapment and that the defendants were just big talkers. My client is disappointed in the verdict. Um, it's been a good fight. But evidence submitted at trial showed Fox, the group's ringleader, conducting surveillance on Whitmer's vacation home and firing a stun gun. The men allegedly planning to blow up a nearby bridge to slow police response, then take Whitmer to a secret location in Wisconsin for a trial that would end in her execution. Quite an elaborate and brutal plot. Let's get right to Ike and Jachi. So Ike, Governor Whitmer reacting to this obviously today. What does she have to say? 
That's right, Lindsay. Governor Whitmer releasing a statement saying today's verdicts prove that violence and threats have no place in our politics and that those who seek to divide us will be held accountable. Now, both Fox and Croft face life in prison, but their lawyers are considering an appeal. Lindsay? All right, Ike and Jachi for us. Thanks so much. Now to the war in Ukraine and an ominous warning from President Zelensky and the U.S. there about possible Russian strikes. The U.S. State Department is even telling Americans to leave and has declassified intelligence with Ukraine. ABC's chief foreign correspondent Ian Panel is back in Kyiv tonight. Tonight, President Zelensky issuing an ominous new warning to his people, saying Russia may be planning, quote, hideous provocations and brutal strikes as Ukraine prepares to celebrate Independence Day. And tonight, the U.S. again urging Americans to leave Ukraine amid that threat of intensified Russian attacks. State Department sources saying declassified intelligence shared with the Ukrainians shows the Kremlin may be preparing to launch strikes on highly populated areas. Ukraine's banning large gatherings during the event. ABC's Britt Klenert asking President Zelensky about the threat. What's your reason for urging people not to gather tomorrow? Is it because Kyiv is under threat? Amid these concerns over what Russia may do next, the United Nations holding an emergency meeting on the volatile situation at Ukraine's Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Ukraine saying Russian strikes damaged infrastructure and transformers, briefly cutting off power at Europe's largest nuclear plant. The Ukrainians also claiming Russians are shelling the plant's nearby ash pits, where nuclear waste is stored, raising clouds of toxic radioactive dust, stoking ongoing fears of a potential nuclear disaster. Lindsay, Independence Day has just begun here and the country is braced, but Zelensky doubling down tonight. He's saying that they won't relent until they retake back parts of the country occupied by Russia, not just in the last six months, but for years, even Crimea. We can forget any peace deal for now. This war looks set to drag on. Lindsay? Unfortunately, it seems to be the case. Ian, thank you. When we come back, a rare and dangerous phenomenon caught on camera, the creation of a fire tornado. Actor John Boyega tells us of how his latest role shines a light on veterans and what it was like working with the late Michael K. Williams. After receiving a home appraisal they felt was too low, a black couple says they had a white colleague show their house and the price tag went up nearly $300,000. We talked to them exclusively about their first reactions and the lawsuit they just filed. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, 
but an unfriendly adversary. Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over. The world is not going to be the same. Amber Rose Isaac was the love of my life. She went into the hospital. And then I just see Shimani is... She was as good as dead as soon as she walked into that hospital. Black women are four times more likely to die than their white counterparts with the same symptoms. I can't let Amber be another statistic. We need to make sure that this doesn't happen to anyone else. This fight is not over. We're doing this together, man. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. A firefighter catches a terrifying sight on camera, a fire tornado. You can see it here developing at one of the wildfire sites in Portugal. It's a rare phenomenon that comes from a mix of conditions involving heat, wind, and dust. They can dramatically worsen already serious wildfires. A heat wave in Portugal is making it harder for the more than 2,000 firefighters on the ground battling multiple wildfires. Owning a home has long been considered the pinnacle of the American dream, but what happens when the home and space that you've occupied and invested in is not viewed as as valuable as it should possibly be simply because of the color of your skin? Well, that's how one couple describes their experience when getting an appraisal on their home, and they say that it was undervalued simply because they are black. Joining us now are doctors Nathan Connolly and Shani Mott. Thank you both for being here. So let's just walk through the process here. The two of you were looking to refinance your home to take advantage of the low interest rates. And then what happened? Well, we experienced discrimination. Um, we made a pretty straightforward application to get our house at a reduced interest rate from 4.65% to two and a quarter. And we thought we were in pretty good shape to be able to meet the mark. We had made investments in the house that exceeded you know, $30,000. We had seen the market on a steady uptick and we had a baseline amount that was labeled as pretty conservative, both by us and by the loan officer at Loan Depot with whom we worked. And so we were very surprised to learn upon a drive down to Florida we were making as a family that the home did not come in at value. I mean, it's important to know that when we first started this process, we looked at a range of, of loan companies. And one of the things that I really appreciated about Loan Depot was just how communicative they were. And I had lots of questions. You know, I was trying to kind of go by the book and collect at least, you know, four to five estimates and talk with people and see who I vibed with. So then you go and get a second appraisal after, in effect, whitewashing your house. Give us a sense, first of all, what you did to whitewash your house. <laughs> Well, well, we were aware that there were um, examples of whitewashing being effective um, in helping black families get the value that they were entitled to. And so we had to have a, a very careful conversation with our children. Um, we knew that we would have to remove evidence of their presence in our home, evidence of our own presence in the home. Because right from the beginning, it seems that you jumped to the conclusion our house came in with this low appraisal simply because we're black. Well, I don't know if it was that we jumped to that conclusion. I mean, we certainly gave um, the representative from 2020 Valuations, Mr. Shane Lanham, a chance to do his job. I mean, when he we were in the home during the first appraisal, right. we made, you know, light conversation with him. We certainly gave him free run of the place. Um, you know, we, ha again, had some sense that discrimination was a problem, but we didn't expect that it would happen in this particular case. And so when the number came back at 472,000. My jaw dropped. Right. I, I, just, I was like, this is racism. Right. Because we had done the research, right? right? Like, I mean, it's, aside from researching um, to try to figure out what the numbers would be for what we could sell our house for, I would ask a neighbor if they were in the process of refinancing, you know, what did their, their homes come in at? And right. so um, we didn't go into this into this process, this refinance process blindly. Like we were, uh, yeah, we were educated consumers. We did the whitewashing experiment. And even though we had already given Loan Depot comps that had reflected a value in the mid sixes or even higher, and we had been rejected, we left the whitewashing experiment to kind of be that final bit of evidence that we needed to be made whole. So what did the experiment bear out? 
<laughs> well, well, we, we had a we had a white colleague meet the uh, new appraiser at the door. Um, they apparently had some light conversation and um, you know shared some anecdotes. Um, it, it apparently um, was a pretty easy appraisal um, by the, the, the observation of our colleague. It didn't seem to, that there were a whole lot of questions, um, and the appraisal came back. I want to say within the, the same week yeah. um, at, at seven hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars, which was and your obviously... jaw dropped again. I have to imagine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it was it was just one of those moments where um, you know you're kind of like, okay, this is real. Um, you know, you 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 know about the the history, um, but to feel like we're very much part of that historical process of, of right. black folk being devalued, of not being able to get um, a fair shake, and and it also feels as though, frankly, we're at a moment where we need a new movement that is able to operate and be able to kind of distill this particular form of racism and really challenge it. So despite this being your expertise, you still found this very hurtful. Yeah, I think that that's that. I mean, what it's it's so interesting because there's a, a dilemma, right? Like it's there's a continue you live a contradiction. Like there are things that happen in this country where you're like, ah, things have progressed significantly. Um, and you you never think that somehow you would be the the victim of discrimination. Like you're like, I play by the rules, I do all that I'm supposed to do. The other thing that made it very challenging was 20 minutes um, after we had gotten the call about our home not reaching value, we had gotten a notification from one of Shani's doctors that she had a mass somewhere on her, around her kidney or her adrenal gland, we didn't know. And so the process of trying to appeal the low valuation was actually simultaneous with us groping around for answers about her health. Let me just say that I did this very resentfully. <laughs> I, I had, I kept thinking, what are we prioritizing? Right, you know, right. are we putting responding to Lone Depot ahead of my, you know, ahead of my health? You know, and so I just, but I was like, this is something we have to do. Right. I'm curious how you explained all this to your children, right? Because there are certain experiences that you all are familiar with from enduring or studying yourselves. But then when you're trying to discuss with a younger generation about this is America, how do you go about doing that? Well, I think it's important to note that the conversation that we have with our children was new in terms of um, this housing sit situation, right. but we make racial literacy a constant in our house. Right. Um, we we name power, we name blackness, we celebrate blackness, and so um, I think we just talked about it in terms of us making decisions um, to get what we deserve. It, lastly, it, kind of a two-parter and unrelated questions, but. Uh, Shani, I'd love to follow up on, on your health at this point and at the same time on your household, because what did you ultimately have happen with the appraisal? Well, my health, ah, oh God, it's been a long um, journey. I'm currently starting a trial um, at NIH on rare cancers, because it seems as though the chemo that I was on worked for a bit, and then they put me on immunotherapy, and I just had a serious allergic reaction to it and had to take three months off. And um, now I am, you know, hope hoping that this trial um, does something with the, the, yeah, the cancer, that the adrenal gland cancer that I have because I'm not ready to um, leave this world. There's so much work to be done, and I am definitely ready to um, continue to love on my children, dream on my children, and educate them um, to be a force. Relative to the, the house, um, you know, I mean, one, it, it was important to in some ways get more photos of the family and kind of, you know, reassert our, our place here. Um, it was also, uh, I think, important that we did, in fact, at least get a, a refinance that allowed us to um, bring our mortgage payment down. The market conditions did change. The interest rates uh, went up, so it, it was not the same rate that we initially were supposed to be approved for. Um, we had to change the terms of the loan by virtue of that from uh, a 15-year mortgage to a 30-year mortgage. And so now we'll be, you know, expected to pay 
an additional 15 years of payments on the property. And that means there are a whole host of things that we won't be able to do in terms of investments in, you know, kids' college funds, being able to have equity, you know, accumulate more quickly, um, just freeing up our income, you know, in general. All of that has been lost um, through the actions of, you know, a very small number of people. Well, we thank you so much for sharing your experience that was mouth-dropping to you and eye-opening, perhaps, for, for many others. Uh, Dr. Shani Maud and Nathan Connolly, we, we really appreciate your, your insight tonight. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Still ahead here on Prime, dogs are dying after contracting an illness, and officials can't figure out what's causing it. New developments in the death of Breonna Taylor. And on the ballot tonight, primaries, many politicians who deny that former President Trump lost the 2020 election. We take a look at their impact so far by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis, the powerful series, streaming free on ABC News Live. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Welcome back, everyone. As they have in other Republican races this season, many election deniers are running in today's Republican primaries in Florida and New York, drawing attention to the wider issue of Republican election deniers running in and winning primaries ahead of the midterms. Here's a look at election deniers by the numbers. 171, that's the number, according to ABC News' 538, of Republican nominees nationwide were full-blown election deniers. They're running for U.S. Senate and House seats, as well as state races across the country. That comes out to a total of 37% of all Republican nominees running right now who embrace Trump's lies about the 2020 election. An additional 54 nominees, or 12%, have expressed doubts about the 2020 election, despite the evidence that there was no widespread fraud. Meaning, 49%, basically half of all Republican nominees, either deny or cast doubt on Joe Biden's election in 2020. Republican nominees for the House of Representatives are the most likely to deny the 2020 results. 42% of all Republican House nominees deny the election. That's 145 out of 349 nominees. And while lower in number, election deniers are also running in state races for Secretary of State. In fact, some 22%, more than one fifth of Republican nominees for those offices, deny President Biden won the election. And many of those 
those are running in swing states where the 2024 election could be decided. And we still have a lot more election coverage ahead on ABC News Live. Stay with us. But first, to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. so much at stake in our world right now. We wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places, but crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find. Unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Former President Donald Trump allegedly had more than 700 pages of classified material at his Mar-a-Lago estate in Florida, according to a letter sent in May from the National Archives to a lawyer representing Trump. That letter, released today by the National Archives after it was first published by a conservative journalist, confirms documents with the highest levels of classification intended to be stored and viewed in only the most secure settings were found at Trump's Florida home, which doubles as a club for paying members. One congressional Democrat expressing concern on MSNBC. 300 pages, you know, just, uh, you know, a basement uh, stairway away uh, in an open, you know, beach house is not where you would want that information. The first batch of classified documents were handed over to the National Archives in January. Trump has called the search unwarranted and is now asking another federal judge to stop the DOJ from reviewing the materials secured during the raid and to appoint an independent special master who can determine if Trump was entitled to possess any of the documents. The letter from the National Archives also shows the former president's legal team tried to claim the first set of classified documents returned in January were covered under under executive privilege. That argument was ultimately rejected by the DOJ because only a sitting president can invoke executive privilege and Trump was no longer in office. A guilty plea today from the husband of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. In court, Paul Pelosi's attorney entered a plea on his behalf of guilty to driving under the influence causing injury in Napa County on May 28. He was driving a Porsche in Napa when he crossed a road in front of a Jeep causing what the California Highway Patrol called major damage. As a part of his plea deal, the 82-year-old Pelosi will serve three years probation. The deal includes five days of jail, but he'll get credit for four days, two of which he actually served, and the remaining day will be served on a court work program. He also has to go through a drunk driving program and pay restitution, among other parts of his sentence. 
a guilty plea in the shooting death of Breonna Taylor. Former Louisville Metro PD Detective Kelly Goodlett pleaded guilty to helping falsify an affidavit for the search of Taylor's apartment, admitting to falsely claiming a postal inspector verified Taylor was receiving packages for her ex-boyfriend, a convicted drug dealer. A no-knock warrant ended in Taylor's death in March of 2020. Taylor's mother was present as Goodlett pleaded guilty to misleading a judge about the warrant. She faces up to five years in prison. Officials in Michigan are investigating a parvo-like illness that has killed more than a dozen dogs in one county. Now, the illness mimics symptoms of the known dog illness called parvovirus, or parvo. Symptoms include lethargy, vomiting, and bloody diarrhea. The lab work is underway to determine whether the virus is a new strain or if it is parvo. Health officials say this is a good reminder to make sure that your dog is up to date with vaccinations. Hyundai and Kia are recalling 281,000 SUVs and warning owners to park their cars outside and away from homes due to fire risks. The models include Hyundai Palisade and Kia Telluride vehicles. The problems, an accessory tow hitch sold through dealerships. In some cases, an electrical short can spark a fire even when the ignition is off. Sales of the SUVs have been halted. A silver lining to a persistent drought in China. Receding waters in the Yangtze River uncovered these lost treasures. Three Buddhist statues believed to be 600 years old, possibly from the Ming or Qing dynasties. The river's water level plunged because of drought and a heat wave in China's southwestern region. Now to our ABC News exclusive, a husband and wife speaking for the first time after surviving a terrifying plane crash. Ariel Reshef has more on their story and how they were found. A Michigan family who survived a fiery plane crash speaking for the first time. The world sort of slowed down there and those moments felt a little bit like an eternity. Ronnie Kumal, the pilot, his wife, Olympian Shireen Jem, their niece, Sienna Kumal, and their dog, Charlie, taking off in the single-engine aircraft from this small Michigan airport last month. Soon after, 17-year-old Sienna felt something was amiss. The plane started shifting a little bit and in, like, a irregular movement, like, just wobbling, and I knew that it wasn't turbulence, it wasn't really weather. Within minutes, the plane took a nosedive. Shirin says there was no time to be scared. I felt like everything just went silent. I heard nothing on the cabin and I just embraced myself. And then um, when the plane, you know, went down, all I remember after that, I remember being, thinking to myself, oh my gosh, like when the plane's going to hit, this is how my life's going to end. It was just disbelief that this was actually happening. But there wasn't time to be scared in that moment because the, the moment felt like a dream. The plane plummeting into the trees. This was the aftermath of the harrowing accident. Flattened, twisted wreckage, mangled metal. The six-seater plane decimated. And this heart-pounding 911 call. There's been a plane crash in the airport. The caller, Jared Steffen, a family friend who was at the airport and witnessed the plane go down. His voice trembling on the line, panting as he races to the scene. And over the next few minutes... I didn't hear that. Oh my God, they're screaming. I, I don't know what to do. One of them is out. The first out of the ashes of the aircraft, Sienna. Come here, honey. It's okay. All three people are out. Okay. Yes. We're alive. Finally, all three safe, miraculously emerging without injury. Their beloved dog, Charlie, running off after the crash, but thankfully found 13 hours later. She's definitely experienced more in six months than I think most golden retrievers have at this point. Now, I'm happy that she's just jumping around, barking, you know, and, and, and reinforcing that, you know, there's too much fun to be had in life to try to get bogged down. Ronnie says he has 26 years of flying experience and to this day still can't figure out what went wrong. But the family is counting their blessings. I'm so grateful to uh, get to, you know, wake up every morning next to my wife. I'm so grateful that my niece is resilient. Every day is a gift and life, you know, is beautiful and we're trying to make the best out of it and enjoy every moment of it. 
In 2017, former Marine Brian Brown easily handed a note to a clerk at a Wells Fargo in Marietta, Georgia, that said, I have a bomb. His motivation behind the resulting robbery is chronicled in the upcoming thriller drama Breaking, starring John Boyega. It reveals how Easley's actions were fueled by his mental health struggles caused by war and his quest to get money that he felt the government owed him. With an escalating hostage situation and lives at stake, the film is equally as thrilling as it is tragic. Take a look. Is this what I need to do? No, we're gonna... We're gonna take care of this. what I need to do? Okay. Okay. Is this what you need? Is this all the motivation you need to give me what I need? You have hostages in here, ma'am. Hostages, and they scared. Brian. They scared for their damn lives. Brian. I need a phone call. You can feel the intensity there. Joining us now is actor John Boyega in the studio with us and director and screenwriter Abby Damaris Corbin. She is joining us via Zoom. Abby, John, thank you both so much for joining us well, tonight. Thank you. thank you for having us. I mean, let's just start right off with that gripping scene. Yeah. Uh, I'm so curious because when we talk about the typical, the stereotypical bank robber, right, they're motivated by greed. But this mm. is something totally different. This is somebody who went into a bank and asked for $892.34 sense. Right. How do you channel uh, playing a role of somebody who's alive and, and such a multifaceted character? I think it starts off with, with Abby and, and the accessibility to research. We have a lot of documentation that surrounded the case. Uh, Brian himself, access to the family, you know, so his, his ex-wife Jessica told me about his speech, the way in which he spoke, such so quite soft-spoken uh, young man. Um, CCTV footage, unfortunately, images, a whole bunch of information that I had to take in just to portray this amazing an amazing man in this amazing story. And, and so many veterans, you know, they want to be seen and, yeah. and heard and, yeah. and feel that they are owned something, and, and perhaps rightfully so. Did you yes. do that that research, or, or how did you connect with that yeah. veteran spirit? I had to, because um, I don't have any family members that actually serve, and I don't have any extended friends, nothing. So for me, I had to I had to transcend, go past myself, and, and find individuals at that time to, to speak to. Um, Abby's in a fantastic position. I mean, her father, who, who, who has served, gave us a lot of, you know, pointers, and, and Abby herself, who has is, who is been deeply related to those issues, also gave me some, some motivation and help and information. So we really, really worked hard with our quick turnaround time, by the way, before, before shooting, to just get all the information right to portray this man. And Abby, going to get right to you in a moment, but last performance from Michael K. Williams, yeah. what was it like connecting with him on, on multiple levels, just working with him, but mm -hmm. also as, as fellow veterans? I feel like... Um, Michael is one of my inspirations for getting into acting in the first place. I've, I admire a lot of the people that worked on The Wire, HBO's The Wire and, and Boardwalk Empire, and to have him included in this film and to portray this role in such a way. I mean, he plays the negotiator, someone that's supposed to become with um, an, a level of empathy, um, also a level of authority. And that balance that Michael Kay played, man, just shows why he's one of the most versatile actors in the game. So. And, yeah. and Abby, your father was also a veteran, and you've said that when you heard about this story, you immediately had a strong feeling of empathy. Yeah. Tell us about why you connected so much with this story and when you decided that it needed to be a film. You know, uh, a friend actually texted me the article about Brian Brown, Brown Easley. I pulled over to the side of the road and read the whole 40-page thing in one sitting. My heart was broken, and I, I, nobody else had heard this story. It hadn't made it to a broad level. So I wanted to make sure that it was told. Um, mm. I recognized my dad's story in it, and I'm so grateful to be here with you today so that we can tell Brian's story. And unfortunately, so many of our veterans struggle with PTSD and, and the feeling of being lost in the system, lost in the world, perhaps. Watching the film, it feels like that's the message that Brown Easley is trying to get across in some way. Abby, you've studied how these struggles impact veterans as both a, a director as well as a writer. How did you balance portraying those issues with words and emotions all through the experience of, of just one person? Well, I was really fortunate to partner with John here. He came in with an immense amount of craft. As an actor, he's able to hold the duality of uh, the heart, the, the empathy, the action. So you put all that down on the page in conjunction with Brian's wife, and John just lets it out. How do you, what do you draw on for that? I mean, just even in that one scene where we mm. just saw that, that 
desperation and, mm. and panic. Mm. I think it's the frustration of the detail uh, as the collective uh, notes from various veteran uh, individuals who have, haven't got the opportunity. That, that, that frustration is, is able to be manifested in that bank in a way that's just dynamic um, and in a way that, that shows his true anger and concern for his livelihood, not only for himself, but his livelihood of his wife and his, and his daughter. Um, and, and from that, just even as a person, as a human being in, in, in an empathy state, us thinking about that, it will, and I'm sure will frustrate you. Uh, imagine then I gave you a scene to be able to do it. I'm sure you go in I to be able to know. give that, that, that <laughs> you'll be able to give it some energy, you know, that some takes energy. Some talent. It takes some time, <laughs> but you know, it, it's, it's some energies come, it comes from that, it comes from a natural place of empathy. Like, I, I can't believe that. I'm in a role which I'm grateful for, but I'm in a role that is, is telling this narrative um, and, and, and then that frustration kind of builds naturally. And such an important one. I yeah. feel like the veterans just don't get their due so often. Yeah. Uh, just switching gears here, of course, you're part of major franchises, Pacific Rim, yeah. Star Wars. I told you, my yeah. son, he's a oh, huge yeah, fan. Yeah, yeah. He's like, wait, who do you have on the show tonight? Um, but any taste of, of what you're working on that, that you have coming up? I know you have a, a new movie that you're working on with Viola Davis. Yeah, I've got a new movie called uh, The Woman King with Viola Davis. And then I've got another movie coming out later this year with Jamie Foxx called They Clone Tyrone. So. Yeah, we look forward to that one. We are all looking forward to it. Brian, Abby, we thank you so much for joining us Good to us see you, Abby. <laughs> you too. <laughs> and their film, Breaking, is out in theaters on August 26th. You're not going to want to miss this. So many treasures from our national parks have been photographed, but so have the effects of climate change. Will Reeve spoke with a renowned National Geographic photographer who's capturing its impact. What I try to do is capture a place that's familiar, but I want to show it to you in a way you've never seen it before. I'm a storyteller. National Geographic photographer Stephen Wilkes' pictures tell compelling stories. From the ghosts of Ellis Island to showcasing an alternative dimension even stranger than we could ever imagine. I think what really makes a great and meaningful photograph is the story that it tells. You know, does it make you feel something? His award-winning day-to-night photography series showing time passing in a single image. It's one of his best-known projects. What is the process for a photograph like that? It takes months sometimes. I put cranes in places. I build scaffolding. What we just did in, from Shai Shai Beach, I took three separate trips to finally get that photograph. And I stood on a rock for almost 20 hours photographing this epic seascape. When I went to Bears Ears National Park in Utah, Colorado border, we hiked in over an hour and we camped for three nights to capture the moon rising. And after 20 years photographing our national parks, Wilkes has borne witness to the impact of a changing climate. In the Yukon, we were expecting 55 degree temperatures and a, a migration to come through. And we ended up having 30 degree temperatures, 50 knot winds and snow. The Peace J. L. Bar Ranch in Yellowstone for America the Beautiful. Do you know that two weeks later, the bridges that I traveled to to make that photograph don't exist anymore? The Yellowstone River flooded at a scale and a magnitude it's never been seen before, you know, hundreds of years. We really have to change our behavior because we've been a species uh, that's constantly taken and not given. And our planet needs a steward right now. The future of our national parks all the more important to Wilkes, who has a big reason to care. Because this last year, I've been blessed with a beautiful granddaughter named Sadie Ray, and she's inspired me. I watch the way she sees the world. And when you see the world through a child's eyes, it, it touches your soul. And it made me think about what are we going to leave her? What is her world going to be like 20 years from now? And so, you know, for me, every day I'm, I'm with her, I'm thinking about the joy in the moment, the magic that I see, but also, what can I do to make sure that she gets to see that flower 20 years from now? Just astonishing images there. Our thanks to Will Reed for that. And before we go tonight, our image of the day on this primary night, Florida voters are making their voices heard. Thomas Jefferson once said, we do not have government by the majority. We have government by the majority who participate. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. With so much at stake in our world right now,